Okay, I think we could start. Uh, my name is Johan Wettlesen. I'm working uh, in the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy in Norway, soon to be the Ministry of Energy in Norway. It changed my name. Uh, I'm working on EU and Nordic matters. Uh, I will moderate you through these two days. Uh, I represent the Nordic Council of Ministers Senior Energy Officials uh, Group. Uh, which is reporting to the Nordic ministers. So this time we have called our, con our annual and Nordic Baltic conference, how to reconcile regional energy markets with green transition. For us, this is an important and timely event. Uh, uh, and I will not use so many words to get started, but uh, as you can see from the program, we have structured this uh, uh, conference in five parts or sessions. One keynote session first, uh, with uh, representatives from, from different uh, international organizations. And then we have the first thematic session this morning uh, on electricity market deep dive, as we have called it. And then after lunch, we will have a session on energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, tomorrow, don't forget tomorrow, we will have a session on innovation and learning curves and a second session on decarbonization and, and hydrogen. So it's going to be interesting tomorrow too, so I just stay on and do not uh, forget the tomorrow. Uh, first, I will give the floor to Kate Kasemet, State Secretary in the Ministry of Climate here in Estonia, uh, for a welcome uh, speech, and then uh, Maria Gratchev, which is a relatively new director at our Nordic Council Minister's Office here in Tallinn. Hello, good morning to everybody. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you here uh, on behalf of the, of the Ministry of Climate. In all previous years, uh, you have been welcomed uh, by the Ministry of Economic Affairs and, and Infrastructure, but now it has changed uh, after the new government entered into office in, in April this year. The new ministry was created, uh, the Climate Ministry, which has energy, similarly to many, many other countries uh, in Europe, but it also has uh, transportation, maritime, construction, uh, forestry, uh, environment uh, protection, many waste management, uh, a big ministry, a huge ministry, I would even say in, uh, in Estonian terms. And uh, the main aim behind this change was to provide the message that, that climate policy is really relevant, really crucial for the current government, that it is a priority. And uh, I need to say that this um, shift in administration of merging different ministries together to the climate, uh, climate ministry and, um, and our uh, this type of leading narrative, what we have, what we have taken, that the smaller carbon footprint is, uh, is the competitive advantage and, uh, and we need economic growth, we need it very much, but it needs to me remain in the, this kind of capacities of the, of the planet and natural resources that this has, has actually uh, worked uh, quite well. I will just use this opportunity to maybe provide some of the, some of the highlights of the, of, the, of the new initiatives of this, what we're working currently, what concerns energy. In the, in the Ministry of, uh, in the Ministry of uh, Climate, uh, because <clears throat> energy transition clearly is at the centre of our this kind of Estonian uh, climate policy, Estonian new competitiveness policy also, so it's a really, really crucial area. But before I, I come to that, uh, I would like to remind you also that today is the, almost the last day of, uh, of COP28, where I was also last year, and they are currently just, I think, new decks just came out. Uh, now, I couldn't manage to read it, uh, read it fully, but currently are very intense discussions now on the, on the areas which influence actually our uh, environment also, where we, uh, where we are uh, active. And I think the, the key issue still is very much related to the several topics uh, here today also is that if and how the fossil fuels will be phased out and, um, and uh, what is there to replace them and how we can really decrease the demand of fossils of the, of the really moving away from the, from the technologies and, uh, and, 
and also using more renewable electricity, for example, in transport and uh, and heating and and different uh, different areas. As a heads up, what I could guess that the max which will be there, which will be also quite a lot, could be, for example, phasing fossils out from the electricity production. And uh, but let's see, let's see on the, what uh, what the final text uh, text will be. I think very relevant also that. Um, uh, the topic of the, of the regional energy markets, because I think in particular in this our region, our area, not only due to North Pole and electricity, but also more broadly to the, to the Baltic Sea and, uh, and also the, the gas in the future, maybe hydrogen infrastructure, we are still very much uh, inter, uh, interlinked linked and, and we are all uh, together in, in that uh, from the student government point of view, uh, as you probably are well aware, the increasing the share of renewables is the, is the one of the key priorities or key goals of the Estonian uh, government. Uh, what we, when we talk about the full, like general energy mix, then we actually are in, in the fourth place what concerns the, the share of renewables in the, in the energy mix in, uh, in Europe. Um, but now we think our main, this kind of priorities, clearly uh, is firstly renewable electricity then, which means the onshore wind parks and um, uh, also offshore wind parks. We are currently working also, and, and I, I saw that you have very, very topical issues, very, very good program. Uh, I saw you will discuss these issues also, and we are, we are working on the, on the now to also introduce the CF, uh, CFT scheme for the, for the renewables. Uh, probably will come out with, uh, with the concrete proposal early next, uh, early next year. Uh, currently having this kind of discussions and negotiations between the different uh, different uh, stakeholders on the how to really build it up, which should cover both on and, and offshore uh, on and offshore uh, wind. This is one of the big priorities. Another big priority is the grid uh, from different uh, aspects. And you see the Estonian weather, a lot of snow. Uh, a lot of uh, big wind, so we have constant interruptions of, uh, of, the, of the electricity supply in the, in the countryside, in the region. So the, to increase the climate resilience of the, of, the, of the grid in these terms is one of the priorities. Second is to really adjust the grid that, uh, that it is more accommodative to the, to the renewable uh, energy needs compared with the currently the big oil shale uh, production in the in the northern and eastern part of uh, of uh, Europe uh, of Estonia and uh, and then also create the capacity to really connect the, the offshore offshore the wind parks in, to the large extent than uh, than it is uh, uh, than it is uh, today. Uh, we also work with hydrogen, uh, but let's be frank, I think many countries in our region are more advanced in this area than, uh, than we are. In COP, we also had a long discussions with our good uh, neighbours from Finland on how we could cooperate on the, on the Baltic Sea hydrogen valley and uh, how, to really, how to really make it, uh, make it work. But clearly, I think yeah, we could do uh, more than uh, than we have uh, we have done, uh, and also we are also um, having which which relates to that. It's it's a little bit uh, little bit uh, broader than the, uh, than the discussion here, but it uh, it influences the, the market from the demand side uh, a lot is that we have also a big uh, transport sector decarbonisation goal and we have not really said it out loud very clearly yet but we will have very concrete KPIs also which will, uh, which will target the use of uh, EVs and the increasing uh, use of EVs to really speeding up the development of the charging uh, network and, uh, and uh, as I said also basically moving away 
from the from the fossils to the electricity uh, in transport, but also in the, in the heating. So, as it is opening remarks, I will not say uh, much uh, much more. Just uh, this was just to give you a glimpse on what we are working in in Estonia. I hope uh, you will have a very interesting two days. I wish you a very very interesting and um, and. Uh, um, uh, discussions also on it because there are many different solutions the, in the, what, what can be used and, and the countries are using actually actually different uh, different solutions so I hope you will you will find this getting closer to the common understanding what's the best for the Estonians. Thanks a lot, wish you a good day. Thank you so much, and uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, State Secretary, ladies and, and gentlemen, uh, great to have you here. Some of us just, uh, uh, we were just uh, talking about how busy uh, December is. Everything is, is about to be finalized and, and wrapped up. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to be here, everyone. And, uh, and thank you also, um, uh, State Secretary for, for your introduction. Uh, I think we are all quite uh, keen on seeing what's coming out of COP. Uh, let's see in, in, in the next few days uh, what, uh, what we will hear. Um, and uh, <clears throat> of course, thank you to our moderator for pointing out that I'm still quite new in my position. I've been wondering for how long I can get away with, uh, <laughs> with saying that I'm, <laughs> that I'm new. Um, what do you think? Six months? A year? What, uh, <laughs> what, what could be? <laughs> it's, um, uh, anyways, uh, it's, it's great to see you all here, and, and this event has, has really become a, a, a good uh, tradition, I think. Uh, a great forum uh, for us all to, uh, to take stock uh, of our work, uh, see where we are, uh, see where we need to be headed, uh, what we need to do next. Um, uh, establishing contacts, of course, with, with other professionals uh, who are also here. Great, uh, great for me uh, to be here and, and uh, meet uh, still a lot of uh, new, uh, new faces. But I also think this is a, a great forum for those who do not uh, work uh, specifically um, on, on energy issues. Um, and uh, we're not all, uh, you know, experts at that incredible level. Um, but even if we aren't, uh, with, with the development over, over the last uh, sort of couple of years, um, energy has, uh, whether we want it or not, really been put high up on the agenda. Uh, not just for, for governments, not just for, for the private sector or policy level, but obviously also um, at the level of households. We're moving towards uh, a cold winter. Um, I think many of us remember that energy prices last year was an issue on, on our minds. Uh, we have, uh, of course, Russia's illegal and, and unprovoked war against uh, Ukraine, uh, also in this, in this big picture. Um, and um, I, for one, started thinking last year and, and sort of discussing with, with, my, with my husband that, you know, what are the things that we need to do? Um, Solar power, um, I'm, from, I'm from Sweden, solar power has been one of these big issues that we discuss in, in Sweden. A lot of household thinking about that investment. Uh, but then it's also the, the question, how is it produced? Um, what does it mean? Does it pay off financially? Um, what, what are the considerations that, that one needs to, to make at sort of the household Level and I, and I think those are the kind of issues that that many of us have have come into um, sort of in, in contact with over the last couple of years. The political goals, of course, of, of uh, preserving energy security is um, combating climate change on the big picture and and ensuring uh, really good competitiveness um, is also a challenge for for the entire energy uh, sector. Uh, and we all need to move uh, the same directions. We have, we have, again, governments, we have regulators, we have the private sectors, and we have households. Um, and we all need to work together and move sort of the same, the same direction. 
The, uh, the Nordic uh, Energy uh, Cooperation uh, Program for 2022 to, to 2024 um, is, is uh, a very useful uh, program uh, from where uh, we take a lot of our cue. It, uh, it does underline that uh, Nordic, um, Nordic relations with, uh, with the Baltics is, is really key. And uh, I think consequently this, uh, this conference also uh, reflects a willingness um, for all of us to, to work uh, on Nordic-Baltic cooperation, which is of course at, um, at the top of um, my own agenda for, for my own organization. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's great to, to, uh, to work together with, uh, with the Nordic um, uh, Council of uh, Ministers uh, Energy Committee uh, in this work. I think we can do even more together when it comes to Nordic-Baltic cooperation. Um, whether that means uh, sort of new inter, uh, interconnections or, or concerted um, efforts in, in bringing more uh, renewables and, and, and storage on the, on the market. Let's, let's see what we come up with. Um, we have exciting things happening at the European level as well. Um, we have the Fit for 55, of course, and um, several um, new challenges related to that for, for our region uh, and in, in our field. Uh, we do uh, find the Nordics and, and the Baltics um, very much with a common uh, agenda through the EU and um, EA regulations, and I think this conference can also help us um, talk about that sort of better understanding uh, in how we can, uh, we can contribute. And I'm curious to hear a little bit more about your thoughts uh, on that um, as well. And uh, we have a mixed group here uh, representing different uh, parts of society, which is, which is really uh, crucial. Of course, we, uh, from, from the Nordic uh, cooperation uh, framework, we, um, uh, we believe in working for a, um, um, a clean uh, and affordable, but also resilient um, energy supply. And those are the three really important uh, cornerstones uh, for us. It's a fine balancing act at the same time. Um, we all want to keep our, our modern comforts um, and it's hard to give up on things. Uh, so if we're not going to give up on things, we need to rethink um, where we're going to get that energy from, right? Um, and that's, um, that's the key to this. Nature and, and, and life is, is sort of the basis for, for our discussions. Um, a very wise person uh, once told me uh, that um, you only really live for as long as you learn. And uh, what he meant was, of course, that for as long as we're willing to reflect um, on, on our actions, for as long as we're willing to think about and, and rethink our habits, uh, for, for as long as we're willing to, to take on new information, new perspectives, listen to those who are different uh, from ourselves, uh, then we learn and with that we, we keep alive. So with that in mind, I, I hand over uh, this, uh, this conference to all of you uh, with the choice of keeping an open mind uh, and sort of deciding whether um, are we here to learn uh, or do we already have the answers. If we're here to learn, um, I think we have a great opportunity to, to listen to um, different speakers and, and different perspectives to see how we can put our heads together for, for the best solutions. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks everyone for uh, allowing me uh, a, a, few, a few minutes and uh, have a great meeting. Thanks. Yes, we have a lot of good speakers, so I guess that you tomorrow, if you stay in two days, then uh, you will have learned a lot, I think. We have come to the first session, which is the uh, keynote speeches. And I think the intention with the first session is to get this broad, broader overviews from, from key actors doing analysis and also legislation on, uh, on, on energy. Uh, the last couple of years have been very turbulent, I think, in energy, and it has been in the center of gravity for policymakers and international organizations. 
Some have claimed that we are in a situation where we have to choose and balance the overall objectives of energy security, climate objectives, and improving competitiveness. So I'm looking forward to hear from, uh, from uh, Hans van Steen, DG Energy, the European Commission, uh, from the International Energy Agency, which will, they will be online with the Tangui Bien Assis in Paris on the net zero outlooks. We have also invited the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, with uh, Louis Janeiro, I hope it's correctly pronounced. And then we have uh, the international financing community with the EBRD, uh, which, uh, represents the, uh, which is represented by, uh, by uh, what's his name? Uh, don't you remember his name, actually? Uh, it's behind me, sorry. Mark Lane, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with, uh, with uh, an old friend of, of, of mine, uh, Hans van Steen from DG Energy in Brussels. Thank you very much, uh, Johan, and uh, good morning uh, to all of you. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be back in Estonia. It has been a while, actually, since I was here last time, but it's always nice. And I said, sort of, well, I always forget how cold it is at, in winter. But I think uh, coming here yesterday was a reminder that uh, winters up here can be rather different from winters in Brussels, for sure. So it's a great uh, pleasure, and uh, I look forward to the discussions. I will be here uh, today, at least uh, most of the day. Uh, and I, I hope that uh, this conference, I think I was actually present in one of the earlier editions some years back. And it is true that uh, Johanna and I uh, go back quite some years, so it's always good to see you, Johan. Um, what I would like to do this uh, morning is to try and uh, set the scene a little bit and explain where we are and just from what we heard from the previous speakers about living and learning. Uh, I think we from the Commission certainly do not pretend to have all the answers. We have some ideas, but I think uh, there is so much going on uh, right now that nobody, in reality, nobody has all the answers. We need to live and learn, and we need to uh, find the right solutions to get us through to where we need to be. And I think we all agree and we all know what it is that we need to do. Uh, different ways, probably, of doing it. Uh, but it needs to end up in what was uh, set out in the European Green Deal. And I think if I can manage to operate this one. Yeah. Um, I think you are all familiar with the European Green Deal, so I don't need to talk a lot about that. This was really uh, what set the scene uh, for this current commission when uh, Ursula von der Leyen became the president of the commission now about four years ago. She wanted to set an overall vision for the direction of the EU of course, the headline target of climate neutrality by the middle of the century is what stands out. But the Green Deal is much, much more than that. And I think that's really important to understand. The Green Deal is really the European Union's growth strategy. It is about reconciling, uh, reducing emissions with continued economic growth and welfare. And we believe that the Green Deal uh, does exactly that. Now, of course, we have to try and imagine, and that's kind of difficult, what it was like four years ago, because so many things have happened since then. And when we did the Green Deal, we had, of course, no idea of what would be coming. We had no idea that we would be hit by this uh, global pandemic. Uh, we had no idea what it would mean when energy prices suddenly increased uh, in a completely unprecedented way coming out of the COVID crisis. And we had no idea that Russia would, uh, as you said, have an unjustified and unprovoked attack on Ukraine and thereby basically interrupting a lot of the EU's energy supply uh, in, in a way which no one really had imagined. So, like everything else in, in policy, you know, you have a plan and then reality kicks in. And of course, for us uh, there, we had to look at the Green Deal and very quickly we came to the conclusion that the Green Deal remains as 
important and as valid as ever. Because in order to tackle energy security concerns, we essentially need to move towards more efficiency. We need to move towards more renewables to get out of this volatility that basically comes from the reliance on fossil fuels because the EU as such is so reliant on imports of fossil fuels, including pre-war from, from Russia. Uh, so the Green Deal for us was the, the main thing. We worked very hard towards looking at how can we actually make that a reality. We had a lot of quite complicated analysis. And basically, the analysis showed, first of all, we need to make sure that all economic sectors, all economic activities are changed in order to reduce emissions. And the second main conclusion from that work, which was called the Climate Target Plan that came out about, I think, half a year after the Green Deal, was that we need to do this faster than we had initially thought, because we had a pledge under the Paris Agreement to reduce emissions by 40% by 2030, I think it was. And it was very clear that that was not sufficient to bring us onto a trajectory which was credible towards climate neutrality and zero emissions in uh, 2050. So, and that's, of course, where the 55 came from, because it, rather than 40% reductions, it had to be 55% in order to be uh, on a credible track towards uh, carbon neutrality uh, by 2050. So the Fit for 55 uh, package was born out of that. And I think you are probably also familiar with a lot of that. It's called Fit for 55, which is not a name I really like a lot because it sounds like sort of an exercise program for middle-aged people, which it is not. And it actually also has a more official name. It's called Delivering on the Green Deal, which is actually, in my view, better because this is exactly what it is. The Green Deal, and we were fortunate enough or clever enough or whatever way we put it, that all member states, all stakeholders, the European Parliament and so on, they signed up to this idea of carbon neutrality in 2050. Um, so in a way, this was the easy part. The much more difficult part is how to do it. And that's exactly what the, green, the, the, the Fit for 55 package is about. This is the specific legislation actions that need to be undertaken in order to get us there. And there were the, all these different uh, proposals which you see there in this uh, beehive um, put forward as a really major comprehensive package with a very lot of um, analytical work behind it, making sure that all these things uh, hang together in the right way because, of course, they are all very closely interdependent. For us in DG Energy, which uh, is where I am and have been working for quite some years, as Johan will know, um, we have a number of uh, specific responsibilities. They're basically here to the, to the right. Uh, of course, the Renewable Energy Directive, which I personally, as head of unit for Renewables Unit for seven years, uh, some years back, was responsible for. Energy efficiency, uh, both the Energy Efficiency Directive and now also the Buildings Directive, Energy Performance of Buildings uh, Directive, but also hydrogen and gas, market decarbonisation, methane uh, emissions, all of these things come under the direct responsibility of us in DG Energy. Other bits are in other parts of the Commission, but we work very closely together, and you know the Commission is a collegiate body, which means that even though it is maybe our colleagues in DG Transport or in DG Taxation or in DG Klima, we are all you know, hanging together and uh, trying to coordinate between us. And the good news is that, I mean, if, if we had time, I could go in and, and talk a bit more about these things. I think this afternoon I'll come back and talk more about energy efficiency and renewables. But the good news is we can basically tick off most of these boxes by now. A few elements hanging. One of the most important hanging elements is the energy performance of buildings directive that was hanging until basically last week. There is now an agreement which needs to be uh, confirmed and it's so new I don't even know all of the details but that was one of the last parts. But this autumn we had both the Renewable Energy Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive uh, agreed and they are now actually 
in force, and that's what I will come back and talk a little bit more in detail about this afternoon. Um, and of course, as I said, you know, all of this was um, well before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which triggered the Repower EU uh, initiative, which was essentially an initiative that said, how can we very quickly phase out uh, fossil fuel imports from, from Russia? And basically, it had these key three key elements. First of all, as I said, most importantly, we need to accelerate the energy transition with more efficiency, more renewables. But we also need, at least in the short and medium term, we need to diversify. We need to see how can we replace imports from Russia with imports from other parts of the world. Uh, Norway is, of course, one key element there, but also uh, the US. Uh, and we have increased uh, by a lot our uh, liquefied natural gas imports from the US. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we, re we really need to be much better at uh, using energy efficiency, so we need to save energy. And as you see on this other, the right-hand side there, we have actually managed uh, a lot of the goals. We are not quite there. Uh, we still have some Russian gas in the EU system. Some countries actually rely quite heavily still on Russian gas. It needs to be phased out, uh, I think, because it is, I think we all agree, almost all agree, I would say, it's a, very, it's a very bad situation to be in uh, at this, uh, in this geopolitical situation to rely on uh, imported uh, gas from Russia, in addition to the fact that we don't really want to finance the Russian uh, war machine through our uh, payments for, uh, for energy uh, products from Russia. Um, we're making good progress on renewables. I'll come back to that this uh, afternoon. And we're also actually making a lot of progress when it comes to energy efficiency, especially for gas. And there were some specific um, initiatives in order for that uh, to happen. The Commission, as always, and we are sort of getting used to that, and I've been there so long, so I'm now getting used to it and uh, probably have thick skin when it comes to that. There's always some criticism of the Commission doing too little too late. And, and that's why we put together this slide, and it's so big it can hardly be on this uh, even big screen. But it shows a little bit everything that happened throughout 2022. So basically, uh, you know, after the, the Russian invasion in February, already in March, we, we came up with uh, important proposals when it comes to uh, uh, amending security of gas supply. And then throughout the year, there were a number of what we call emergency regulations. Proposals which are not put forward through the normal legislative process with co-decision involvement of the European Parliament, but really emergency regulations that needed to be adopted very, very swiftly. And uh, we were very pleased to see that the member states in the Council were all really uh, keen to work towards uh, agreeing these pieces of legislation that could sort of uh, bring us closer to the objectives of Repower EU. Uh, and throughout the year, we had all this emergency regulation, which is special in the sense that it is temporary. It's not like normal EU legislation that once you've agreed it, it stays there until it is withdrawn or repealed. This has normally a, a limitation in time. And of course, now, right now, we have in the last couple of weeks and months, we have been thinking about, does this need to be extended? Are we still in a crisis situation? And our conclusion is that, yes, we are still not in the same type of crisis that we were uh, maybe a year ago, but there is still so much volatility that it makes sense to uh, prolong some of this uh, legislation at least for another year. Um, if you look at uh, the level of ambition when it comes to uh, renewables and energy efficiency, sort of it, uh, we, we had something already on the, on the statutory books, uh, following the adoption of both the Renewables Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive in 2018. Then we came with new proposals to increase that. And then with Repower, we sort of uh, increased further the ambitions, for example, on renewables from 40 to 45 percent. And as a result of the negotiations, uh, we came uh, in the new Renewable Energy Directive to a nice compromise. And you will see this is a typical EU solution right in the middle of what the Commission uh, proposed and what was already there, which is 42.5%. So that is now 
where we are aiming at, and that's actually very ambitious. If you look at where we are today, it means basically a doubling of the share of renewable energy in the next seven years between now and 2030. The same for energy efficiency. Uh, there we came up with a target of 11.7% uh, improvements. And there we have changed a little bit the baseline. I will also come back to this this afternoon. It becomes a little bit complicated, but essentially it's actually quite ambitious also in our view in terms of the target for energy efficiency. Um, you will see here, basically I think this is more or less what I just said. Of course, one thing is to agree all these wonderful targets. We also need to have the provisions that will actually get us there. For renewables, uh, a lot of the bottlenecks comes with permitting. It simply takes too long to get projects up and running. And therefore, there are in the emergency regulation and also in the new renewable energy directive, there are a number of things, and I'll come back to that as well, uh, that will make us uh, accelerate uh, the, the time for getting uh, renewable projects up, up and running. Um, this is a session about, uh, I can't remember what the precise title is, uh, mark, mark, energy transition and markets or something like that. So obviously I need to talk a little bit about also about the, the markets, uh, especially for electricity. When the crisis uh, hit us with the uh, surge in energy prices um, a year and a half ago or a bit more, um, there were concerns that these prices that clearly had their origin in uh, global natural gas markets, essentially, the way in which they spilled over into electricity, which is, of course, the, uh, the reason for that is because the, the way the electricity market works, and some of you probably know more about that than I do, but basically the price is set by the last unit that comes in, which is very often the gas-fired uh, uh, electricity generation somewhere uh, and that's that is the whole idea of marginal price setting and some people said you know maybe we need to look a little bit about that and therefore there was some pressure on the Commission to uh, to, to uh, basically come up with new ideas for how the markets should work from our perspective uh, we did not want a radical change. We believe that the internal energy market, as it has been developed over the last 20 years or so, have really served us exceptionally well. It has, uh, I mean, we, we look at the analysis that has been done by Acer and others uh, about the actual um, uh, benefits, including in monetary terms, that come out of having a pan-European energy markets, which is not based on regulation, but based on markets, are really very, very significant. So we wanted to improve the market. And I think you will see that we could see that there were these objectives. We need to, first of all, make sure that we can actually use the market to boost renewables. We need maybe to protect consumers because, as you also said, you know, there were a lot of consumers that were really, really hard hit by this because, uh, you know, when, when suddenly your electricity or gas bill goes up uh, by a factor of five or more, it is really something that is felt, especially in low-income families. And then we needed to make sure that this whole market development also came with very clear benefits uh, for the European uh, industry. So what we came up with was a proposal to amend the electricity market design. Um, I don't think now, because I can see I'm running out of time very quickly, but you will see here, you know, what is the situation currently. We have uh, a lot of price uncertainty. We have a lack of system flexibility, especially when it comes to, uh, to fossils. And uh, the intraday markets are not really working uh, in an optimal way. And that's why we came up with these basic ideas of improving the possibility of using uh, PPAs, uh, Power Purchase Agreements, and we wanted also to look at the way in which we support uh, renewables and other low carbon types of energy. And there we have this idea of uh, two-way contracts for difference, CFDs, to provide much more uh, long-term certainty for investors. Um, we need member states to be more uh, serious about the assessment for power system flexibility because the flexibility is what is really required 
here. And then uh, we need uh, some improvement in the way that the intraday market uh, works uh, with uh, basically closer to real-time trading and opportunities for that. And that is what is currently on the table. It's uh, on the agenda for the ministers when they meet uh, in a couple of days, really, on Wednesday, actually. And we are quite hopeful that we are now sufficiently close to uh, coming to a deal on, on Wednesday. And then, of course, we will know exactly what will be the, the outcome of all that. Another really important part of all that is uh, sort of uh, protection and empowerment of consumers. Um, there, I think we, we saw that we think that there are clearly options and possibilities for uh, further improvements of the way uh, consumers find themselves in the market, uh, including uh, to have better opportunities to have fixed uh, price contracts, but also uh, to basically decide what type of energy they would like to consume, renewables or, or others and also uh, prevent them from being uh, cut off in situations where they have difficulties for paying their bills. And that's what the proposals are in the, uh, in the text that's currently being negotiated. I think some of these points are still open points. Um, for example, a uh, sensitive issue is the very last one on the screen there, access to regulated retail prices, uh, especially outside so say household and small and medium-sized companies. So, you know, should also uh, energy intensive industries be able to have uh, the possibility of having, you know, regulated prices in a, in a crisis situation, should that happen. Of course, we all hope that it will not happen, but it, it is not completely excluded. So, I think with that, I come to really the, the main conclusions. So, the energy sector, 70% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, you all know that, of course, very uh, strategic, uh, geopolitical uh, sector that affects uh, basically all economic uh, activities. We have uh, an energy situation and have seen an energy situation in the last couple of years which are quite unprecedented in terms of the pressure uh, on the energy sector to, uh, to deliver. Uh, as I said, for us, delivering on the Green Deal uh, Fit for 55 has now to be implemented, now it's agreed, now it needs to be implemented. It's absolutely critical and I think the whole issue about, you know, implementation of this enormous amount of new legislation that's on the table is going to be extremely challenging everywhere. Uh, small member states, big member states, stakeholders, interested parties, industry, everybody will have to really uh, make a huge effort to, to make it happen. Uh, we need to look at energy as a si in a system approach uh, and in that energy efficiency and more renewables are really absolutely key. We have perhaps had a tendency to look en at energy in a silo type of way. That's certainly not going to happen. We need to look at it in the context of industry, transport, uh, agriculture, everything else has to be thought together because otherwise it's certainly not going to be a cost-efficient uh, transition. And then uh, it's clear that we at the EU level has a, an important role to play, but at the end of the day a lot of the action on the ground has to be undertaken by others. We are happy to set the, the framework and try and set the overall rules, which are of course really, really important in order to create the certainty and the stability in the legislative uh, framework, but at the end of the day, we are not the ones who are going to build the turbines or go and um, make sure that we become more uh, efficient. So I think we've made a lot of progress. Uh, we are extremely happy that the Fit for 55 package, we can essentially, uh, hopefully in a few weeks' time, uh, tick off all the boxes. But we also know that this is only the beginning and, you know, uh, who knows what is going to be the next uh, situation that we will be facing. I mean, I'm not going to guess because, I mean, if I had been guessing four years ago, I would certainly have made the wrong guesses. Um, but there will be new situations that will arise and we just have to be uh, certain that we are in a position to respond in the best possible way. And what is absolutely key here is that the EU acts in a united way, that we avoid 
any kind of division between the EU member states because the EU at the end of the day, and I think also now we see that with COP, it was referred to earlier, the EU only can really do something useful if we act together. And even if we act together, we should not forget the EU is still a relatively small proportion of global greenhouse gas emissions, less than 10% probably. So, you know, if the rest of the world do not move in the same direction, it's not going to matter all that much. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to coming back and talk a bit more about efficiency and renewables uh, later on. But for now, that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Questions. Absolutely. Yeah, I can see their hand up. Hi, Tori Stewart Observer. Uh, on your wonderful maps, there was nothing about Jews and Arabs. Um, doesn't <laughs> this concern us at all? Thank you very much. It's part of the geopolitical instability. I think that's how I would say it. It's, it's true that uh, this has certainly not helped because uh, I think, you know, when we were also looking at what we broadly call diversification. We are also looking to that part of the world. We know that there are some gas resources, for example, in Egypt, also Israel, and you know, that part of the world could also be helpful in trying to uh, help us in the, in the short and medium term, I would say, in our moving away from, uh, from Russian uh, sources, but of course, in the current situation, this is really uh, also there are some question marks uh, over that. So it's it's an absolute valid point. I mean, I haven't updated my slides perhaps to take that into account, but I would say it adds only to the general picture of uh, global geopolitical volatility and instability. And in an unstable world, I think it makes a lot of sense to see you know how can we in Europe first of all, rely much more on sources of energy which we control, so basically homegrown energy, a lot of that being, of course, uh, renewables, uh, and how can we make sure that we do not uh, waste energy, so to be as efficient as at all possible, which is in any event necessary, because it's completely unrealistic to um, imagine that we would be able to produce enough green renewable energy if we do not use it in the most efficient way possible. Um, it, all our analysis show that we are only able to move up in the shares of renewables uh, if the overall energy consumption is at the same time reduced. <coughs> if energy consumption continues to increase, it will be impossible to cover everything with, with green energy and, and renewable energy. So, so energy efficiency is sometimes, in my personal view, a little bit undervalued as a really important part. I mean, energy efficiency is a bit difficult, you know, lots of micro decisions here and there, but super important to get this right. And that's why I think the energy efficiency and now the agreement on uh, energy performance of buildings, because buildings are 40% of our energy consumption in the EU. They are so important. And they present, and we're not hiding that, they present an, a huge challenge in terms of implementation. And, you know, sometimes we're criticized for putting um, legislation uh, together that really has, you know, is too complex and with too many um, sort of burdens on national administrations and they need to report and they need to do this and that. But I'm afraid it's necessary and, you know, there has to be uh, efforts put into this by everyone. So anyway, that was a long explanation about your question. I think it's a, it's a very pertinent uh, question and, of course, this whole situation in the Middle East is, uh, is not helping. Also, I think I, we have a second question. I think this, I mean, this kind of presentation was really the presentation we needed to have the, the, I mean, the broad overview of all these legal pieces in process. I know you probably will be a little bit more quiet with the new commission, the first, or well, un until the new commission. <laughs> yes, I hope, I hope personally, I yeah, hope. Catherine, you have like yeah, that's part of my question, so that's very good. <laughs> Catherine Manet from University of Oslo, thank you very much for the presentation. 
Uh, you pointed out uh, implementation as both a necessity and a challenge. And some of the member states have already indicated that, uh, the, that there is a type of regulatory fatigue, so implementation will be challenging. And we have Fit for 55, you have Repower, et cetera, et cetera. So do you already see some um, new areas of EU action or intervention for the next European Commission, uh, following maybe on some of the plans that have been adopted? How can we top the European Green Deal, or do we need it? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we are now uh, in this fascinating period, which is the end of the mandate, which, as, as Johan says, is normally a little bit more of a quiet period. I think maybe this year will be a little bit different from what we've seen in previous uh, commissions. But, uh, and of course, this is also the period where normally we begin to reflect in what we call the commission services about you know, what should be the big priorities for the next commission. And indeed, we are doing exactly that. Um, one, I think, big priority that will be very important is that we now need to look beyond 2030, because everything and a lot of the things I was talking about here today was really aimed at 2030. Fit for 55 looks very precisely at uh, 2030. Uh, it's true the Green Deal goes through to 2050, but what we are actually doing right now is that we are sort of trying to focus and home in on 2040. And we will already, uh, at the beginning of next year, at least that's the plan, we will come with some analytical work, an impact assessment, as it's, as it's called, about what is required for 2040. Uh, you know, we have a new... Uh, climate commissioner in Brussels these days because uh, the previous uh, Dutch commissioner, Franz Timmermans, decided he wanted to have a go at becoming the prime minister of the Netherlands. I, th I think he may not have succeeded, but uh, I think it's still an ongoing discussion there. But we now have a new climate commissioner and he had to go through the whole process in the European Parliament with hearings. And in those hearings, he actually said, uh, I think in response to questions from members of parliament, that in his view, uh, the, the target for greenhouse gas emission reductions in 2040 should be uh, around 90%. So of course, that is a little bit uh, a cue for us that you know that's where the political thinking is going. So we're looking at that and what kind of implications uh, does that have? And of course, I mean, you know, when we will have a new uh, energy uh, commissioner, and of course, I don't know. I mean, it may be that the current Estonian energy commissioner will continue, um, maybe not. But a new commissioner will, of course, always like to have some bright new ideas and big plans that you can present as, you know, this is my vision for the next uh, five years. And there it doesn't work to go and say, uh, hello, commissioner, very nice to see you. Your main project for the next five years is to implement what the person who was in your shoes uh, until recently actually uh, made out in terms of European law. That is not going to work. So we have to think of something. But I think, obviously, implementation of what we have is critical. And I think that you can also present this implementation in many different ways. That certainly a lot of things that we can do at EU level in terms of guidance for member states, how you actually do it. And then I think the, the big thing, and we'll see what comes out of all that work, is about 2040. Uh, but, I mean, you talked about regulatory fatigue. And I think we, we also need to accept that there's a limit to how many times you can actually change the regulatory framework. We're talking about regulatory stability and certainty. I mean, if the, the regulatory framework is constantly changed, it's exactly the opposite of that. So I don't think uh, that's it. But, you know, as I said, you know, we'll probably see things that we haven't even been able to imagine. Um, and then there are a couple of new things really on the, you know, coming up, hydrogen being one of them. I mean, we'll see now we have the hydrogen decarbonization of uh, gas and hydrogen packets uh, coming. That hopefully will create a lot of that, but it could well be if that goes as we are expecting or as many people are expecting, there will be 
a lot of uh, developments in hydrogen. Maybe we need uh, something more to make sure that that market develops in the right way. But, but let's see. You, you, we need to move forward. Yeah, I know, I know. There's somebody from IEA waiting. Uh, so, but, uh, can you, is it very quick? It's, it's very quick. Thank you, Hans, for your very comprehensive uh, overview. <clears throat> My name is Rasmus. I'm from Danish Energy Agency. Uh, just, uh, just to comment, uh, we have now a minister that is actually saying that he is an implementation minister. Because the last minister in Denmark, Dan Jørgensen, he was uh, responsible for making 55 political agreements. And uh, we are now in implementation mode in, uh, in Denmark. So, uh, now I wanted just to a quick reflection perhaps on, on the cost-effective way forward going to, from 2030 to 2040. You mentioned yourself, this is a very complex regulation, regulatory framework with the Fit for 55 package. Is it more of this kind of government intervention that you see? Because I see a, sw uh, a shift from markets to government intervention with this package. And I'm just curious whether you, from the Commission side, consider this as laying the tracks also for the, for the goals for, uh, for 2000 and, uh, 2040 uh, achievement. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't put it like that. I think really uh, what, what we're seeing, and I think with a lot of the things that have been agreed, uh, both with the Renewable Energy Directive and the Energy Efficiency Directive, is, shall we say, a reinforcement of the course that was already set uh, by the, 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 the legislation that was already in place. It's just... Um, updating it to be more ambitious, to fit in with the Repower EU uh, higher level of ambition. And then, of course, with that comes also the need to have the right instruments in order to get us there. And I don't think there's a huge movement in terms of, you know, the philosophical approach, you know, between a market-based approach or a more regulatory approach. I think it is still very much a combination. And I think it's the same thing with, in a, with uh, electricity market design. Because, you know, there were people who were sort of advocating a more radical change away from markets towards a more regulated approach. I don't think this is what we're seeing. We're seeing now that there are some instruments that are being promoted, like uh, PPAs, like contracts for difference, but which are still operating within a basic uh, market type of environment. And that's very much um, the way we see it, and we would hope it uh, lands there on Wednesday, which I think it will, probably. Thank you very much uh, again. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We have an RDA waiting yeah, yeah. for me. Yeah, no, I understand very well. So, uh, thank you very much, and we come back to the directives. Yeah. Uh, which, are, which are relevant for us. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, so yeah, uh, it's nice to be back here. Uh, I'm, I apologize, my uh, my my boss Tim Gould uh, couldn't make it. He was called into an important meeting this morning. But um, I'll try to present to you the the, the latest findings of our uh, latest World Energy Outlook. Um, myself, I'm an investment and finance analyst uh, within the, the World Energy Outlook, and so I tend to look at um, the, the energy system through the, the financing and investment uh, uh, prism. So I hope my slides are on the screen. Uh, I'm not too sure, given what I what I see, but I'll I'll go through them anyways. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So when we the, so the World Energy Outlook, as uh, as you know, is uh, the the yearly publication of the International Energy Agency, and uh, since a few years now, we try to release it before the the COP to try to inform the the policymakers uh, about the energy system. The World Energy Outlook um, uses uh, three what we call scenarios, which are it's not those are not projections; they are more uh, an exploration of a plausible uh, future for the for the energy system. And so um, I'll refer to those three scenarios uh, in my presentation. Uh, we have uh, the one that we call the steps, which is all the policies that exist today and that are uh, all the regulations that are in place. And we sort of extrapolate that to see uh, what the future of the energy system and the greenhouse gas emission uh, looks look like uh, in the future. We have the announced pledges scenario, which is a scenario that looks um, at um, everything that 
countries or companies have committed to in terms of uh, decarbonization and we take that at face value and we'll uh, try to look at what it means um, for the future of the of the energy system and the third scenario is the net zero uh, emissions by 2050 which is our scenario that keeps global warming uh, below 1.5 degrees uh, by 2050 and we sort of uh, look at what needs to happen to to match that scenario and and this scenario was re recently revised uh, shortly before we we published the, the world energy outlook and so I'll, I'll mention that as well so when we were putting this uh, this world energy outlook together uh, we were uh, trying to be conscious of uh, both two things the fragility of the energy markets uh, but also the risk to energy security uh, that really much echoes the, the 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 same things we've seen during the first uh, oil shocks uh, 50 years ago so we try to begin with a few reflections on where we stand today compared with 1973 which is the oil shock that actually led to the foundation of uh, of the international energy agency and so what you see on the slide here today is the is the global energy mix then and now and so what's immediately visible is how the shocks of the of the 70s prompted a diversification away from oil and uh, if we look at the uh, yeah it works it's also useful to look at the at the absolute values and appreciate how much the global energy uh, system has grown um, uh, since uh, 19 the, the 70s and what's good to note also is that 80 percent of this growth is coming from emerging and developing economies if we zoom in on oil, we see a similar pictures, especially when we look at the absolute values. The demand for oil in advanced economies is pretty much where it was uh, back then. And the total demand has nearly doubled, even as oil lost uh, market share, as we saw on the, on the previous graph. It's also worth reflecting on the fact that 50 years ago, the global car fleet, for instance, was around 50 million uh, road vehicles on, on the road. And today it's about 1.3 billion. So we went from 50 million to 1.3 billion. And that speaks to the, the, the major shifts that are happening in the, in the use of oil, uh, but also the, the, the huge importance of things like the fuel efficiency and the more electrification um, and how they've been useful in sort of uh, keeping oil demand uh, sort of uh, stable in, in, in recent years. Uh, excuse me. Sorry. If we now look at finally at the at one of the major aspects also in this world energy outlook is, is electricity generation. Um, it has diversified more, but also um, it has grown by nearly six times in the same period. Um, if you if you look at uh, where oil was uh, 50 years ago, it doubled. But electricity again has grown by nearly six times and so also the the, the other shift that we see happening is that renewables now account for 30 percent of generation which is a 10 percentage point uh, if we only look back at 2010 and the the trend toward electrifications and towards low emission generation is set to continue and so this this sort of brief review of the of three key aspects highlights uh, the sort of three themes that we try to uh, to cover in the in the world in the new world energy outlook and so the first one is of course the enduring importance of energy security and the importance of actions that are both aligned on uh, emission reductions but also in making sure that we keep this uh, this energy sec um, security uh, in a in a system that will that will look completely different from what we from what we know and so the second also aspect is that um, shifts in the energy mix do happen and they can happen quite quickly as we've seen you know 1973 is not so far away and we've seen that that changes are can happen quite fast uh, especially in, in in times of, of crisis and so that it is it is possible and third um, it's going to take a, a large collective effort with a broad range and a range of countries uh, which are at different stages of uh, of development to solve our common challenges and it underlines the importance of uh, international cooperation uh, on, on both energy and climate, as we uh, hopefully see uh, a little bit happening at, at COP. So um, when we look at the, uh, at the previous slides, we show that the world of energy has changed. And what we want to highlight is the structural forces uh, that are behind it and that, that are about to change uh, the energy system even more in the, in the, next, uh, in the next few years. So the first one of these clean the first one is is clean energy technologies and, and the first of these technologies is electric vehicles. So when we look at 2020, uh, electric vehicles accounted for about one in 25 car sales, and this year we expect it worldwide to be one in five. 
uh, the exponential growth that we've seen in recent years in in, in electric vehicles is, is set to continue and it will reach about half of sales in the major markets uh, like China, the U European Union and the US by, by 2030. The second key technology that we've seen uh, tremendous progress on is uh, solar PV. It has become a huge industry. So um, I was trying to compare the, the amount of money that was going in solar PV and in the car manufacturing industry, because I thought um, it was nice to put those in perspective. And so solar PV today is uh, the, the investment in manufacturing is one fourth of the total auto industry, and so it's 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 getting huge. Is is the message that we're we're trying to to convey? And so before 2030, uh, solar PV and and wind together overtake coal to become the the largest source of electricity generation globally. Um, and also talking a little bit about um, energy efficiency and 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 then the electrification. We, by 2030, we think there will be more heat pumps and uh, other types of uh, electric heaters sold globally than, than fossil fuel boilers, especially in, in, in uh, geographical areas like the, the EU, it's, it's very important. And the final force uh, shaping the, the, the sort of uh, rebalancing of, um, of, uh, of, of the energy system in Outlook is really the, the, the sort of um, slowdown of the Chinese growth. Um, the, the Chinese government has sort of swift from a, um, a high speed growth to, to more what it calls a, a high quality development. And we see things like indicators like the working age population of China that has peaked and so has other aspects, for instance, cement production or steel production that is uh, uh, very close to, to peaking in, in China. And so what we see is the Chinese economic growth um, sort of slowing down over the, the next uh, few years. And so the energy world, uh, it, it, obviously China has huge implications that we'll see later on, on, on energy demand and on energy uh, consumption. And so it has the potential to, to shift the, the system we know uh, today. Let me move to the next slide. So if we look at what it means in practical terms for the energy, if we start again with China, uh, between 2012 and 2022, the China has been responsible for roughly half of global energy demand growth, two thirds of uh, global oil demand growth, and one third of global gas demand growth. And China was by far the dominant player in the, in the global coal markets. And China growth has, has surprised the, 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 the energy sector um, once already, but now it's, as its economy and energy sector are changing, um, the energy sector should be ready for this or, or face a, a new surprise. And so as a result of the growth in renewable energy and nuclear power in the electricity sector, we see the, that China's coal demand is set to peak in the, in the next few years and then decline. When we look at EVs in the country, they're already accounting for a third in car sales. Um, we see a lead, this leads to a, to a peak in oil demand uh, in China also this, this decade. And the gas demand uh, will um, continue to grow, but much more slowly than what we were uh, anticipating in the past. If we look at the, the same indicators for advanced economies and uh, emerging markets and developing economies, in advanced economies, the, the energy demand is pretty much already saturated and the decline of coal is set to accelerate uh, in those countries. Um, it already peaked, uh, but it's set to accelerate. We see decommissioning happening at a faster rate than, than what we've seen. The oil demand has peaked in, in, in 2005 and its decline becomes more pronounced in the coming decade. And the growth in renewables, in power, and heat pumps in buildings um, are starting to make uh, inroads in the in the gas demands, which is uh, slowly peaking and, and declining in advanced economies. If we look at uh, the emerging world itself, um, and there we say emerging markets uh, outside of China, um, the trends are a little bit different. Coal demand continues to grow um, outside of China, and it's driven by countries such as uh, India, which has uh, large energy needs. Uh, oil also continues to grow to 2050 with a growing population and the vehicle ownership in, in regions such as the Southeast Asia or India, which are slower to, to transition to, to EVs. Um, and the, the natural gas demand uh, is, uh, is driven by the Middle East, really, which will be the largest source of demand growth uh, over the coming decade. And actually by the end of the 2030s, or by, sorry, by early 2030, um, the, the gas consumption uh, in the Middle East will exceed that of the United States. 
Uh, we have also a strong growth for gas in, in Africa to support sectors like the industry or the fertilizer pro production. And, but if we combine those uh, di different uh, regional trends, um, globally, this leads to a peak for each of the fossil fuels by, by 2030. And that's if, with the climate policies we have today, it's in, even with, without reinforcing the, the, the climate policies we have today. Um, I haven't said that it was enough. I just want to, um, to be clear. It's just that uh, we, we do see this peaking of, of, uh, of fossil fuel demand uh, before 2030. Um, just a quick zoom on, on solar PV. As, as I was saying earlier, it's a, it's a key driver for the clean energy uh, transitions, but it's also a major uncertainty and in large part because of a boom in solar manufacturing. If we look at the solar manufacturing capacity, and we're, here we refer to the maximum amount uh, that of solar panels that can be produced if all factories were operated continuously all year, it has increased fivefold since 2015, and it's set to double again in the, in the coming years uh, with the announced investments that, that we've seen. But at the same time, the, the solar capacity additions have increased more than five more than fourfold, sorry, since 2015, and more than double to 2030, which helps to meet uh, today's policy targets for renewables. What it means is that uh, the solar cap manufacturing capacity um, would continue to be underutilized, producing less than 40% of the maximum each year. So um, it's, it's a sort of convoluted way to say that we're not util utilizing enough the, the solar capacity that we already have. And so if we were, um, we would uh, we would be faster in displacing uh, the natural gas used in, in the power sector and also the coal use uh, in the power sector. And so we try to do this little exercise of showing um, how much faster we could uh, decrease the, the use of gas and coal if we were using uh, more uh, of our manufacturing capacity that we have in, in solar. And this is what try I'm trying to show here on the graph. I'll move uh, quite quickly. Um, if we look at the, the story on, on natural gas, and um, it's, it's very uh, important to look at this because we see big change coming in the markets. A lot of it was prompted by um, uh, several aspects, but one of, of these aspects was obviously uh, the, the war uh, in Ukraine. And so the, it really prompted a change uh, in LNG, in liquefied natural gas. And so if we look back in 2010, um, LNG trade was already a major global industry and it was largely governed by point-to-point -point contracts between exporters and importers. What's interesting is that the US, for instance, was among uh, the importers. If we look at what happened and, and if, we, uh, if we fast forward to, to last year in 2022, um, the industry was completely transformed. We have a much deeper and more liquid LNG market, and that was really prompted by the rise of uh, the United States as a major exporter. And it was, um, let's be honest, it was vital to the ride out of the shock of Russia's cuts uh, to supply, especially for, for us in, in, in Europe. The share of, uh, of LNG in Europe's demand rose to 35%. And what's interesting to see is that it's almost a one-to-one -one match with the contribution that was uh, coming from pipe gas uh, from Russia before, the, before its invasion of, of Ukraine. But we, what we see is that um, gas consumers around the world are left with, with sort of some bruises of, of a very turbulent year, both in terms of supply and, and in terms of, of gas prices. And... Um, for the moment, even today, the, the conversation about gas uh, remains really dominated by, by fears over those those spikes, those uh, those price spikes, excuse me, and the security of supply. Uh, but that is set to change. Um, we have a lot of projects that have started constructions or, or taken a final investment decisions, and they're set to add about. 2050, uh, 2050 uh, BCM per year of liquefaction capacity by the end of the decade, by 2030. And that's equal to about 45% of today's uh, global uh, LNG supply. So those announced timelines um, uh, suggest that it would be a large increase between 2025 and 2027. And so more than half of the new projects will be in the US or Qatar. So this, um, this strong increase in LNG production, um, you might think it's a, it's a nice thing for, uh, for the world because it will ease um, uh, the pressure on, on, on gas prices and, and on supply. 
But we have at the IA, we have a little bit of concern about who is going to take up this uh, new capacity. If we look at Europe, Europe is basically at full capacity of uh, gas usage. Um, we don't think gas uh, demand is going to increase uh, further. And that's the same for the long established markets that are, for instance, uh, Japan and Korea. So the we're trying to identify who are the key consumers for this new gas. And obviously, uh, if you look at uh, countries like China or other uh, emerging countries in, in Asia or Southeast Asia or, or India, for instance, um, we see uh, we see some demand coming here, but we we're not sure um, it's going to be uh, there's going to be enough demand to match that uh, those increase in supply that that we see coming coming online, and that's especially true if we consider that China uh, will grow slower than 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 anticipated, and so we see ample uh, supplies of uh, of LNG in the second half of the of the decade, but there is there will be very limited opportunities for for oil and gas suppliers to to find new customers, and also quite important for Russia, uh, it will it will be quite difficult for them to secure additional markets in Asia, which is sort of, you know, um, the, the argument they've been using when they said, like, we don't necessarily need uh, Europe as a client for, for our gas. Now, if I, if I look at uh, what this all means uh, for investments, obviously it has uh, significant implications for, for investments. Here, what you see, the red line is the, is the trend for fossil fuel investment and how it has evolved uh, in recent years. And so it's sitting now about $1 trillion per year. So in the past, the trends in our uh, scenarios showed that uh, we, we would have needed to increase fossil fuel spending to, mute, to meet the future energy demand. But today, with a, a lower demand outlook for fossil fuels and a, and a more dynamic clean energy, it's no longer the case. The end of the growth era for fossil fuels, it doesn't mean that there won't be any fossil fuel investment left, uh, but our analysis uh, sort of cut short the argument that there would need to be any increase in, in spending uh, on fossil fuels. And spending on fossil fuels is one thing, but we also need to look at the other side of the equation, which is clean energy. So we need to accelerate the momentum that we've seen. It's, it's been growing rapidly uh, by about 40% since just three years ago. Uh, and we are set for this to rise well above $2 trillion uh, uh, by, tw by 2030. However, this is not enough, and it needs to double again to four trillion if we are to uh, meet the objectives that we uh, uh, set forth in our net zero uh, uh, scenario. And so, uh, and this is especially true in uh, in the emerging markets and developing economies, which is uh, also very concerning in in this uh, the the new financing environment that we see with uh, high borrowing costs and elevated debt levels, especially in the in those countries. Um, I'm going to go really quickly on this slide because it's a quite uh, convoluted one and complicated one. Um, the message here is that uh, we are facing new vulnerabilities in the energy market and especially on the concentration on what will constitute the, the, the basics of our energy system in the future. If you look at this slide, um, on the on the y axis on the vertical axis it's a logarithmic scale so uh, every every graduation is uh, is 10 times uh, bigger than than the next one um, we see that the the commodities that consist, constitute the energy system today which is oil natural gas uh, their market share their market size is huge and they also um, now if we look at the the horizontal axis the, this shows the level of concentration of the given commodity uh, amongst the top three uh, producers. So you see that oil and natural gas, they represent a huge market and they're um, concentrated only to about 40 to 50%. Uh, at least that's what we show in, in, in 2017. If you look at everything that will make up the future of the energy system, so the critical minerals, uh, you see that it's a much smaller market, but it's also very, very, very concentrated. And here you see the picture in 2017. If you look how it evolved in the past few years, you have a, 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 a slight growth for those critical minerals, uh, but you also see that the concentration is also increasing. And so that's very, very concerning uh, that you know uh, things like lithium are almost 100% con concentrated in the top three producers. And, and that's a vulnerability that the world really need, needs to take into account if we are to solve the, the, the climate program, problem. Um, if we look at announced projects, we again have um, a larger share for those, for those, uh, for those critical minerals, the concentration, 
for most of them remains still at about 80%, which is uh, way too um, too high if we are to maintain, um, if we are to meet uh, our, our energy uh, goals. So I'm gonna go quite quickly, but um, um, on just the temperature impact of our, of our scenario, uh, 2023 was officially now the, the hottest year on record at I think one, more than 1.4 degree uh, uh, of warming. Uh, in our stated policy scenarios, uh, back, um, and we see that we would reach almost 2.4. A non-net zero scenario um, is, is our, the scenario that reaches uh, 1.5. We have a, a limited overshoot, so that means that the temperature rise slightly above 1.5 at some point, but then as we as we uh, increase climate action, um, it goes back down uh, below below 1.5. And so I'll go very quickly because it's sort of this uh, this uh, slide is is uh, slightly old news now uh, by a few days. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear yes, me? I, th I think uh, we are we are running out of time. Do, do you have many it's, it's slides? It's really left? the last one. It, okay. It's the last one. Okay. It's fine. the last one. Uh, the, just um, in the World Energy Outlook, we try to give uh, uh, inputs to the to the to the COP discussions, and so the, those are the the five pillars that we try to to provide to uh, to to the COP, and um, the the five uh, sort of. Uh, pillars that we identify that are necessary to keep uh, the world uh, below 1.5 degree of warming. Um, and, and so the, the, the first two ones that were discussed at COP and we're pretty happy to see, to see some discussions is the tripling of renewables capacity uh, by 2030 and uh, the doubling of energy intensity improvements uh, from now, uh, part of, uh, each year from now to, to 2030. And we were pretty happy to see those two points that were discussed, uh, taken up pretty, pretty quickly at COP. Um, on fossil fuel demand, we also say that, you know, um, to uh, reduce emissions from fossil fuel, you need to reduce the use of fossil fuels. And so we, we see a, a, a reduction in the demand of 25% by 2030. This was not taken up uh, quite uh, positively at, at COP. We're still debating. I think we'll see what, what the final text looks like. We also um, try to uh, raise attention to the to the to to methane, which is of course a, a big problem. And and this there were some discussions um, on this, and so it's it's a good thing. The last thing that was not discussed. Um, enough is the clean energy investment in emerging markets and developing economies that needs to rise more than three times from the levels we see we see today, and that's very very that's a, that's absolutely key uh, if we are to to keep global warming below 1.5. And with this, um, this is the end of my presentation, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tangui. Very good. I think uh, the IEA analysis is very useful for all, all uh, globally and also in, in particular for the IEA members, of course. So, uh, felicitations. And uh, should, we, should we then, uh, t maybe t to make justice for him, also to take two or one or two questions from the, from the audience. Then I have to move around with this microphone, I think. I have to walk. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. As I understand, in my lifetime, our energy consumption in whole earth it's uh, uh, increased three times generally. And r really, effort what we have now to stop it is that we we can celebrate uh, uh, degrees of economic grow in China. Uh, uh, I am quite a pessimist about all the other scenario. Uh, do, you, do, do, you, do we have uh, any ways to uh, get the same uh, result without the economic stop in Europe or states? Just a this kind of philosophy question. Thank you. So maybe while while the I don't know should I take should I wait yeah, for the yeah, other just, question just, or just take the question and and I don't know if there are yeah. several. Yeah. So I think um, I think what we're trying to show at DIA we're trying to in generally speaking we're trying to 
um, explore uh, an, an energy future that is cognizant of, of uh, human development and, 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 and you know social advances for instance um, if I look at, um, at energy access you know all those uh, there are many people uh, there are about uh, 700 even 800 million people that don't have access to to energy in Africa all our scenario incorporate this we also incorporate um, you know pretty uh, optimistic um, uh, assumptions in terms of development in our scenario and so the, the idea is of course uh, we don't want to put a, st a stop on, on growth and, and on, on development um, the idea is just it's going to be different it's going to it's going to it's going to uh, switch from fossil fuel heavy emission intensive to renewables and and uh, and, and so it's 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 more a matter of uh, it's not stopping growth it's a matter of shifting it somewhere else and, and we think it's it's uh, really it's completely doable, and and we've seen that it, it, it's doable in, in many aspects. Like if you look, like solar, I, we always come back to solar, but solar is very very interesting in this aspect. Like you, it's um, it's it's exceeding even our, our best projections. Thank you very much. I, I think we have to finalize uh, now, Tangui. So thank you very much, and all the best to Tim and his colleagues. Thank you. Yeah. Should we say that? And then uh, thank you, and then we continue in the program uh, with uh, another international uh, organization which is IRENA, the International Renewable Energy a Agency. So we have uh, with us Louis Janeiro to speak about the global outlook for renewable energy. Thank you very much, Johan, and perfect pronunciation, no worries. Um, so, uh, first of all, thank you very much to the Nordic Council of, of Ministers for the kind invitation to Irina to come to this Nordic Balt Baltic Energy Conference. I was asked to um, talk about the global outlook for renewable energy and also give some, some hints about what is Irina's philosophy in terms of integrating these huge volumes of renewable energy that, as our colleague from IEA mentioned, are already coming to the market. I will start uh, with um, a brief overall perspective of the challenge of the global energy transition and how IRENA sees this playing out to be able to decarbonize the energy system by mid-century. To provide also a bit of context for the rest of the discussions here, you see uh, the breakdown of final energy consumption by energy carrier in 2020 in the left-hand side and in 2050 in uh, the right-hand side according to IRENA's 1.5 a scenario to meet the goals of the, the Paris Agreement. You see today fossil fuels dominate the, the picture. Uh, they account for roughly two-thirds of final energy consumption and electricity accounts for about a fifth. We usually spend 80% of the time talking about electricity, but it's just one-fifth of the final energy consumption. By 2050, uh, this needs to change uh, dramatically, so electricity uh, should become the main energy carrier, accounting for more than half of final energy consumption. And this is driven by the electrification of transport and heat uh, sectors. We advocate for decisive electri electrification of all forms of road transport, including the heaviest uh, uh, trucks. Uh, we also advocate for the electrification of low temperature heat in buildings and in industry, as well as some parts of the uh, high temperature processes in, in industry. And uh, why, why electrification? We advocate for electrification first because it gives us the opportunity to substitute the fuel and with clean power. It eliminates the local air pollution, but also something that is usually not so, this, not so much discussed, which is the huge efficiency gains that come with electrification. So an electric vehicle consumes a third of the energy of an internal combustion vehicle. And similarly, a heat pump also consumes a third of the energy of a, of a boiler. But of course, not everything can be electrified, and that's why uh, you see also in the scenario an increase in modern biomass uses and the use of hydrogen and derivatives of hydrogen like ammonia or methanol. This part on hydrogen and synthetic fuels, which has attracted a lot of attention recently, is just 14% of the final energy consumption. You would think, uh, if you look at the debate, public debate about energy recently, that hydrogen is the core of the energy system. It is not. It's an important part but it's, uh, in our scenario, about 14% of an energy system. And also, if you look behind that hydrogen, there's electricity. So in the end, when you look at this final energy consumption picture, roughly two-thirds of that is electricity.
Of course, we will need a massive scale-up of power generation to feed all that electrification. And in this, this graph, you see two scenarios. One is the planned energy scenario, which is similar in, in way to the, to the steps scenario that the IEA colleagues just showed that presents uh, existing plans and forecasts. Already you see in this planned scenario in the left-hand side that power generation is expected to almost double by 2050. Renewable share increases from 28% in 2020 to 73% uh, in 2050. But this falls short of meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement, containing the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. In the right-hand side, you see IRENA's 1.5 scenario, where electricity consumption grows uh, triples by 2050 to 87,000 terawatt hours. The share of renewables grows to 91% uh, of generation, from less than a third today. And variable sources like solar and wind uh, would account for more than two-thirds of the uh, power generation, up from a very small fraction today. This means that the installed capacity would also need to grow tenfold compared to today to reach 33,000 gigawatts by 2050. And to achieve this, we need to roughly triple annual capacity addition, so uh, to roughly 1,000 gigawatts of renewable power per year. So this is more than three times what was installed in 2020. Too. So we have a, a massive challenge ahead of ourselves. Now, the good news is that uh, the cost of renewables is going down and is going down fast. IRENA manages probably one of the largest databases of actual real projects to analyze cost data of those projects. This figure comes from our latest cost report that was released just a, a couple of months ago. The cost of solar PV has declined by 90% over the last decade. The cost of wind onshore has declined by 69%, and the cost of wind offshore, which is also very relevant here in the region, has declined by 60% over the last decade. So the result of this is that solar and wind are now the cheapest options to produce power in most markets around the world. We even see increasingly that the cost of a new solar plant or wind plant is lower than the marginal running cost of existing fossil plants in, in a number of markets. Of course, we do see in some cases a transition, uh, let's say, transitory price increases in certain supply uh, chains that can temporarily increase the, the cost of some of these technologies. We've seen that in the, in the wind uh, market recently and putting pressure on some important players. So we do recognize that there can be price shocks whenever the supply chains shake. But we think that the fundamental uh, technological trend, the underlying long-term trend, is a very clear one towards cheaper uh, energy. So we think we are in a much better position now to accelerate the deployment of renewables and to do it at a much faster pace than, than before. And global markets uh, for new capacity have been clearly recognizing this, this trend. You see in this graph the historic power generation capacity additions over the last couple of decades. You can see how renewables have been increasingly gaining dominance over the last decade. Renewable capacity additions have consistently outpaced uh, other technologies. And in the last three to four years, you see how the dominance is, is, is more clear with more than 80% of the capacity additions. And maybe it is because of this that uh, more than 100 countries, uh, actually I think by now is 125 countries that have committed to triple uh, renewable energy capacity worldwide by 2030, which would bring us actually to, to a similar figure that our colleague of IEA was mentioning, uh, about 1,100 um, gigawatts by, by 20, sorry, 11,000 gigawatts by 2030, which would put us closer in line with the, with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So I think we can safely say that we are in an accelerated path towards the governization of global power systems. One question is, of course, if, uh, if we zoom a, a, a bit in, uh, in Europe, whether Europe can rely on renewable energy. And if you listen to the debate, there's quite a broad consensus that Europe will need to continue to be an importer of energy. And if I may be a, a bit provocative here, it, this may be the case, but it's certainly not for a lack of renewables potential. So just for illustration, I'm showing here two maps developed by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. They show the generation potential for solar PV and onshore wind in different regions of Europe. 
And it's important to know these are conservative estimations of technical potential with high restrictions in terms of land use. And still you see that the estimated potential of these two technologies sums up to 16,000 terawatt hours, which to give you a sense of a scale is roughly five times the current consumption of the European Union plus the UK. Also know that I'm not showing here offshore wind, which is of great importance here in the Nordic Baltic region, and also with a technical potential that alone can power Europe several times around. And I'm also not adding here other important renewable technologies such as hydropower, uh, biomass, or geothermal. So yes, it may be that we continue importing energy for techno-economic reasons, but Europe has more than enough renewables potential to supply the bulk of its energy is with, with, a decarbonized, with renewables in a decarbonized energy system. So, renewables are becoming very cheap and Europe has plenty of them. Now, coming back to how to reconcile energy markets with the green transition, which is the theme of the, the conference. Of course, a key question is how can a system be reliable with such high shares of renewables, of variable renewables in it? Because, of course, the, the, the sun doesn't shine at night and the wind doesn't always blow. And I can reassure you that at the International Renewable Energy Agency, we've noticed that too. So, indeed, renewables bring variability and uncertainty to the system. Um, and, and with this, they bring additional need for flexibility. But it's important to understand that the energy security or the, the reliability is not a property of the one single technology, it's a property of the overall system. So we should not be saying solar or wind are reliable or not, we should be talking about the reliability of the resulting system. So to answer this question on how to operate systems with high shares of variable renewables, we think we need to look beyond what uh, we traditionally have seen as the generation side of the power system, and actually beyond the power system itself, to see the energy system as a whole. Generators are not the only ones that uh, can pro provide reliability to the power system. In, in, in fact, there's multiple other uh, sources of flexibility in the power sector. The grids, interconnectors, storage, demand response, changes in system operation and market operation, all of them can increase the flexibility of the system and contribute to the reliability of the system. And we are seeing this in practice in, in multiple countries, including several in the, in the EU, that are ahead in the, in the deployment of variable renewables. Also, we think it's important to look beyond the power sector itself, or what we understand, that to, to extend it to the overall energy system. Heat and transport account for 80%, as I mentioned before, of our consumption, and they can be electrified to a great extent. And this electrification is a double-edged sword. So if we do it carelessly, it can be a big threat to the energy system, to the power system. But if we do it in a smart way, it can be a huge asset for the integration of more renewables and to ensure security of supply. So we think that modern energy systems will be increasingly integrated with heat and transport, flexibly coupled with heat and transport, with energy production increasingly decentralized, and with producers and consumers increasingly interlinked through smart digital systems to manage all of this complexity. But of course, it needs to be acknowledged that this is all far from trivial. Maybe I, I was, I'm at the risk of sounding a bit that this is too easy to do. Of course, it's not. We recognize also that a system with high shares of variable renewables is more complex than the legacy system that could just follow the load with flexible gas plants. So we will need innovative solutions to deal with this complexity. And of course, one pillar of that is technology, but we think that technology is not enough. So having new technology is great. So for instance, we have cheaper batteries now, but we need at the same time new or adapted ways of organizing power systems, power markets, and new solutions also for new business models to actually leverage the full potential of those uh, technologies. And we call this systemic innovation, so understood as innovative solutions that bring the energy transition forward, tapping on these four dimensions. So not only technology, but also the other three dimensions. And my colleagues at IRENA's Innovation and Technology Center have been doing quite some extensive work in uh, creating a taxonomy of these innovations and collecting examples of their implementation around the world, many of them actually within the EU and in this region. 
uh, starting with, so I will just show you a couple of reports that we've done for you to potentially consult at a later stage. So first, starting with this report, that is the Innovation Landscape for Renewables Power Future, which focuses more on the supply side. And this report identifies three, you know, uh, sorry, 30 innovation typologies, I should say, which you see in the screen, for the integration of variable renewable energy in power systems across the four dimensions that I that I just mentioned, so enabling technologies, business models, market design, and system operation. And these go from utility scale batteries, so the emergence of cheaper, uh, more performant batteries, to uh, business models that, that rely on um, and dynamic pricing, um, uh, net billing schemes, or system operation, new system operation rules like dynamic line rating, et cetera, that can use more efficiently the existing grids. And uh, there's a second report that we released uh, this last summer, so this is more recent, that explores the, more the demand side. So this one looks more in depth at the electrification of end-use sectors with the intention to support countries in formulating as, as more, as, as smart electrification uh, strategies. So this one includes an inventory of 100 innovations along three main sectors, the transport sector, so power to mobility, the uh, heating and cooling sector, power to heat and, and cooling, and uh, power to hydrogen, so enabling uh, hard to decarbonize sectors through indirect electrification with hydrogen. So if you're interested, I invite you all to, to go to our website and, and explore this taxonomy uh, more in depth. And with this, I conclude, and I thank you very much again for the kind invitation. Thanks for keeping the, the time schedule. Very yes. good. Uh, we are a little bit uh, delayed, but uh, I think uh, it was very interesting also this, this uh, typology and toolboxes to deal with intermittency. Very, very good of you. Thank you. Any, any questions for uh, Janeiro? Yes, over here. Hello, I'm Ruot Schnuck from Latvian Regulator. And I have a question on your slide where you demonstrated those systemic uh, regulation systemic efficiency and uh, do you think it could be done by market forces or we would need some specific regulation to foster those systemic innovations thank you well um, I think it's it, again it's not a, a question whether markets or not markets um, you can achieve the same objective with different different formulations I think for instance if you look at one example um, Electric vehicles. So if, if we continue connecting electric vehicles now, we will soon have a, a, a capacity that is comparable to the peak generation capacity. And the question whether we can tap that potential there. So on the one hand, as I mentioned before, is a double-edged sword. If we connect all of those cars at the same time, we can break the power system. But that has the other side of the coin, which is that power can en enable us to respond in critical situations with generation capacity. And then how can we tap that? It's a matter of the technology, but it's a matter also that the regulations are in place on how are you supposed to connect your car under which conditions following certain system guarantees. And then whether the regulations also enable the, the marketplace to actually um, create a business case out of it so that you legally can connect, that you legally can become a generator with your own car in your garage, etc. So it's a matter of tapping on the, on the four uh, dimensions of that uh, we call inno systemic innovation rather than but to the question whether it's a market or a regulatory thing I think you need both you need regulations to actually markets to operate uh, efficiently thank you <coughs> any other question Christian Christian Rastal from Renewables Norway to my understanding, traditional um, power plants provide a lot of um, stability to the system, inertia. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your thoughts on uh, how that can be handled in a system with a lot of uh, renewables, the, the physical aspect? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So first of all, I'm not a power sector stability expert, so that you should come in. I think from our discussions internally, my understanding is that we are still very far from a situation in which we are lacking inertia, because still in Europe there's, there's still a, a, a massive inertia from uh, uh, generators. 
Then I think it's a matter of um, different markets have different needs. So if you are in, in, a, in an area where you have hydro, in the case of Norway, I don't, I don't, I don't see a, a potential problem there, in the sh at least in the short to medium term. And there's other markets where you don't have that. And then when you really get to the, uh, let's say, very deep decarbonization levels, where you are like when it looks like in 2050, then there's some markets that you will need last resort sources of security of supply. And that is still to be debated exactly how, which ones could be. One option is, for instance, to have uh, a reserve um, um, asset or a research group of assets that run on gas, but in that, in that case with uh, renewable hydrogen, for instance, that could potentially provide that, that inertia. I don't know if I answered your question roughly or not, but uh, I think we are still, in the case of Europe, we are still very far generally as continental Europe, we're still very far from that situation. Yeah. Thank you again, uh, Louis. Uh, I think we, we continue. Thank you very much thank again. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And then, then we're a little bit behind the, the, the schedule, but uh, one more speaker before the, uh, the snack break. Uh, that's uh, Mark Lane from the EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, financing perspectives on, on how on new market design and energy transition. The uh, floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm just conscious it's probably coffee time now, so I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, yeah, basically kind of from the, the BRD, um, we kind of cover, um, bis oops. Yeah, we kind of basically were established in 1991 um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, we kind of basically are kind of covered with shareholders across 71 countries. Um, in five different continents. Um, you have the breakdown here, and you can see kind of EU countries basically make up kind of just over half, but there's also kind of a lot of non-EU kind of uh, countries that are there as well that are shareholders. Um, we have kind of a diverse range as well. I think there was a question earlier on in terms of, I suppose, kind of the Israel-Arab kind of, I suppose, kind of conflict that's there at the moment. Um, and we have kind of shareholders in Israel. We also have kind of a lot of Semit kind of countries as well. So it's not just kind of issues, kind of our conflicts between different countries or issues. It's also kind of within an organization. It can be quite tricky as well. Um, in terms of the, the Nordic and Baltic countries, uh, effectively, I think kind of the shareholding is just kind of um, less than uh, six and a half percent. Um, overall, uh, mainly kind of I think it's about six percent kind of um, from the, the the Nordics and then kind of the point three kind of effectively from the, the Baltic countries. Um, we have a capital base kind of about thirty billion that's provided by these countries and uh, which can triple A rated. Um, this is kind of a, a, a breakdown of the, the countries where we operate. Um, obviously, kind of we don't operate in the Nordics, uh, but we do kind of operate in, in the, the the Baltic states and we operate kind of in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, kind of all the way over to the Caucasus, and as far away as kind of Central Asia, Mongolia, and also then kind of in Africa as well. Uh, so it's kind of quite a diverse range of countries. We have kind of a strategic capital framework up until 2025. There's three key pillars. The first one is kind of for green transition, which we're discussing today. And basically we have a focus on trying to have kind of more than 50% of the, the business being green kind of by 2025. Uh, we also have kind of an inclusion pillar, kind of, which is providing a quality of opportunity. And it's also kind of basically kind of looking to basically have gender mainstreaming. A key part of this as well in terms of energy kind of going forward is making sure that you've just transition in the countries that we operate in. And the final pillar kind of uh, is digital. Um, we've been talking earlier, I think in the previous slide, we looked at all the different kind of um, I suppose areas across the, the market design and also kind of in terms of the different technologies that are needed. And uh, obviously in the digital side, it's looking at say, kind of how can digitalization basically improve the energy transition and the green transition, um, but it's also kind of mitigating any potential risks. So obviously if you start increasing the, the amount of digitalization in a country, it can have additional issues in terms of cybersecurity risks, et cetera. Um, so some of the, as I said, kind of the, the, the key goals that we have is to increase the, the green financing, uh, kind of up to 50% of annual bank investment by 2025, um, to align our activities with the Paris Agreement, um, which we've kind of done, and basically to double the mobilization of private sector kind of uh, climate finance by 2025. Again, a key pillar of the bank, um, even though we do provide kind of public sector financing, um, the goal really kind of for EBRD is to try and provide as much private sector finance as we can. Um, and basically, kind of given the scale of investment that's needed kind of um, for the energy transition, you're not going to be able to do with kind of um, state kind of finance. You, you do need kind of the private sector to be involved. 
Uh, again, this is just looking at the overall kind of increase kind of over the, the next few years. We kind of have gone from about just a quarter of um, the bank's ABI kind of um, for green, kind of up to 50% kind of at the moment. And basically, you can see the benefits that are there kind of from doing that. Um, the areas that the, the bank basically kind of invests in, um, it covers the whole spectrum of the kind of the energy sector. It kind of covers heating, uh, covers water, transport as well. So it does cover kind of a, a broad range of the areas that kind of are needed for the energy kind of transition. Um, basically, kind of in terms of production and generation, um, we kind of basically cover a lot of projects uh, for kind of uh, obviously kind of renewables, whether it's kind of wind and solar, whether it's kind of uh, onshore or offshore, um, and. Obviously, for the market, kind of we're looking at kind of increasing interconnections. We have a number of interconnectors that we're working on at the moment. Um, one interesting one is kind of in terms of mentioned kind of was say kind of geographically trying to kind of um, I suppose kind of merge regions. We're looking at a, kind of a, an element one between Tunisia uh, and um, Italy. Um, we're also looking at ones kind of in terms of connecting Moldova uh, into Romania and the rest of the EU. But there's kind of a number of ones that we're looking at. Um, we also kind of invest, say, kind of in terms of upgrading and extending transmission infrastructure, kind of across different countries of operation, um, and it's also looking then at the actual system operations that need to be done as well. So, we have an approach where it's not just providing the finance or the, the actual kind of financial capabilities of the different types of investments. It's also looking then at kind of in terms of policy dialogue, and this is a key part of the bank as well, um, where we are maybe different from other IFIs, where a lot of the, the focus with other IFIs is basically on providing the financing for the types of investments that are needed. We also have a very strong kind of policy component where we basically try to make sure that we kind of have sector reforms uh, linked with the investments that we basically provide. Um, so a lot of this as well is in terms of kind of like say with the transmission system um, or distribution system is looking at the financing that's needed for them, but it's also then looking at kind of ways that you can actually improve, improve the operations uh, that are there as well. So, kind of, so we mentioned the, the issue there in terms of inertia, if we're looking at say TSOs, um, how could they improve say kind of rate of change to frequency, how could they improve inertia, and basically looking at the levels of interconnection that you have, if you have more interconnectors, basically it's much easier to export the more renewables you have and you don't have to be curtailing capacity. So there's a number of ways kind of that are complementary to each other. Um, and obviously in terms of the consumer side, we cover kind of transport, in terms of the electric vehicle charging, um, and in terms of EVs, uh, but also then in heating as well in terms of kind of looking at kind of um, heat pumps um, and other kind of means as well in terms of energy storage. So across the board, I think in terms of the energy sector, we basically kind of effectively have projects across all the different areas from production um, to the, the market design in terms of transmission distribution and, and the supply. Uh, a lot of the policy that we do kind of have in terms of, like I said kind of earlier, just in terms of the actual financing, whether it's different types of kind of loans or concessional financing or kind of um, SLB products that we would have, we do kind of provide the, the financing support. We also provide project support for those financing packages. And we also, as I mentioned earlier, kind of provide policy dialogue as well. So that's not just looking at providing financing for green investments. It's also looking to support kind of countries in terms of their long-term strategies for energy transition uh, and low carbon pathways and providing the regulatory and legal support as well um, in those countries. Um, these are kind of key ones in December in terms of reports that we have coming out. Um, the energy sector strategy up to 2028 and mining sector strategy, uh, they're kind of just out in the last week. The board still has to approve the energy sector strategy and we just had our transition report kind of coming out as well. Um, some of the areas in terms of energy sector um, strategy is kind of looking to scale up renewables, um, looking at investing in the networks and um, basically system flexibility that's needed as well. Uh, promoting zero carbon fuels, which we mentioned, um, phasing out on the bit fossil fuels, and again, obviously, kind of this is a big discussion um, at, at COP at the moment. Um, helping to design kind of robust energy markets, um, and effectively, I suppose, kind of in terms of the market design, this is a key component in terms of how can you make the, the, the markets more flexible and be able to accommodate more renewables going forward. Um, enhancing energy efficiency and providing for a just transition, which again is one of our core pillars. Um, in the mining sector, kind of it's looking at, say, kind of still supporting metals and minerals um, that can basically kind of um, are, are key for green. Um, it's looking at decarbonisation of the mining activities. So you're looking at can you have renewables basically kind of powering these mining activities as opposed to the traditional fossil fuels, looking at digital skills, um, innovation and efficiency as well. Um, then it's also looking at improving ESG practices and helping governments overall. The transition report um, is interesting. It's just out. Um, it does look at it that there is a move towards green transition, but um, it also highlights, as was mentioned kind of by um, the IEA kind of earlier, 
um, the issue of critical raw materials and I suppose kind of the, the fact that they're kind of dominated in a very small number of countries. Um, it also highlights though kind of at a, a smaller level in terms of kind of I suppose kind of consumers that most people or three quarters of people that we've kind of looked at um, basically in the OBRD, EBRD regions, they're concerned about the environment um, but they're not as willing to actually kind of pay for the green transition. And I think this is a critical issue kind of for governments going forward. It's not just about kind of identifying the fact that you have kind of uh, climate change and that you have kind of environmental degradation and say biodiversity kind of loss, but it's do you have consumers that are actually going to do something about it? Are they willing to actually pay for the actual measures that are needed to, to transition? And I think kind of from the survey we found in DBRD, um, it seems that kind of there's a high level of awareness of climate change issues, but not uh, willingness to actually can pay for it at least yet. Um, these are kind of country strategies that the bank develops. Um, we have it for every uh, one of our countries of operation. Uh, these are the ones obviously for the Baltic states. Um, and a lot of them, are kind of, I won't go through the whole lot, a lot of them are kind of quite similar in terms of looking to improve uh, energy resource efficiency and reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing renewables. So this is fairly kind of common across the three Baltic states that we have. And again, I think from the bank's point of view, kind of our focus in the Baltic states is really kind of in terms of um, providing a focus on renewables, um, on providing the uh, underlying framework in terms of the capital, um, I suppose, kind of structures that are there and capital framework that we're able to attract more investment into the local capital markets uh, to be able to finance more private sector renewables and stay kind of renewables as well. And obviously then in terms of, I suppose, kind of digitalization and being able to provide tools for that, including energy security, um, which has become prominent over the last number of years. Uh, these are just a couple of examples of the types of energy projects that we're kind of financing kind of in the Baltics. Um, we have a number of kind of equity investments kind of in Estonia, uh, both with kind of benefit green and Sunli. Um, we have uh, green bonds kind of with the state companies Lafenergo kind of an AST um, in Latvia and then we also have kind of a number of projects kind of with Ignatius, EPSOG and VIPA kind of, um, in um, Lithuania. The only one there kind of I'd mention as well um, is that we've had our first kind of offshore wind a project with Poland um, basically for the, the Baltic power offshore wind um, project that's kind of started and effectively, I suppose as well, that we're aware that there's going to be a lot of work in terms of increasing offshore wind in the Baltics. Um, and I think kind of the bank is basically well positioned to be able to kind of support in any kind of future uh, developments there kind of for offshore wind as well. Um, again, this is just a quick one in terms of auctions, because obviously market design is a key component. And I mentioned kind of later on, we'll be discussing the CFD auctions. Um, so this is a number of areas where we provide kind of support uh, for kind of renewable auctions. Both, like I said, not just on the providing the, the finance, but also in terms of looking at the gaps in the legislation, regulations, providing all the support in terms of tender documentation um, and all the kind of auction process uh, design. Obviously, then in terms of policy outcomes as well, kind of making sure that kind of the overall policy outcomes for the auction designs are that the auction itself is well designed. Um, and again, this will probably be kind of covered later on in terms of the, 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 the CFDs. Um, but across the bank, because we cover such a wide area, it's not just looking at, say, kind of having a, a single policy tool like CFDs. Obviously, there was a discussion as to whether we'd have a mandatory CFD system in the EU. Because the, the, the number of countries you cover is so broad and there are very different stages of development, we need a broad range of policy tools to be able to kind of accommodate, say, kind of um, what's appropriate in each specific country and to have something that's tailor-made for those countries. So we kind of have different types of, say, kind of um, PPA auctions. Um, CFD auctions as well, um, a whole range of different kind of products um, in terms of long-term um, auctions that would be able to put in place. An example, I suppose, kind of here uh, is where we have ongoing engagements in 15 countries at the moment. Uh, we're providing technical assistance for over 33 million. Um, the expected kind of capacity is over six gigawatts and uh, financial kind of, um, what's kind of um, total for that is seven billion. Um, again, as we mentioned, they kind of cover some different countries. And there is a range of products where we provide. Some of them kind of are CFD support schemes. Some of them are kind of, say, kind of normal PPA kind of schemes with battery storage. Um, others then are your traditional kind of schemes as well, kind of where you basically look to support uh, PPAs kind of with, with wind and solar. Um, I mentioned earlier on just in terms of kind of the support uh, for energy transition. And I was highlighting that the, the policies kind of that are in place, they do vary kind of by country. Uh, this is kind of from our recent uh, was a transition report that's just out in December. 
Um, and I think kind of what you can see here is that if you start looking at all the different kind of questions in terms of do you believe in climate change, do you think again, it will have an impact on you kind of in your life or on your kids, uh, do you think it's real, etc., scores tend to be kind of fairly high. Um, but then when you do come to the last couple of questions in terms of willingness to pay for it and to be able to kind of increase taxes for it, um, you can see there kind of that the willingness to do so is much, much lower. Um, and again, the, the other kind of graph on the, the, the side, right hand side, kind of reflects this, where the 46% represents the uh, willingness of people to be able to, that are aware of climate change and the willingness to actually kind of pay for it. The skeptics who are 25% that basically I suppose are skeptical about climate change and don't want to pay for it. And then you have this kind of bracket in the middle that kind of are, I suppose, kind of undecided. They tend to believe kind of in climate change, but they're also kind of not willing to, to, to pay for it. Um, the interesting thing there, if you look at the top five in terms of the most skeptical countries, um, three of them are actually kind of the, in the Baltic states. Now, I'm not going to opine as to why exactly that is. I think a good maybe kind of reason for it could be the fact that with the, the war in Ukraine and the proximity of the Baltics, obviously, to Russia kind of in Ukraine, that that kind of, and the impact that that had in terms of energy prices has probably had an impact on it as well and maybe skewed the figure somewhat. Um, but it is just kind of interesting there to see the level of skepticism that's there kind of for the Baltic states at the moment um, in terms of green transition policies. Um, in terms of jobs, um, if we kind of basically looked at a kind of a breakdown over the, the last number of years from 98 to 2019, um, what we found is that it's actually kind of not straightforward or very quick to kind of transition from sick and brown to green jobs, um, and that the process takes a while. Um, we found kind of the, for EBRD countries across the board, um, after a year, about half or just under kind of half uh, that had left brown kind of jobs were still unemployed. Um, 19% kind of had kind of uh, retired. Um, only about 16% had actually gone into green kind of jobs. The, the figures are higher than kind of for EU countries, um, which would obviously be relevant for, for the, the Baltic states and, and the Nordics. Um, there was also kind of mention of critical raw materials. Uh, these are a number of supply risks that are there, obviously COVID. Um, uh, you have the geopolitical conflicts, obviously, kind of in Ukraine at the moment, and natural disasters and export restrictions. An interesting thing with the export restrictions as well is that um, there was mentioned that they're very kind of uh, concentrated in just a small number of countries. Um, in 2019, only 5% of the critical raw materials can basically face export restrictions. In 2022, that had gone up to 30%. So there's been kind of a growing kind of increase in terms of export restrictions for critical raw materials um, over time. Um, again, in terms of the importance of critical raw materials, um, IRENA kind of and IEA had covered the actual kind of uh, stats in terms of the increase in terms of electric vehicles uh, compared to conventional vehicles and in terms of kind of renewables over kind of, say, fossil fuels. But as you can see from the graph kind of IRENA's, uh, from IEA's kind of figures, it also highlights that there's a lot more critical raw materials needed for these types of green technologies um, in order to develop them. And again, in terms of where they're located, um, they're highly concentrated. Uh, this is just highlighting kind of if you're looking at two different blocks. The one in blue is effectively for Western countries um, that are kind of obviously kind of for covering the, the EU. Uh, the orange is kind of covering kind of pretty much the rest of the world. Um, you can see that the actual kind of concentrations, besides being very kind of limited, um, we tend to kind of not have those kind of, uh, I suppose, kind of uh, resources in terms of critical raw materials. They tend to be kind of located uh, kind of outside, outside the West. Um, I'll finish up with one slide just kind of on Ukraine, um, given its, I suppose, again, proximity, but also the importance in terms of energy security and obviously in terms of market uh, integration as well. Um, we have basically kind of just reached a more 3 billion kind of financing target for Ukraine uh, for 2022-2023. Um, we're looking at kind of a range of uh, measures in terms of immediate uh, kind of crisis response. We've had a number of projects kind of with the largest energy companies um, kind of basically kind of NAFTA gas for over a half a billion, kind of Uka Negro, the TSO for over half a billion, and Uka Hydro Negro kind of as well kind of uh, for uh, over 200 million. Um, and we're basically kind of moving to kind of uh, looking at long-term kind of reconstruction measures kind of going forward. We've also been working on Aid Energy, which is a program where we're basically looking at uh, working with other kind of um, with the energy community to try to identify all the resources that are either being destroyed uh, as a result of the war in terms of kind of the, the systems that need to be replaced and the whole thing is to try to develop a digital tool to be able to kind of try to kind of source all these materials in terms of the supply chain. Um, obviously I think I'll just finish up by saying energy security is going to be key going forward um, obviously as well 
You'll have, say, the Baltics that will be looking to integrate synchronization now for Ukraine into the EU is now complete, but it's going to take another couple of years, I think, then before the Baltics will be fully integrated. Um, and as well, kind of market integration will be a key component going forward as well. Um, I'll, I'll finish up there because I know we're short of time. Thank you very much. <laughs> you, you, you kept a lot of time uh, with uh, 10 seconds. Okay. The first speaker so far. Very good. Uh, should we take this? Now we have the, the break, coffee break, but uh, we could afford one question or two. It's interesting to see that you are also supporting the countries on administrative side. I didn't, I didn't know that so much. Yes. Uh, it's quite impressive. Everyone's coffee. Then yes, everybody wants a coffee. So thank you very much. Everything was crystal clear. Yeah, so we, we, we uh, resume in 15 minutes. 15 minutes. I think we will we'll also have a panel here, uh, which means that we have to finish, uh, I think, at 12.40 maximum uh, uh, with the speakers. And then uh, we will have um, some, some questions for the panel. Uh, and I, I should not repeat what has been said on the electricity market design. I think Hans went into that. But uh, it's, it's a fact that we've had a very difficult period with volatile markets. High prices have spiked off. A quite tough discussion in, uh, in, on how healthy our markets are designed by the various directives, regulations and packages. Uh, in the middle of the energy crisis, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said that the markets were not fit for purpose. Uh, the statement was made in, on one of the major speeches. So maybe, maybe it was a little bit uh, exaggerated, this, this, uh, this statement, but uh, still, I think this was part of the reason why why the Commission also, pressurised by Member States, put forward a, a new proposal, which actually is in the final stages of decision-making. Uh, let's uh, go to the speakers. We have uh, uh, expertise from various angles. We have representatives from the electricity associations, from the regulatory side, from the TSOs, from the project developers. Uh, so let us start straight away with um, Christian Rastal from the Renewables Norway representing the major electricity companies in Norway to address what change will the electricity market reform bring to the energy industry. So I give the floor to you, Christian. Thank you very much, uh, Johan, and it's good to be here in Tallinn today to listen and learn, to meet colleagues and hear about others' perspectives. So I've been asked to talk about the ongoing review of the European market design and in particular to give some views on how the provisions on CFDs and PPAs will influence the energy industry. Before I do that, I would just like to say a few words about the organisation that I represent. So Renewables Norway is an interest and labour organisation for the renewables industry in Norway. We have more than 400 members from all over Norway, representing uh, renewable energy producers, grid operation, uh, contractors, electricity sales and energy advisors. We are around 60 employees and have offices in Oslo and Brussels. And furthermore, we are an affiliate of the Norwegian Confederation of Enterprise, Nur Energi, Euroelectric and Wind Europe. And through Noor and Nagy, we enjoy close collaboration with the other Nordic associations for electricity production, distribution and suppliers. Uh, and members are Sweden Energy, Renewables Norway, Green Power Denmark, Finnish Energy and Samorka. And overall, Noor and Nagy represents more than 2,000 market participants. With regard to my presentation today, I put up a few key questions that I would like to address. First, I will very briefly say a few words about the background for reform. Then I will try to give an overview of the main elements of the reform. And at last, how these provisions on long-term agreements, what they will mean for the energy industry. So first, why reform of the European power market design? We've already spoken about it. But in 2022 in particular, power prices went to extraordinary levels. And this led to a very challenging situation for enterprises and industry all over Europe, but in particular also for households. 
And the result was massive protests and a heavy debate on the fundamentals of how the power market actually works, both at national level in most European countries, but also at European level. And many got engaged in this debate and, and started to mean a lot about uh, how the power market should be like. And many started to question the very close connection between the gas and power prices. Uh, and particularly in a system with a lot of renewables, it was perceived as very unfair that uh, the last bid that is activated uh, sets the price for all power producers. And as Hans also mentioned in his presentation, 39% uh, of power generation was from renewables in 2022. So of course, with very high power prices, some producers earned a lot and consumers had to pay a very high price. And this was the background. Um, uh, when Ursula von der Leyen claimed that we had to kind of change how the energy market works. Uh, I won't read the whole statement, so you can read it if you want to. But uh, it's to be said that this was a political statement, but it had support in many countries, particularly in the south of Europe. And uh, both Greece, Spain and France made their own proposals for how the power market should be like. And many radical ideas were circulated in this period. But at the same time, we saw that everything that came from the Commission, more at expert level, was very uh, kind of thorough in its assessment. And it recognized that higher power prices uh, were a symptom of a more structural imbalance between supply and demand. But we were a bit anxious about what the European Commission actually would put forward. Um, because high power prices had created a kind of a pressure to do something and to change something. And it was probably a good thing that the worst power price peaks were over in March when the Commission put its proposal forward because it was very much in line with what we'd seen the Commission publish more at expert level. But at the same time, the European Commission recognised that the current market design had shortcomings that needed to be addressed and that we had to kind of improve how the power market works. So, a bit about the key elements of the reform. In the law proposal put forward in March, the European Commission explained its overall objectives with this reform. And an important goal was to make the electricity bills less dependent on short-term variations in the power markets, and particularly on the gas price. It was also important to enable investments in new renewables, which is Europe's way out of the crisis. An important goal was also to kind of make the short-term markets more efficient and to get alternatives to gas to balance the system. Consumers shall have better protection and shall also be empowered to take more control over their own electricity consumption and electricity bill. And the European Commission also wanted to enhance market integrity and transparency through changes in the remit regulation. I will not go into the details of that here, but that's also kind of an important part of the reform. And as already been mentioned, um, the Council and the Parliament are now in the final negotiations. A fourth political trilogue will take place on Wednesday. Perhaps an agreement will be reached. If not, it appears that a fifth political trilogue will take place before Christmas. And in any case, uh, all institutions seem very eager to, to reach an agreement by the end of the year. So is this really a reform? It was launched as a reform, but as Hans uh, already mentioned, uh, the fundamentals will remain. Although some provisions are still open and not finally negotiated, we know that the Council, the European Parliament and the Commission agree that the fundamentals shall remain. We will still have free price formation as today, and short-term markets will work as today. So ma marginal pricing in merit order will still be part of the model. The rules for cross-border power exchange will also be as today. And the temporary income cap for inframarginal generators uh, that were introduced as a temporary measure during the crisis won't be extended. Uh, or at least embedded temp uh, on a permanent basis. So the fundamentals remain. But although the fundamentals remain, there are many ch changes. 
and uh, I'd have to say that the level of details uh, is a bit overwhelming, but I will give you a, a brief overview. The first pillar is about improved hedging possibilities and long-term agreements to boost investments in renewables. Member states shall promote the uptake of power purchase agreements. These are long-term agreements, often tailor-made. Um, they can last for 10 to 15 years and give on the one side the consumer a predictable price and at the same time um, the producer gets a stable income. And Member states shall remove unjustified barriers to PPAs. A standardised contract shall be developed to be used on a voluntary basis and the European Commission shall do an impact assessment of the potential for an EU market platform for PPAs, also to be used on a voluntary basis. And for many consumers, it is difficult to enter this market because the agreements are very long. So Member States shall, in a coordinated manner, ensure that instruments such as guarantee schemes at market prices are in place and accessible to customers that face entry barriers to this market and are not in financial difficulty. In addition, there are provisions on a two-way contract for difference. And through these support schemes, as has already also been mentioned in earlier presentations, the producer has kind of a guaranteed price and when the market price is lower than that price, the state pays the differential. But when power prices are above the guaranteed price, the producer has to pay back to the state. And this is a tool that traditionally has been used to enable investments that are not commercially viable. But with high power prices, some have argued in favour for a very extensive use of these contracts. And particularly France has argued in favour of using these contracts for existing generation and also for refurbishing their nuclear fleet. Um, and to kind of uh, use these contracts as a way of introducing regulated prices that can be transferred to, to the industry. So this has been a really heavy debate. Um, and other countries have been very worried what such a development could mean um, for competition and for how the internal market actually works. And exactly how it will land is not clear, but the regulation will specify that if a member state gives di uh, direct price support to investments in renewable or nuclear, it has to be in the way of a two-sided CFD. And this is to avoid that when the state gives insurance and take a lot of risk, they also get some of the upside. But it will still be up to member states to decide whether they want to give public support and whether this support shall be direct price support. Furthermore, it shall be voluntary for producers whether they wish to apply for this scheme. And as a main rule, contracts for difference shall be awarded through auctions. And that's also important, given how the debate has been. And the last question, not yet sorted out, is how the potential revenues shall be used. And we know that there are different views, but we expect the regulation to have some specification of this. The problem with low liquidity in the financial forward market is also addressed in this reform, and there has been a lot of debate about the design of this financial forward market, but the conclusion appears to be that the European Commission shall do an impact assessment, and details will then follow in an implementing act later on. When it comes to alternatives to gas, to balance the system, there are several changes to improve how the short-term market works. It's about reducing minimum bidding size to enable more market players to actually uh, participate, um, sharing of order books to increase liquidity in the intraday market, and also moving the intraday gate closure time closer to delivery. And the development of flexibility solution, storage, and schemes, support schemes for flexibility is also kind of important in this aspect. Protection and empowering consumers um, is a very important part of the reform and final customers shall now have the right to a fixed price, fixed term agreement. And this is to ensure that they can choose between different agreements. Today there is a right to dynamic pricing. With this new provision there will be a right to choose. And suppliers will also have an obligation to offer fixed price, fixed term agreements 
but probably the NRAs will be able to give exemptions if certain conditions are met. And all customers shall have the possibility to have more than one electricity supply contract to enable them to have different contracts for different parts of their consumption. A right to energy sharing is introduced for all final customers and many suppliers faced financial difficulties during the crisis. So NRAs shall now ensure that uh, suppliers have appropriate hedging strategies. Member states who have not yet appointed a supplier of last resort shall do so, and there will be a new mechanism to declare an electricity price crisis in the future. So what do the changes mean for the energy industry? I always think it's important to remind ourselves that the fundamentals will remain. Um, that is important, given how this debate was and considering um, the, all the different ideas that were actually discussed. So this picture is just to remind us that we are building on a model that we have developed for decades. We're adding new elements to it. And then I was asked to give some reflections on long-term agreements and what, they, what the new provisions on CFDs and PPAs mean for the energy industry. And the very short answer is that it depends. Because PPAs and CFDs are nothing new, but it all depends on how these instruments will be used on the way forward. And I will give some reflections from a Norwegian perspective. And I realized when I put up these slides that I'm trying to answer a question by posing very many new questions, but bear with me. PPAs are now perceived as the silver bullet. Um, and the same goes for fixed price, fixed term agreements that you need to kind of protect yourself from the volatility in short term markets. But these agreements and these products are nothing new. In Norway, we have long experience with PPAs and a lot of hydropower production is already on long term agreements with the industry. About 50% of Norwegian wind power has been developed through PPAs as well. But more awareness, of course, about the benefits of these agreements can lead to more demand for PPAs and fixed term agreements. And traditionally, I think there has been a sound balance between supply and demand, at least in Norway. But it is, of course, uncertain how power producers will be able to meet a significant increase in demand. And for example, um, hydropower producers in Norway who hedge more than a certain threshold of their portfolio, they face a rather severe tax risk because the resource rent tax is calculated on the basis of spot prices. But who knows, perhaps uh, a significant increase in the demand for PPAs can lead to kind of changes in the tax regime to enable more PPAs. Another aspect seen more from a system perspective is of course the trade-off between predictable prices and the incentives to actually react when prices peak. And the last reflection is the liquidity in the financial market. Because this is a very flexible, flexible market and it's very important for suppliers to uh, offer different products uh, to their customers. Uh, contracts are standardized and you can trade them very easily. Um, so it's important to keep this market in mind and recognize that there might be a trade-off if you kind of enable a lot of physical agreements. And then a perspective on PPAs as a way of boosting investments to renewables. Uh, and Hans already mentioned this part as well. But this is, uh, graph shows how um, the development of permits granted has been in Norway the last years. Um, and there has been a very sharp decline. So this is just to, to show that uh, the financing part is one part of the puzzle. But of course, to realize more investments in renewables, you also need permits and you need social acceptance for the investments. Regarding CFTs, I think it's important to remember that member states will still uh, decide whether or not they will give uh, public support to new investments. And the new provisions on CFDs, they've got a lot of attention and they've been very much debated, but they will only apply if a member state has decided to give public support and that support shall be in the way of direct price support, not investment support, tax deductions, certificate schemes or other kind of instruments mentioned in the Renewables Directive. 
And the new um, provisions will rule out very inefficient schemes that have been used earlier because it won't be possible to have, for example, feed-in tariffs like Germany has used. And the design of the new CFDs will hopefully also ensure efficient dispatch and that the power producers still have incentives to react on short-term signals. And by ensuring that the state gets something back, um, you also perhaps can get more social acceptance for using these schemes because potentially the states can get some revenues that can be transferred back to consumers to finance new schemes or to finance the energy transition. And for the industry, of course, CFDs will alleviate the risk for project developers. Um, but if we use them very broadly, we can also end up in a system where the state and not the market bear most of the risk. And that's something at least my organization is a bit concerned about. So the million dollar question is whether or not the energy crisis will lead to an increase in public support, whether this situation has changed how the state think about investments. And if yes, then that changes a lot, of course, for the energy industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have a panel after, so you, you will have the possibility to ask questions to the, the speakers. Uh, I think we could, it was very enlightening on the substance of this uh, proposal. Uh, very, very useful. Uh, should we just go straight on the uh, next speaker, uh, which is the Rota Snuka from the Latvian regulator, with the views from the regulator on the new electricity market uh, reform design. Good morning. Um, yeah, I hope this device works. Uh, yeah, it's again nice to see uh, some colleagues here again after a year. And I think a lot has been changed and uh, we had a quite good description of what already happened in the new electricity design. I will, I will not repeat that part. But just to, to reflect what Van der Leyen told, I think during COVID, once I went into a supermarket to buy salt, and there were no any. Can I conclude that the market doesn't work? Uh, there are quite a lot of uh, external factors, which must be uh, researched, must be found out why it doesn't work. And today, I think this market works perfectly. So, so, uh, I, ah, as well. I put on the screen some uh, electricity market objectives, but the reason was that I deviated a little bit from my title of presentation, and I hope it still be fine. And today, apart from uh, reinforcement of internal market and um, consumer's protection, I would like to focus more on investment part. And of course, there was a good and inspiring talks, uh, what and how we must reach. And of course, this is for new uh, decarbonization and which also brings in security of supply. And they are quite important, especially under those geopolitical conditions we are having today. But, but of course, we have to also solve those invest this investment question and uh, find out who will finance this part, and especially important for the regulators which approve uh, at the end of the day the system tariff. And uh, that's why I would like to reflect maybe a little bit on developments of um, EU energy market by 2030. And the Commission recently came up with a new uh, communication regarding grid and investments. And uh, I think the main, uh, main aspects which I found out quite, quite interesting is that uh, it is planned to increase electricity demand by 2030 by 60 percent. And of course, if we are coming up with <coughs> electrification, uh, with uh, more, uh, more use of electricity, less fossil, fossil fuel like gas, I think it is a reasonable approach. But of course, it needs to develop the system. And uh, if we go up to 42.5% of uh, binding renewable target, or even more, and uh, if electricity demand is meant to grow by 60%, of course, this target even moves more than, than before, uh, proportionally. 
And uh, yeah, going uh, back to this new communication, it also concludes that investment in a EU, EU power grid, it must be around 500, 584 billion euros. And the major part of that uh, must go into a distribution system. And today I will not maybe talk too much about uh, transmission system because uh, we have several funds, how we can fund it, and comparatively it is smaller, almost 10 times smaller system than, than distribution grid. And uh, of course, this one requires some attention and decisions ma made how, how the system will work. Uh, Going back to the same objectives, uh, I would like to this slide just demonstrates what are uh, those uh, DSO reality we were stand in in this uh, EU policy framework. And of course, if we would like to reach those 62.5% of renewables by 2030, around 70% will be connected to distribution system operator or distribution grid. Uh, for more CO2 reduction, minus 55 by 2030, it is also a general enabler, enabler of less integration. It is also, again, a distribution company, and we also need to develop, develop this flexibility to somewhat decrease uh, expenses. Uh, Electrical vehicles, uh, this is for sure distribution system where those vehicles will be connected to, to get uh, electricity. And active consumers or energy communities uh, where possibly some countries are quite good developed. We in Latvia are still trying to get this framework in place, but without uh, distribution operator, this will not be possible because most of those actors who are part of um, energy community, most likely they will be connected to distribution grid. And finally, new business models. Uh, I already asked a question whether it is part of a uh, market or it is uh, somewhat more policy uh, related and how to uh, promote that we have a new market or also new business models. And uh, at this stage, I think it is not yet uh, in a way that uh, distribution operators will think about new business models unless uh, we will prove that there is really uh, some problems with financing at the end of the day. Uh, just to uh, reflect a little bit this DSO landscape in, in Europe, and it really varies from country to country, uh, whether it is centralized of, or decentralized DSO system. At least in uh, Lithuania, I understand it's one DSO. In Latvia, we have a one major DSO. In Scandinavian, in Scandinavian countries, uh, evidently, there are different DSOs. And, and why I put the slide on the screen, it's mainly because we might need a kind of a common approach, common methodologies, or at least common principles for methodologies, how to develop a new tariff and put all those costs into, into a tariff because someone needs to pay at the end of the day. From this also, uh, this is at least uh, this distribution. It is around 10 million kilometers in Europe and 10 times to the moon and back, while the transmission system is uh, hardly one time to the moon and back. Uh, just to describe a little bit of the new role and challenges for DSOs, and, and there are challenges on demand side, and there are challenges also on supply side. And demand, demand side, of course, it is electrification. As I mentioned, it's around 60% grow by 2030, even more possibly by 2050, as uh, already in previous speakers demonstrated. And there are new loads, also if we need electrical vehicles by 2035, then uh, new uh, cars will be only electric. 
Uh, also, heat pumps, which are more uh, like efficient or even three times efficient when if you use electricity as such. And this probably also could change those uh, consumption levels and consumption patterns, how electricity is used. And also on the supply side, uh, of course, there is inter intermittent uh, supply generation like solar PV, wind, and uh, those are largely connected also to distributional network. And in Latvia in 2021, it was like 2,000 households which were connected to a grid. Now by the end on 2023, it could be 20,000 households with the solar panels on the rooftop, and they all would like to be connected to a grid, and it brings in also some additional costs. And it also means some by directional operation of these grids, which are historically well driving to one direction from transmission grid to distribution grid. And this is quite simple system of energy supply. Uh, uh, about regulations and policies uh, in the middle generation, transmission, distribution, and end user are probably missing new trend like electricity, uh, like demand response management, which will bring in quite important uh, positive change. Uh, so electric vehicle part and uh, below, they are investments. Where can I find them? Those are EU funds, which are managed uh, nationally, managed at the EU level uh, for uh, transmission network. Also, congestion management could be used uh, to, for in, to improve infrastructure and also to give some release to tariff, as well as national funds. And of course, and user at the end of the day is the one who pays for all infrastructure. And uh, if uh, in this slide, I would like more to reflect what are those, those funds. And this is quite recent uh, DSO research uh, around uh, Europe uh, to reflect how to put together all this financing puzzle. And they are uh, the success rates. And on the right hand, you can find out funds. Uh, more than 60% success rate is uh, connected to national funding. In this case, national funding, it also means uh, EU funds which are managed nationally, like resilience and recovery fund, modernization funds, and those which are planned nationally, which is also involved why we have quite big success rate in national funding. Uh, also, life uh, has quite big success rate. It has been historically already in place for, for a while, in, and mainly also related to um, transitional, transition to more uh, decarbonized economy. Uh, for CEF funding, connecting Euro funding, it's uh, also mainly uh, PCIs, but there are also some programs which are not specific for uh, transmission, but also distribution operators can, can uh, apply. And unfortunately, the less success is for, for innovation fund, where uh, evidently operators can be successful and can get money for innovative approach, which probably is most needed to come up with a more effective system. Uh, apart from that fact that uh, DSO has many challenges, I would say that also regulators as being responsible for setting tariffs, setting methodologies, uh, they also, we also bring quite a lot of uh, responsibilities and uh, in the current environment, uh, first of all, what I would like to mention is uh, monitoring energy market integrity and transparency, which is remit regulation. It was within a new electricity market design. It was also almost approved. Well, like the final stamp is needed. And uh, this will bring uh, more responsibility also for ACER, which, which is agency for... Uh, 
energy regulators cooperation and uh, they will take more responsibility for uh, like uh, cases which uh, falls within a responsibility or two or more countries and also for the third uh, participants or third countries outside the EU which would mean better probably supervision and uh, case handler uh, the second uh, is uh, net zero mandate for regulatory authorities and at this stage at least the regulator in Latvia and some more regulators, they are like economic regulators which doesn't have this responsibility to implement uh, decarbonization policy. And what this means, it, it, it means that uh, if some solutions are not cost efficient as it could be, it, the regulator might not take it on the board and there is no, we're just missing that link between tariff, tariff methodology and decarbonization policy. And more specific, uh, where I would like to pay attention, they are new regulatory frameworks and uh, of course there is a request that new frameworks are predictable, that they are balanced, they are aligned with financial markets and avoid some specific type of investments. Uh, I could fully agree, but from a regulatory side, it is not quite, quite easy also to carry out. Uh, we need some kind of criteria also for future projects, which we can approve. And there are different practices from country to country, whether they are like ex-ante approval of, tariff, of projects in tariffs or ex-post approval. In Latvia, we approve ex-post and we have regulatory period for distribution system operator until 2027. And in case operator make investments, it means when in 28, we, we might, it might be necessary to increase tariff quite drastically, even if, if we did already this year. And it could, could be also maybe to, to, to require some, some more practical or some other uh, solutions, while so far uh, we were favorable of long regulatory periods, maybe they must be shorter to reflect more to market changes as we did in, in district heating sector when during COVID there was very vulnerable uh, energy prices or, or more, more price for biomass or for gas when uh, we adjusted tariff on a monthly basis. And this is how we avoided from very sharp increase or decrease of, of tariffs. Uh, in addition, Definitely, uh, we have to incentivize somehow implementation of innovative technologies. That's why the question what would be the right way, how, how we could go forward with more innovations, because at this stage, uh, usually distribution system operators, uh, they are used to pass through their costs to the tariff. Uh, without maybe some more innovative approaches, more additional thinking, and but offshore, uh, this will not be able into the future. Otherwise, uh, we could bring some part of society, we can bring this energy poverty up and we will not be able to, to put in the tariff all as it, in a way, uh, in a traditional way, I would say. And uh, finally, of course, uh, cost reflect reflectiveness, uh, but there should be also, this principle is quite important, but uh, there should be this uh, more distribution between producer and consumer. Uh, there are some EU countries which have only tariff for on consumer side, not so much on producer side, but there are also costs on producer side and those must be to some extent reflected into the tariff and support or participation um, also which provide uh, to the system which provides flexibility. We already have some requests from 
market participants which would like to develop batteries, which would bring in some flexibility in distribution grid uh, for uh, like different type of tariff, which would more uh, promote this approach and make this system more uh, flexible. And conclusion, uh, in, for conclusion, I would have like three main uh, points. And uh, the one is that grid operators, they are a key players to achieve those objectives, which were demonstrated on the screen today. Uh, in general, at this stage, there is a mismatch between growing identified needs and resource availability for grids. And uh, finally, also regulators, uh, we have we must have this increasing role for developing methods uh, which really meets the need of existing and future energy transi transition. Uh, to finalize, uh, at this stage, I was not really uh, able maybe to reflect more on electricity, Europe electricity market design as moment we are working as the regulators together for 2040, putting together scope uh, and uh, adding our expertise to understand uh, which are most, most important issues where we need additional analysis. And by uh, next year, by the middle of next year, we will transfer them back uh, to a commission, to a new commission, to think about uh, some new market design or some aspects of market design. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, again, I think we can uh, we jump to the next speaker and uh, we take the questions in the panel. So the next speaker, uh, deployment and financing clean energy in Finland. Marit Usitalu. Yes. Okay? Yes. Floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm Marit Usitalo from, from the Finnish Transmission System Operator Fingrid. And this is my first appearance in this session. And I'm, I've been delighted to hear so many interesting presentations already thus far. So I'm really expecting that also for tomorrow. Um, I also changed a bit my, my title. Uh, I'm not going to talk about financing uh, so much. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the sort of so-called uh, success story about uh, in introducing clean energy to, to fin Finnish system. I first have a short peek on the history side, not very long, uh, very short. And then I, I will be talking about uh, some future years that we see. Uh, about five years ago, um, we, we had uh, the first market-based wind power uh, installations. Thus far, we, we had this uh, subsidy scheme uh, for the first two, 2,000 megawatt uh, capacity uh, with the so-called, uh, I don't know whether it should be called a strike price or whatever, a guaranteed price for, for wind, wind parks. But uh, on, on uh, around 18, um, we had our first market-based, uh, without subsidy, built uh, wind power. Uh, we had uh, low prices for fossil fuels and emissions. Emissions scheme uh, was very low at that time. Um, and Finland was very much dependent on imports. Um, most of you might know or not know, uh, but uh, we had like uh, 1400 megawatts of import from Russia uh, to electricity not to talk about the gas side, but anyway, in, in, in electricity. And today we have cut that uh, import totally. But at that time, we were very dependent on imports, both from uh, Sweden, but also from Russia. Um, at that time, the interest started to wake towards the production investments and de deployment or development of wind power. The prices uh, of, of wind power technology came down also, uh, the uh, uh, emission scheme, uh, the prices came up. So today, uh, our wind power production uh, is growing uh, very fast in Finland. Uh, onshore wind in Finland uh, is one of the cheapest ways to produce electricity in Europe. Um, 
solar also is growing rapidly. There was talk about rooftop solar in one of the other uh, previous presentations. In, in Finland, they are also doing these, I um, don't know what to call them, solar parks. Uh, one of the national or uh, in-house electricity generation in Finland is, is based on peat. And uh, that is sort of gradually coming down due to emission schemes and, and other targets. And uh, there are solar parks or, or investments planned on, on those uh, peat landscapes. So, so we are talking about like, like 70 megawatts uh, up to 100 megawatts of, of solar power parks in Finland. You, you, you can imagine it's just about like the same, same here in Estonia. We don't have such, so much sun during the winter time. But anyway, that's growing rapidly. Uh, we have, uh, let me say, finally have Olgiluoto 3 uh, up and running uh, commercially today. And uh, also the emission prices have multiplied, which also enhances the productivity or, or sort of uh, investment friendliness for, for renewables. So uh, demand for clean and affordable energy is growing. We talked about the crisis last year. Um, and that sort of uh, emphasizes the need for affordable be being there as a target. And we are gradually becoming a net exporter. Uh, another historical fact, uh, in um, new wind, wind installations uh, in 22, Finland was number three in Europe. Mind you, the, in, in globally, I believe China was even the, the number one. So uh, they, they, they installed much more than, than uh, we, we did here. But this chart is, is from uh, Wind Europe, and uh, it's, it's about European installations. So this is a one-year snapshot. Uh, today, uh, by the end of uh, 2023, we will have approximately uh, 6,400 megawatts of wind power installed in, in Finland, which is quite a rapid change uh, looking some years back. And we, we cover already like 14% uh, of our consumption, electrical consumption, uh, already 22 by our wind. And uh, development of wind and solar is, is still growing in, in Finland. You can see the potential is, is there. I don't know if the, the yellow chart uh, shows very well in, in, the, in the picture, but anyway, uh, by, by 2030, uh, there would be a potential, huge potential for wind power in Finland and also solar power. And it, it's both rooftop, but also these uh, solar power parks. So they, they really, uh, there's a lot of land uh, in, in Finland. And if those peat, uh, peat uh, fields are, are uh, decommissioned, uh, there would be like uh, infrastructure already in place for those. So uh, by 27, we have uh, estimated or assessed by our scenarios that uh, wind power energy will take up the uh, electrical energy produced by, by nuclear in Finland. Uh, hydropower will remain uh, about the same level. We are not expecting uh, vast amounts of new hydropower. There are uh, talks about uh, pump storage uh, plants, but, but anyway, the, the, it, it's going to be stay the, the remain the same level. And the current nuclear power capacity uh, we, we still expect to be. There has already been talks about uh, some small modular reactors, uh, especially for the to, to produce heat heating system. Uh, but uh, at least for electrical uh, production, we expect them to be about the same same level. And other thermal power is we expect to decrease. Uh, basically, everything that we use burn something uh, that's going to be phased out gradually uh, in the in the future. So um, there's a diverse production mix still expected in in Finland. Another note uh, is about uh, other clean energy uh, installations or investment plans. Uh, this is from, now you can't see it from, from, uh, from the lower part, but it's from Confederation of Finnish Industries. They, they collect uh, the investments plans uh, from various uh, 
clean energy investments. This is uh, sort of a uh, screenshot from, from their uh, electrically uh, updated site. Uh, you can go in, in their site and, and check. Uh, but they, they collect batteries, bioenergy, biogas, electric mobility, and you can see they are pretty much uh, quite steadily uh, deviated uh, in, in Finland. Um, for wind power, it, it's um, a bit concentrated on the western part. Uh, for one thing, uh, due to uh, profitable uh, wind speeds and, and steady, steady winds in the, in the seaside, but also due to the border um, towards Russia, uh, the military has some needs for, for radar uh, protection, so uh, they need to find out a solution uh, that, that sort of covers the military needs for, for radars in order for us to be able to sort of spread out the wind power development on the eastern side. And uh, it's about uh, money put in the system, but it's also jobs that the Confederation of Finnish Industry is in, in, uh, interested in. Some, some other uh, presentation was also talking about the jobs in, in either the brown industry or, or clean industry, but uh, this is also, there's plenty of in, in interest uh, of how, how many jobs actually is or, or will be in the clean energy side. And uh, the sort of the, we are already doing the production side, the supply side. We are building the grid to be uh, able to uh, introduce this clean energy transition. Uh, what we also need is the consumption, uh, clean energy consumption. And some of these, uh, these uh, investments that uh, they have collected are also on the, on, of course, on the consumption side. Uh, energy storage is very important uh, for the flexibility for the uh, future system due to the volatility, of course, from the wind, as we all know. Um, and there are some, some, there are already some batteries installed in Finland, but uh, more, more would be even more welcome. Um, we also talked about, uh, there was a talk about how the uh, maybe the wind power investments are not as uh, fast growing as, as they used to be. I don't know if you can, you can see, but uh, on the, on the right hand side in the, in the picture, you have uh, the electricity produced uh, by wind. Uh, first of all, those that already are in operation or have a connection agreement with Fingrid. And then the lighter, um, lighter bar on top uh, are those uh, investments which do not yet have a uh, connection agreement or, or they are maybe, maybe not uh, as far in their planning. And uh, that is also one of, one of the reasons is that for, in order for the production side or the supply side to grow, we need the consumption to grow as well. So uh, also this electrification of the industrial processes for <coughs> For, uh, for, from, from uh, burning natural gas, uh, from using uh, electric energy uh, to produce uh, steel, for example. That's very important for, for these uh, uh, supply side investments to be, come forward. And you can see the sort of the 22, 25, uh, 30, that's according to Fingrid's own scenario planning. Uh, all this will also mean some kind of a shift in the Nordic power balance. Uh, as, as I was saying, uh, Finland has, has been traditionally very, very dependent on imports. And uh, gradually uh, going forward in time, uh, we can see that uh, fin Finland will come uh, surplus side. Uh, today we already have some, some points of time when we are actually exporting uh, uh, from, from Finland. Uh, that is very, very dependent on the wind situation, of course. Whether, whether we have 6,000 of, of wind power or not in the system, of course, makes a difference. And uh, also, uh, let's look at the... This is according to, to Finnish uh, Fingrid uh, scenario, so I don't know if Norwegians will uh, be, be of the same opinion, but uh, there's, of course, a traditionally been a surplus of hydro, and all this uh, consumption side coming uh, into the system 
it, it might be uh, heading, heading for more balanced or even deficit in the, in the southern part. And, and then uh, why Finland has been such a fast uh, develop, developer of the wind? Well, uh, one thing is that uh, coming from a grid company, uh, uh, I, I'm proud to say that we have quite a, a strong grid. We have uh, the whole country is one market area or price area, what should you call it. So um, there are at least not thus far have been some regional uh, places where the grid would have said that uh, sort of limited the, the wind power development. Maybe coming further in time that will come uh, to be the, the qu play, uh, question, but not, not thus far. Uh, so uh, that's one, one thing, uh, we have a strong grid. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we are very well connected to other European countries, for, for Sweden, for Estonia. Uh, we already have good connections with our neighbours, and we are <coughs> already planning and building uh, new ones. We have already one line uh, being constructed uh, to Sweden up north, and we have another planned, or at least we are starting to plan that, and also we have a third link to, to Estonia in our plans for future. Uh, onshore wind, uh, that is still more cheaper to build than offshore, and uh, I put the uh, Finland uh, and, and Germany on top of each other in, in the map. Uh, Finland, as I said, has today like uh, 6,000 megawatts, a little bit more, uh, wind power, and I believe Germany has, what, 60,000 megawatts, so 10 times more. And we have the, approximately the same region, and we, uh, one of the issues is that uh, uh, we are a bit sparsely, sparsely populated. We have like uh, five plus million people, and I don't know how many Germany has, maybe 10 times, three times more. Uh, we have um, Effective permitting processes, that was mentioned in one of the early, earlier presentations to be one of the key factors for coming forward. It's not only grid uh, permitting, it's also the wind power, the clean energy system investment permitting. That is a key factor to be effective on, on that, to have short timelines, uh, to have uh, agreed and, and fixed processes for permitting. And, and that really has at least today helped uh, the Finnish system. Uh, highly electrified, uh, I mentioned already the industry electrification, but it's also the heating system. Uh, electric vehicles have been, uh, transportation system have been already mentioned many times uh, today. Um, we, what we have already, uh, clean and ele efficient electricity generation, we have already nuclear, we have hydro, and, and now we will have in, in more numbers even, even the wind. Uh, so, uh, at least thus far, it has been a relatively low risk for wind producers to, to come and invest in, in Finland. Uh, we have uh, also quite a, I don't know, relatively uh, good opinion or acceptance in the local communities. One of the reasons have been that, uh, that uh, the wind power investments are coming in th those kind of regions that are losing population for large cities, for example. <laughs> so the tax paying public in those communities is going down. And when the wind investment comes into that region, they sort of generate uh, money for the local community. So that is really also been one of the key issues for acceptability in these regions. Uh, so uh, at least uh, today, there are no subsidies uh, needed for, for, for Finnish uh, wind power producers. But you can see that uh, it, it sort of, it's not sec so secure anymore. So what we need uh, are the consumption side. Uh, hydrogen uh, generation uh, has been very much talked about in, in Finland. Uh, we made a common uh, strategic uh, plan with, with uh, gas grid and, and their hydro, hydrogen part uh, together with, with Fingrid. And uh, we, we really were happy to see that those hydrogen uh, pipelines also came up on, the, on those PCI lists that we saw earlier. So uh, we really can offer emission-free and reliable electricity 
in, in Finland, so that's why it has been really a, a good success story. And my final slide is only about the Fingrid being in Finland, so I thank you. Very, very nice presentation uh, from Finland and uh, complemented a little bit the other presentations. Yes. So Thank we'll you. come back to that. I just wonder a little bit about bioenergy. What's the status of bioenergy and uh, electricity? But that may be. Yeah, bi bioenergy. You, you, there's a lot of bioenergy in, in Finland, especially on the wood industry, because they, they generate a lot of their own electricity. So that is uh, something that they are, they are developing. Uh, but they are also uh, thinking about new kinds of uh, product products, so that it, it would not be like burning stuff. It's it's the it's it's not burning wood. It's burning uh, some other byproducts that sort of are generated in in making these uh, wood wood uh, industry products. So, so that's not uh, it's not uh, so much growing, but it's still yeah pretty steady there. It's, You're it's, correct. It's, maybe it's the electric. This is a renewable directive. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank I think you. We, uh, we continue and come back to, to questions in the panel. Uh, next speaker, uh, Rena Tamista. Challenges for project developer, board member, Utilitas. I think you have to explain uh, what Utilitas is also. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, it's, it's one of the best conferences uh, to be held in... in uh, uh, the Baltic states and, uh, and that actually it has a very good and uh, long tradition here in, in Estonia. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful for the organizers uh, uh, for, for also inviting me here. So a few words about Utilitas. Uh, utilities, uh, utilities is an energy company in, uh, based in Estonia, uh, Latvia and Lithuania. But uh, our legacy business is primarily in, in uh, Estonia. So uh, we've been created as a, a district heating company, but we run also uh, uh, CHP plants uh, and, uh, and then are about to actually uh, uh, own uh, two more CHP plants in, uh, in Estonia. Uh, we have a very strong focus on uh, carbon neutrality and uh, by 2030 we hope to realize uh, our investment program to bring us to uh, carbon neutral uh, energy uh, production. Uh, now, um, on top of the CSP plants, uh, we operate today uh, um, three wind parks, uh, two in Latvia, uh, one uh, in Estonia which we just recently completed uh, and we are just about to complete a small uh, wind park in northeastern uh, part of uh, Estonia. And uh, as such, actually, uh, we are currently the second biggest um, uh, wind uh, energy producer in the Baltic states uh, uh, and uh, largest if you uh, take it from the point of view of independent uh, power producers. So we actually have a, a variety of uh, uh, generating assets uh, which enables us to uh, offer uh, various uh, products uh, to the markets, uh, uh, be it uh, base load, uh, we have uh, on top of the um, generating assets uh, storage, heat storage uh, and, uh, and district heating network in itself is actually large uh, storage. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm very thankful for Christine uh, for making an uh, in-depth uh, overview of what's happening uh, in the electricity market reform. So I'm not going to go into that much detail and uh, focus more on um, uh, the produ producers or for, for, from developers' point of view uh, what's happening in this regard. Um, so, as uh, already mentioned uh, by previous speakers, uh, uh, the fundamentals uh, uh, due to the uh, market designs are not about to change. So, the focus uh, still remains on, uh, on uh, the current uh, market uh, structure. Um, but uh, I think it wouldn't hurt to remind that uh, uh, current market st structure uh, or market design is not meant uh, to uh, 
bring new investments uh, uh, into the market. So it, it is meant to, for the existing producers to, to compete um, and offer uh, an uh, uh, effective uh, solution uh, uh, to clear the prices. Uh, so there's uh, shortcomings in terms of uh, uh, attracting uh, new investments uh, to the market and um, uh, still, uh, even after uh, the reform, uh, the focus uh, remains on uh, national measures. Um, uh, another slide uh, uh, brings us uh, uh, more uh, towards uh, the existing uh, deficiencies of, of the market. Uh, here, what we see is the um, uh, capture price of uh, wind energy, onshore wind uh, energy producers. Uh, and uh, we see that um, with the addition of uh, uh, new capacities to the market, uh, uh, the capture price uh, of the uh, wind uh, producers uh, is uh, um, beginning, beginning to fall. Uh, we are comparing here uh, Estonian and uh, uh, Finnish uh, onshore um, capture prices uh, and, and we see that uh, the more capacity Finland uh, is adding, uh, the lower the prices actually uh, that uh, the producers receive uh, are. And um, this is, uh, the information is, uh, is gathered from uh, EU tra transparency platform, so uh, you all are welcome to, uh, to delve into these uh, statistics and, and uh, understand better what's happening uh, on the market. Uh, but the, the capture price uh, is, is not the uh, uh, only part of the story. Um, balancing uh, power costs uh, have increased rapidly, several folds in uh, recent uh, times. And on top of that, uh, OPEX prices have increased. So all in all, uh, the actual uh, uh, price or actual money that uh, the producers uh, will receive have uh, reduced uh, quite considerably. And uh, uh, this actually means that the financing of uh, uh, new capacity becomes more and more uh, uh, difficult, the more uh, new uh, inframarginal uh, variable producers uh, are on the market. Uh, another part of the story is uh, the cost of capital. Uh, why I'm discussing this here is that uh, it is uh, effectively having a, a large or serious impact uh, on uh, the availability or the possibility of the uh, developers to finance their projects. Uh, so in this graph we see differences in the capital uh, price uh, or bond deals uh, between uh, Estonia and Finland. And uh, this uh, difference actually shouldn't be there, but in practice uh, it is. And uh, this actually translates into uh, uh, the cost of uh, capital of, uh, of not only uh, uh, project developers, but uh, uh, to any projects uh, that are being developed uh, here in, in Estonia. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, as uh, wind uh, energy uh, projects are very capital intensive, then uh, the levelized cost uh, of electricity is a function of uh, the capital cost. And the higher the cost, uh, the more uh, difficult it is actually uh, to, to finance uh, the projects uh, as well. There are, of course, various measures uh, to even out these differences, uh, but uh, the fun fundamental problem is uh, still uh, there. Now, uh, regarding uh, the potential for the uh, PPA offtaking uh, uh, politics uh, versus uh, Nordic countries. Um, so, uh, Utilitas Wind, uh, as a project developer in, uh, in the Baltic states, is uh, somewhat uh, in a different uh, position uh, than uh, developers in, uh, in the Nordic uh, countries. As, um, uh, there is uh, very limited off-taking uh, potential in the Baltics. Uh, and uh, if we see the uh, per capita industrial uh, electricity consumption, 
then there are uh, um, quite a big differences uh, between uh, Nordic and, and uh, Baltic countries. And this, of course, uh, limits the off-taking potential uh, for uh, potential uh, new uh, projects. And uh, that's the reason why uh, perhaps we haven't seen uh, such um, great take-up of uh, uh, onshore wind uh, nor offshore wind uh, in uh, uh, the Baltic states. Um, there is also very limited interest uh, from uh, large uh, European traders, utilities, uh, corporates uh, in the Baltic market. Or if there is some interest, uh, then uh, it comes with a very high uh, discount, uh, which puts uh, project developers in a rather uh, difficult situation in, in the Baltic states. Uh, on top of that, uh, uh, Cross-border uh, PPA structures uh, are still uh, uh, rare. Uh, financing institutions uh, are not uh, yet accustomed to these uh, uh, structures and, uh, um, and a very high risk is attributed to such uh, structures. And thus, uh, this uh, also reflects in the cost of uh, and uh, and also leverage of, of the uh, financing part of the projects. Now, uh, how, uh, um, just to compare how different uh, countries in the region uh, see their uh, electricity consumption uh, developing, uh, we see that uh, there's a, a really uh, uh, strong view in the Nordic countries uh, in um, the electrification uh, and uh, and uh, the increase uh, from the uh, industrial uh, uh, consumption, uh, whereas uh, in uh, Estonia, but I think in general uh, in the Baltic states, uh, uh, this view uh, by the TSOs uh, is still not uh, being shared. Uh, so uh, quite limited uh, increase in the consumption is uh, foreseen. Uh, this means in turn, of course, that uh, uh, the limitations in terms of um, uh, of taking uh, uh, will persist and here are some recent news about uh, the um, investments uh, uh, or interest in, in potential investments uh, in, in uh, the Nordic countries but at the same same time we also know that um, some of the companies uh, uh, looking to invest into uh, hydrogen uh, green steel or, or, or other in industrial uh, use cases of, um, of renewable electricity. Uh, they are themselves actually start startups and, and are raising uh, capital to make these uh, investments. And, and some of the projects uh, could, uh, could realize, some, some others uh, actually don't, as we see from recent um, uh, announcements uh, from uh, Plug Power in regard to the difficulties they are facing today. So this brings to uh, my concluding uh, remarks uh, from the uh, developers or producers uh, uh, point of view, um, uh, at least we clearly prefer market-based uh, solutions. This would be our um, priority and preference if uh, uh, there would be <laughs> such solutions uh, available. Um, uh, at the beginning of the uh, market design discussions, uh, there were some, uh, some interested, interesting uh, thoughts about uh, how to structure the market. Uh, for instance, uh, some of the ideas that were floated by the Commission uh, were around uh, TOTEX, uh, so total expenditure uh, rather than uh, uh, focusing on, uh, on uh, OPEX. Uh, so, uh, so to have element of uh, capital uh, investments also in, in uh, price uh, reflected. But this didn't materialize. Uh, uh, some of the uh, ideas actually are uh, ta being taken up in, in some form, uh, such as um, more structured uh, PPA products, uh, uh, some uh, PPA market platforms, uh, which I strongly endorse, uh, 
and, and especially from, uh, from the Baltic uh, uh, point of view, I think uh, that would be a very uh, good uh, step in, in, in the right uh, direction uh, because uh, this would uh, then uh, bring some liquidity into the PPA market uh, in, in the Baltic uh, states, but uh, uh, still would not uh, ch change the fundamentals, which is the limitations in terms of uh, off-taking potential. Um, in the absence of uh, market-based uh, solutions, uh, uh, CFDs uh, have proven to be effective means uh, to, to alleviate the project uh, risks, uh, so um, that could be uh, a way forward, um, and especially in the case of uh, larger projects uh, such as uh, offshore wind parks, uh, which uh, need regulatory certainty from uh, one hand, uh, but, but uh, risk mitigation in terms of uh, financing is, is definitely an uh, asset. And uh, the, the practice actually proves that uh, investments into the offshore uh, parks have happened uh, where these uh, uh, points have been taken into account, so risks have been mitigated sufficiently. And uh, the combination of the two PPAs, uh, CFTs, um, could be one uh, way forward. And um, I'm, I'm pleased to see that um, that's uh, parts of uh, uh, current on ongoing discussion by the Parliament and the Council. With that, I would like to conclude. And I'm looking forward to your questions uh, during our panel. Thank you. I think we are trying to catch up. Uh, Time-wise, but I, th I think as I spoke to Madis, we can continue until 13:15. Uh, but it's a lunch in, in the other end, so it's a motivation to, to speed up. Now I see uh, next speaker, Litauras Varansha. This is difficult. De la Varanavicius. Yes, hello. It was correct. Hello. Correct. Yes. Uh, hi again. Uh, I'm not the first time here. Uh, thanks for inviting. Usually I'm a speaker on Baltic state synchronization. You know this project, we want to desynchronize from Russia, Belarus. So usually I'm giving a briefing update on this, but uh, let me assure you it's happening in one year. We are getting ready. So if you have any questions on synchronization, let's get back during the lunch. But today, maybe I'm the only one to talk about the crazy figure 2050. Uh, usually presentations are given about 20, 30, 35. But, uh, and uh, unfortunately today I'm the one who gives you more food for thought and questions, not the answers, because 2050 it's a brave topic to take on. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I want to tackle something uh, very important. Uh, uh, for example, if renewables are going to really continue to develop as we expect, right? You have a lot of figures behind me. On the left side, you have uh, factual statistics in green color on how we uh, manage to uh, generate electricity from uh, both uh, solar and wind. And uh, on blue columns, you see the uh, projections for 2030. So, uh, Marit, greetings to you. I tend to disagree that Baltic states in 2027 will be still in deficit, but uh, let's see, let's see. This is the first of uh, uh, interesting topics, you know, how neighbors see each other. Will it be really uh, off-take or will it will be also in surplus, you know? Because if for Finland, we Baltic are in surplus, and uh, you told that there is not much of off-take and if generation increase, it means we will be most probably a transit country for uh, surplus to flow through us to Poland, Germany and other countries. So, but uh, we have huge plans and I'm talking today about our national plans because recently energy ministry uh, de developed a study which will be uh, most probably approved by Europe uh, uh, Lithuanian parliament as na new national strategy. Yes, so for me as Lithuanian it's very important. Why? Because, you know, uh, with benefits towards transition of renewable transition also comes the costs. 
And uh, as a citizen, I'm also worried if it's uh, really uh, properly weighted to, to take this path on, right? Towards this huge transition I'm going to talk about. So you, you see on the right side also that we decrease, as Finland did, uh, we also cut the imports from Russia, but we still import from Sweden, from sometimes uh, continental Europe, from Finland nowadays, uh, through Estonia, Latvia. So we decrease the import, we uh, increase production from renewables. So it leads us to something uh, truly promising in the future, and that is major growth for generation up to five to ten times uh, depends on what you count on energy or uh, installed generation capacities but uh, let's take a close look at this uh, this is something which amazes me as well should amaze you this is lithuania only right so you have installed generation capacity here in the left corner now it's only 3.7 gigawatts and we have expected installed generation of 27 gigawatts by 2050 it's a crazy figure for small countries Lithuania, and even with all cross borders we have, it should be impossible to export the overcapacities, which leads us to thinking maybe consumption will follow, right? Uh, you never know, but we just had a very interesting presentation, I would say, from Utilitas about uh, Baltic states being capable of growing its off-taking uh, power, right? So, uh, talking energy, also you can see it's huge amounts of um, uh, energy, even more uh, we talk to, to what we have today. In 2022, we produce four, we consume 13. So, um, uh, yeah, and look at the structure as well. I think it's important. Uh, uh, what, uh, again, Marit mentioned, uh, it's uh, some sort of at least regional observation, I, I would tend to say that uh, there is a, a column saying installed capacity, very small, dark gray here, uh, stable generation, stable generation on top of uh, onshore, offshore, wind and sun uh, is uh, so-called uh, small uh, nuclear reactors uh, foreseen for Lithuania as well, which uh, if you took, uh, take a look at the dark gray color there, uh, is uh, quite a big piece of uh, uh, energy produced, right? It's small amount installed, but uh, from capacity factors, you understand that it's a major part of, uh, I would call it, base load in the future, right? Right, so big changes are coming up, and uh, it's not uh, only that I am trying to say to you today. There are interdependencies which I would like to somehow clearly for you to highlight, especially talking about hydrogen as future offtake and f uh, flexible offtake. You see, I see a interdependency in this picture. You clearly understand that the rest generation is dependent on demand, and demand is dependent on rest generation and in the middle are the prices, right? I'm coming from a country where demand is not growing. Scandinavian countries have a totally different picture where demand is growing more rapidly, I would say, than the network development and generation. But in both cases, both uh, demand and generation are intertwined, and in between is the energy prices, which should, uh, which should suit everybody. If it doesn't, the growth uh, doesn't continue. That's my point here. And uh, let me give you an example. You know that, for example, uh, renewables onshore expect uh, at least a uh, capture price I was talking about to be, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 euros per megawatt hour for them to continue investing and grow, right? But electrolysis and consumers and demand expect 15 euros per megawatt hour for them to come into the market and start capturing this price. So there is a paradox of two different interests. One uh, uh, generators expected, expecting uh, all, uh, either PPAs or subsidies in CFD form and high price. Uh, uh, others are expecting a low price. So it's not an easy answer for this. I don't see the solution without state intervention yet. I personally don't believe this. Somebody said, you raised this uh, clear question, does the state interventions and subsidies uh, raise in the future? I think that was your message as well. So I believe it might. And take a look at the final result of a vision for Lithuania for 2050. 
I remind you, the green color is the future generation on the left, green and consumption in blue on the right. I remind you, Lithuania currently uh, consumes only 13 terawatt hours. So it's a huge, huge change for us. And um, let's talk about this. This is, I think, my uh, main slide. I have a few more after this. But you, I, I, I ask you to think about, uh, because this uh, picture I saw last week in Denmark as well, where, um, uh, OK, a lot of generation grows offshore, onshore. But also, let's take a look at the demand structure. And uh, I, I'm sorry, I walk away just for a purpose of indicating you visually the column I want to talk about. total consumption, half of the total consumption, I saw the same in uh, Denmark, in, in uh, EnergyNet. Everybody talks this way now, and you know what is that? It's clearly defined, power to gas, it's hydrogen. So, but half of demand is hydrogen. Okay, the Danish are expecting to export this, uh, Lithuanians expect maybe to consume in-house. By, by, but get, let's get back to the thinking how this can happen at all, if hydrogen expects 15 euros of capture price for them to be in the market, and generators expect, I don't know, 60, 70, 80, or even 100 euros for them to start uh, investing in generation. So I see contradiction in this picture. I don't see this, uh, I'm sorry to say, I, I, I'm not the owner of this, uh, it's energy minister in Lithuania, but I'm not criticizing, I'm just raising a questions, also including this, uh, we're going to debate today about does the new market design fits this picture as well, how, for example, PPAs for electrolysis will help or ruin the vision if electrolysis won't uh, consume on flexible terms capturing cheap price, but will enter the PPA market and will not be flexible anymore, the deficit times when there will be no sun and wind, we will increase the import prices for, for the whole country. So I think, for example, electrolysis should be uh, forbidden to enter PPAs as a consumer. That's my opinion. So. I'm giving you the questions today, as I've said to you, a lot of generation is this, but who is first? Who should be making the first step in this picture? Should the demand come first and, you know, industry come in and say, oh, we lack generation, but let's step into Lithuania, let's invest into new factory, let's be a big off taker of 500 megawatts. However, now it's expensive, but we expect new uh, generators to come into market to invest and to reduce the price. It's a bit naive, I think, no, uh, to expect uh, this uh, consumption to grow on these terms. But uh, generators think the same way. They think we already start to demolish the price. Uh, we saw the graph of uh, Finland, uh, how oversupply suddenly started to decrease the prices in Finland. The same happens in Lithuania. If we do nothing about this, renewable investments will stop very soon, I think. Uh, uh, so do I ask for intervention of states? Maybe. Uh, because now the interest still contradicts the generators and the consumers does not meet where we need to. If CFDs and PPAs have a perfect uh, uh, tool in the future, maybe, but uh, let's discuss later. So my two final slides and I'm gone to the panel. Uh, it's not for me to criticize. I'm an observer of uh, the big change in Europe and uh, also we have a duty as transmission system operators to be enablers of this change, right? So uh, to enable the uh, generators uh, giving electricity, providing it to the demand is by providing necessary infrastructure. So it's, uh, it means that it, sometimes we don't have national, local uh, demand growth. Maybe we can export it through cables towards bigger off-takers. For example, Baltics can become not off-takers, but uh, transit towards off-takers, such as Germany or Poland. So infrastructure is very important. So. That's my last, last slide. According to this transmission study, we will need a lot of investments into uh, transmission grids. We will uh, do, that's our job. 
will ensure that uh, both uh, offshore and onshore infrastructure is on time and in place. So, uh, sorry, uh, but maybe it's a good theme for a discussion during the panel. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Then I think we will reshuffle a little bit uh, with some chairs uh, on the on the stage quickly, and uh, maybe just two minutes break. Microphones. Yeah, you have to catch the panelists. They have to they have to take some uh, earphones, I think, or microphones. Hmm. Yeah, actually. Maybe that's quicker. Yeah, it's like a TV. Uh. Hmm? What's that? <laughs> Don't fall. Yeah, we can just we can just uh, share the microphones, maybe, or if, if the panel has one microphone, this one. Yeah, okay, this this uh, discussion went in many directions, so it's not so my all my pre-written questions. Uh, they are maybe not so relevant, uh, but uh, there has been a lot uh, of speaking about these uh, CFDs, contracts with difference, and PPAs, and it. Now in French they speak about the baguette magic or magic uh, stick or something. Uh, what 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 do you think uh, these uh, two instruments they should have been? Maybe it's a little bit strange to see those in a regulation, or or do you agree on on including those in a regulation from the EU? Maybe do you, anybody wants to comment on that? Probably I have a microphone and uh, yeah <laughs> yeah in in, in fact uh, I. From a regulator's uh, point of view, I think those two instruments, they, are, they must somehow reflect market trends. And of course, CFD, to my understanding, it, it might be a bit better because uh, if, if it's set correctly, if it reflects what is the market, uh, then this instrument would be less market distortive than uh, PPA, who takes out of market some amount of, uh, of, uh, of energy and uh, of course I think there's a different experience from country to country and uh, we have seen already in Latvia also 10-year uh, contracts and uh, is it good or not? I think the main problem could be uh, what are conditions for long-term contracts. Uh, the price might be still okay but whether there are some uh, restrictions for this price taker, for the one who, who, who consumer, whether uh, they, are, they can still uh, like change some conditions or install renewables or uh, whether there are some limitations. But uh, yeah, otherwise I think they must reflect market conditions to some extent. Any other views on this? Yes, actually, I uh, reflected my views already during my presentation that uh, I would have preferred that uh, there would have been more structured approach towards uh, PPA markets. Uh, so uh, today they are uh, they are bilateral. There is uh, no transparency that much uh, about the PPA markets, um, and and that's why we. Or I would have wanted the uh, PPA market to evolve into more structured uh, market, uh, into uh, uh, products uh, which are tradable, uh, and uh, and also I would have uh, gladly seen uh, the development of the market itself. Uh, so uh, at the moment, as as already I also uh, reflected, uh, there's. Uh, uh, high uh, risk uh, premium uh, priced on uh, cross border uh, structures and uh, that's that's definitely uh, a shortcoming uh, especially if uh, you look it from uh, from the market which is uh, uh, still uh, not very well connected uh, uh, is is uh, in peripheria so uh, so definitely there's uh, there's some uh, room uh, for improvement um, 
in terms of, of uh, CFTs, we'll see finally what the compromise uh, will be, uh, whether uh, or to what extent uh, they are um, uh, voluntary, uh, uh, and uh, and we see what effect it uh, finally will play. Uh, but at the moment, uh, uh, they are uh, voluntary and and uh, it, uh, it, determined by the national decisions uh, whether to apply them or not. Uh, so uh, from the developer's point of view, if there is no uh, uh, clear understanding uh, what are the measures uh, to stimulate investments, it is very hard to actually plan uh, your, your uh, project pipeline. We continue? Yeah, or should we take another question? Or is no, no, I can continue. Can, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, Lefenia, on, this. On, on January 15th, I think uh, Lefenia will announce a double sided CFD offshore uh, auction. So, that's in one month. Uh, and I think CFD is uh, not equal one to each other. It depends on the terms, on what it was announced. You know, if a spread is uh, too low, maybe it's not a uh, strike price is not uh, re um, um, approved by regulator, is not attractive to the investor. Maybe it won't even help in this case. But uh, in general, yeah, I do believe CFD is necessary in, in the future as an instrument. and. Uh, uh, the only doubt I have, you know, uh, if, if, if it's enough uh, for, to stimulate not only the production side, but also if the load will follow, if, if, if uh, oversupply will uh, lead to the, to, the, to the increase of demand. I, I'm not so certain. And then it could be uh, bad news, you know, state pays a lot to the investors, uh, they are safe, but uh, state loses. So. I'm not so sure uh, of a bright future. Yeah, but we should do something about this. Let's continue with the same uh, same issue. Yeah, I kind of um, agree with with you. You are on the PPAs that they should be like more transparent and and uh, market based. That's sort of the market based uh, solution uh, for for CFDs. Um, our, our concern has been that that the CFDs do not eat up the the. Uh, products uh, pro produ production from the spot and, and other short-term markets. So uh, it is very important how they are planned, so that uh, they they accelerate flexibility. They also introduce an um, incentive to bid on the spot market and also react on the price. So that's that's uh, has been a concern for CFDs uh, from from Fringit point of view. So uh, flexibility and, and responding to to the actual market price. That's, that's very important in the planning of, of the CFD. Christine. Thank you. <clears throat> Many good uh, perspectives there. I, I think it's important to also keep in mind that uh, provisions in EU regulation on PPAs and CFDs or support schemes, it's not a new thing because the Renewables Directive already has provisions both for support schemes and also on the promotion of PPAs. So this is kind of, it's, it's not really new. Um, and it makes sense, uh, in my view, to, to have provisions on it. When it comes to PPAs, uh, we have good experience with those agreements in, in Norway. And one of the main benefits is that you can actually tailor, make them, so they can be very kind of um, designed to meet a consumer's demand. You can have, you can decide on the on the profile, and the benefit of Taylor making these agreements is what makes it difficult to, to trade them because they will not meet the demand for the next consumers. So that's uh, one thing that we have to keep in mind if we want to make this, uh, these uh, agreements more tradable, you, you risk also kind of losing the benefits. And that's why we also have been very concerned about the financial market and all this, because you already have uh, a market for hedging with standardized products that can easily be traded and that it's very flexible. So, so we should also think uh, whether the financial market could have a, a key role and, and on the potential for longer maturities in that market. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mean, this, this uh, electricity market design proposal came a little bit in the wake of the energy crisis. And, and then we have seen that the, the uh, experiences and market reactions to the crisis has probably shown that the, the market was not in such a bad shape, uh, as, as was uh, said at once. To which degree has the market responses been a contributor to the way out of the crisis? Let's say that you are a way out, of, I hope, but uh, do you have any comment to that? Can, uh, since I have a mic, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I can yeah, yeah, start. Yeah, mic. <laughs> uh, well, I think well, uh, the main function of the market is obviously to to ensure that 
the system clears at all times that supply and, and demand actually meet and and the market worked in that way and we also saw particularly in Norway and probably many other places as well that the demand actually responded to the high prices we saw a significant decrease in consumption so that is a market response uh, in some way and and whether it was kind of fit for purpose or I think that the market worked exactly the way we thought it would work uh, but of course, with a big uh, structural imbalance, uh, you got high prices. And um, building new production takes time because it requires permits, so it's no kind of quick fix on such a problem. Mm -hmm. But at least, as seen from a Norwegian perspective, there are many project developers who are eager to develop projects. So, so I, think, I think it's still kind of fit for purpose. Yeah, Shall I just, yeah, just pass it on. <laughs> Yeah, kind of the same same position from from Finland. We we saw a, a huge uh, impact on on demand side for the high prices. So in that side, uh, electricity market really really worked uh, as it as it was sort of expected to, to uh, work. Uh, then again, of course, uh, taking about this affordable side uh, for for households and, and small industry, um, that there there really needed to be some kind of a support, and and that was also. For, uh, done in, you know, I think in each country somehow. Mm. I'm not sure about all the countries, but qu quite a large number of countries anyway supported the, the local households and, and small industry. But but uh, then again, I, I really, really saw that the market uh, responded and, and when the sort of initial shock was, was down, the market prices came down as we expected them to come. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know even uh, sh should I start? okay let me start uh, may maybe another aspect of what is m if, if market delivered I think market reacted well with investments as well investments into new generation both solar and wind as well as in Lithuanian case which is was uh, pre pretty surprising for us to uh, flexibility means to uh, new batteries on market terms only so that's that's maybe um, this shook uh, shock a bit uh, uh, at the end, uh, worked well. <laughs> Let's hope for that. <clears throat> yes, uh, in terms of short-term markets, I think uh, markets uh, reacted as, as expected. Uh, but I wanted to comment on the financial uh, side of the market. Uh, we saw that uh, there was a literally a collapse uh, in the market. So the governments had to step in to provide uh, liquidity. Uh, because uh, the collateral calls uh, were so high that uh, there uh, there was uh, practically in insolvency by the large players on the market. So definitely there's a deficiency there in, in this market and, and, and it's not functioning in a way um, in order to uh, have a sufficient amount of, uh, of uh, uh, risk awareness and, and liquidity in order to attract investments. Uh, true that uh, uh, new investments uh, started uh, to flow in into new generation capacities, but at the same time what we see is that uh, there's a significant increase in the capex side uh, of the new projects uh, due to the uh, increase in the interest rates, uh, inflation, uh, supply chains, uh, and this has now proven to become a major obstacle uh, for financing the new investments, especially in the light of uh, uh, power prices uh, coming uh, uh, back uh, down to the, where they used to be prior to the uh, war. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as it was told, it is not a revolution, but evolution. And I think there are some spaces to be improved. As we have seen last year for 100 euros per megawatt in Baltics, I think recently it was minus 500 in, in Finland. Yeah. I, I think well, there's volatility, high volatility where there's some deficiencies which, which must be improved, but in general I think market recovered based on supply and demand. And one aspect which I would like to mention is really consumers, which, which must be more uh, active in the market. Uh, uh, at least in Latvia, some consumers, or quite a lot of consumers, they still have fixed agreements which were based on high price, on high wholesale price, and, and we need to educate them to, to see what the, the price is and, and whether they are interruptible or inter uninterruptible. And I think this is also uh, 
important aspect which drives this market model. Thank you. I think this is this for the Norwegian tapping the wrong uh, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. <laughs> okay, should we uh, take uh, we have the audience uh, take questions from uh, from the audience? Who would like to put forward questions now? Uh, suffering from starvation maybe? Uh, so. <laughs> I think you had so good questions. <laughs> <laughs> So, but I have just, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, I see, yeah, Rasmus Tengvad, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting discussion. I'm, I'm curious to, um, to see where you are on these new requirements on uh, offering fixed priced contracts and how it works for the, the, the pricing in the markets, because um, you all talk about, and you also, and we also have seen that in Denmark, uh, that 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 the market works. Uh, when the prices rises, the demand falls, which is how we said it should be working. Now we sense that the politicians are a bit shaky because at at times the price has been very high, um, and they want to interfere in the markets in order to create products that can equalize or equal out these uh, these spikes but but what effects is it happening on the consumption and and what is your what do you think it, it will have an impact on the on the market and stability because somewhere in the in the the, the balance has to be found between demand and uh, consumption and if you move that from those to taking the fixed prices it has to be bad by someone else you would like to I can take yeah, no, no, no. take yeah. uh, very good question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we saw during the crisis uh, uh, many interventions, uh, somewhat uh, uncoordinated, uh, later on coordinated by the European Commission. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, there was a pressure from the consumer side, uh, from the from the electorate side, uh, on the uh, politicians to do something. Uh, I very much like the Estonian and the Latvian government's uh, approach towards uh, price caps, uh, targeting uh, uh, inframarginals uh, to uh, to um, uh, target the, or to uh, deliver the excess profit uh, into new investments. Uh, so, so I think that was uh, quite uh, sensible. Uh, and, and during the market design uh, discussions, uh, we clearly have seen uh, uh, the, the willingness uh, to, to uh, impose more price caps uh, in the future, to, to re remove the obstacles uh, for, for these decisions. Uh, but uh, at the moment, at least, it seems that uh, uh, that uh, discussion is, is uh, more towards uh, more uh, coordinated approach, which, which is, I think, definitely uh, definitely welcomed because uh, otherwise it would uh, really destroy the uh, off-taking uh, PPA market uh, as you don't have the certainty in terms of, uh, of uh, whether you actually are able to, uh, uh, to fulfill your contracts uh, in, in the future. Thank you. Yeah, I think there are two aspects in short term and in longer term. And of course, this will bring in some more price certainty, not price uh, won't be so vol volatile based. Uh, of course, whether this is be uh, like higher or lower, it depends how those contracts are set. Uh, at this stage, if they are voluntary basis, it might be some kind of uh, changes from country to country, which might bring in some unexpected uh, conditions. For smaller countries, if a bigger country have a different type of uh, approach, and as we're told, if we are even transition country or everybody wants to export by 2027 or 2030, uh, developing capacities, uh, and uh, but I, I think in a, at the end of the day, there should be a, if, a, if it's set right, well, less volatile price with the forward markets. And then possibly those contracts could be also some impact from financial markets. Then I think it is the right approach to go. Uh, thank you for the question. 
Uh, I think um, well, with the clean energy package, uh, the right to dynamic pricing was introduced and it was kind of um, a general wish that most consumers should be exposed to short-term variation to, to make them more flexible. Uh, what we've learned with this crisis, I think, is that uh, consumers must be able to kind of choose uh, the exposure to this variation. So the fact that now um, the right to have a fixed price, fixed term agreement is introduced is, is in my view, it, it's a good thing because consumers will have greater choice of variation. Um, and our take on it has been that the most important thing is that you have a good offer in the retail market so that consumers actually can choose. Um, and that being said, of course, if, if all households were to choose a fixed price agreements, that would of course be a challenge. But uh, the fact that you have more variation, in my view, will mean that for somebody this is a possibility to be flexible and to, to make adjustment in their consumption. But some consumers are not uh, perhaps interested in that and they should be able to, to have more predictable uh, prices. So we need both and I think there's also kind of room in the system to have, to have both. And I think for really large uh, consumers, you can have fixed price, fixed term agreements that still make them kind of, or that still give them incentives to react on spot prices. Um, and in Norway, we have had fixed price agreements for households so that you can use an unlimited amount uh, at a given price, but those agreements will probably not be offered. And I don't think uh, the EU reg regulation will specify, it's not those type of agreements either. It's kind of a fixed price, fixed volume. So uh, at least that's my understanding. So I think also for households, it will be possible to, to make agreement that makes the power prices more predictable, but still kind of make them a bit exposed to the short term variation. Okay, so we, are now, we have, now, uh, have now arrived at the, uh, the session on uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency. Topical session. Uh, I think everything is topical, but this is a topical session. Energy efficiency and renewable energy. And uh, on European level and by the EU and the European Green Deal, the ambition has increased uh, uh, in the policy areas of energy efficiency and renewable energy. Uh, we saw the directives on energy efficiency and renewable energy were updated and revised in the middle of the energy crisis. Uh, negotiators, I think uh, negotiators, they must have done a very good job uh, in 2022 and 2033 with a lot of acts related to the energy crisis in parallel to the uh, directives. Um, so the point here is in this session to get a better knowledge of what is new in these two main directives, as well as state-of-the-art assessment from IEA on what is realistic in the outlooks coming from, from the Paris-based organization. Uh, and um, I think that's, uh, that's it. And then we will have selected uh, country cases from Denmark, Estonia, and Finland as well in this uh, session. So I. I start, uh, let's start with uh, Hans, Hans Steen from the EU Commission on uh, what is new, uh, are they realistic, what investments are needed, that was the, the task, uh, Hans. Easy questions. <laughs> Very easy questions to solve. <laughs> so, thank you, Johan. Um, voilà, it's already up. Very good. Yeah, so um, this is a difficult slot just after lunch, so... Uh, Hope you uh, will all be able to uh, to uh, make it through. Um, yeah. Uh, so obviously, as I said uh, this this morning, the energy transition. There are really two really important, what I sometimes call the workhorses of the energy transition: improved energy efficiency and renewable energy. And I'm trying to explain to you. In this session, what's what's uh, what's new, and of course we have to start with energy efficiency first. So that's uh, that's what we will do. But maybe just a couple of, of slides just to kick us uh, off. So uh, because sometimes it's a bit hard to understand all these numbers that have developed a bit over time. Uh, uh, the renewables 
up here and the energy efficiency down there if we take energy efficiency first. Um, we had 32.5% uh, coming out of the last revision of the energy efficiency directive. Then we made a proposal under the Fit for 55, uh, which was between 36 and 39%. Then with Repower, we started to think about, you know, does it still make sense to have this old baseline uh, of 2007? Isn't it maybe smarter to update that? And that's what we then did. And therefore, we came out at the end, end of those uh, negotiations with a target of 11.7% compared to a 2020 um, baseline. When it comes to the renewables, uh, it's, not so, uh, it's not so complicated because there uh, we don't have a, a baseline since we simply talk about the share of renewables in the overall energy uh, mix, share of uh, final energy consumption. And pretty much the same story. Uh, we had 32% coming out of the last revision, the so-called Red 2. And we had the proposal for 40% then with Repower EU, we needed to uh, improve or increase the level of ambition, so we came up with 45, and as a result of long uh, uh, night negotiations between the co-legislators, the European uh, Parliament and the Council, we came out with 42.5%. So that's uh, essentially, so we say, the level of ambition that we have for these two uh, directives. And now the machine will make a change, which is a bit of a problem. Do I need to point? Ah, there you are. In fact, here you see it uh, in a slightly uh, oh, repower EU. That's very nice. Um, but, uh, well, here you see it on a, on a slightly uh, more readable uh, form, perhaps. So let's then uh, look first at the energy uh, efficient, the energy efficiency directive, the so-called EED. Um, so the, the thing you asked me to do was say what is really new here. So of course, what is new is that we have a, a higher level of ambition, a higher target. Also, I think very important is that this is now a binding target. This was not the case before; it was an indicative target. Now we have a, uh, a, a binding target. Of course, not at national level, a binding target at EU level, and then we have indicative national contributions. Uh, I'll come back to what that actually means. Then we have uh, some new elements related to the energy efficiency first principle, which is a, a principle which is already there, but for the first time we have actually included in the directive some more operational um, elements of how actually to deal with this principle. Uh, then we have strengthened energy saving obligations in end uh, use. We have uh, some more obligations on member states when it comes to the public sector, because that is, of course, what member states uh, control. And then we have a much uh, stronger focus on specifically uh, energy poverty. Now that it has become clear how energy efficiency and energy poverty are really two things that are very, very closely linked. Um, again, this is uh, just uh, showing a little bit the, in the, the overall level of ambition. Uh, and what does it mean that member states shall set indicative national targets? Well, it basically means that they have to use a formula which is now included in the directive, which includes all sorts of different elements, GDP per capita, energy efficiency potential, uh, other things as well, uh, and then come up with hopefully uh, something that then when you add 27 member states together, you end up magically at the uh, agreed EU level. Now, of course, we know this is not going to happen, and that's why we have this so-called ambition gap mechanism, a gap filler. That means that if it, it doesn't happen, and that is not unlikely, then there are ways uh, for this to be actually uh, happening without too much uh, problem. Let's turn to the energy efficiency first principle. I think I have 20 minutes for both the renewables and energy efficiency. You're, set, you're giving me a really hard task to cover uh, everything. Anyway, so I think we have to go relatively quickly. I think in any case, I think we'll come back to some of these things uh, later on. 
So, uh, as I said, it's not a new principle, it's already there, but what we have now, we have specified a little bit when is it that we need to apply this principle. This concerns now big investments, uh, both in uh, uh, different energy uh, supply projects, uh, infrastructure decisions, and we have specified what is the size of such in, in, uh, decisions, uh, how, how much are we actually talking about. So this is now uh, uh, detailed in the directive. We also have included now a monitoring mechanism and um, we have a, a mechanism to promote and apply cost beneficial methodologies for doing this. So hopefully, we know that this is not an easy principle to apply, I discussed that with Rasmus a little bit earlier. Hopefully with this, it becomes a little bit easier, but I mean, we're not, uh, you know, we're not uh, saying that it's, it's simple, it is not, but it is on the other hand, something that is really, really important to first look at energy efficiency, because it is, as we say, the first fuel. I mean, the best energy is the energy you don't use. And uh, it's according to all our analysis, as I also said this morning, if we do not tap into the entire potential for energy efficiency, we will not become uh, energy neutral in, or, or carbon neutral in 2050. This is very, very uh, clear uh, because we will simply not be able to generate and produce enough uh, green, uh, clean uh, energy uh, if we are using it in a wasteful way. We have uh, also the energy savings obligation. This uh, is again a continuation of what we had, but it's now, of course, strengthened to fit also the new ambitions. You will see the numbers uh, here. Again, we have a specific focus on a part of this energy savings obligation being uh, directed towards uh, vulnerable uh, customers. So basically, uh, again, a way of trying to address the important issue of uh, energy uh, poverty in this area. I also mentioned that the public sector, we have really strengthened, or what has been strengthened in the directive is what you see here. Uh, first of all, uh, an obligation on member states actually to save 1.9% of their energy consumption annually. Uh, an obligation to uh, renovate uh, buildings owned by public bodies. The new thing here is that in the old directive you had buildings that were sort of occupied by central government but now it's uh, uh, extended to cover all uh, public bodies so also uh, local and regional uh, authorities. And then also something that is uh, clearly strengthened is that we are now also having public procurement. You have an obligation as a public entity to procure the most energy efficient uh, transport means, uh, IT, uh, you're buying buildings, you have to buy buildings that have a good uh, energy performance and so on and so forth. So a lot of new obligations there, uh, basically aimed at uh, the public sector showing the way, because this is of course, uh, if, if that's not happening, there's no <coughs> way of expecting that the private sector will follow suit. Um, I think probably we do not have time to go into a lot of all this, but you know, since we are now uh, specifically looking at uh, the links between energy efficiency and energy poverty, we've tried to also operationalize that a little bit. We also have uh, uh, included ways of uh, using some of the new funding, you know, uh, the ETS, the Emission Trading uh, system has now been extended uh, to uh, buildings and transport, not immediately, but in the years to come. And uh, some of the revenues coming from the uh, ETS uh, clearly has then to go into uh, increasing energy efficiency for the energy poor. And the same with the SCF, the Social Climate Fund, which is a new fund that uh, Ursula von der Leyen has put a lot of effort into getting up and running and specifically linked to some of the um, social impacts of extending ETS to buildings and, and transport. And that, of course, then also has to be specifically targeted at uh, those who are energy poor. Uh, heating and cooling, we know that this is an absolutely key sector. 75% of uh, energy in this sector is still fossil fuel. 
uh, huge potential for being more uh, energy uh, efficient uh, there. Uh, we already have in the existing uh, aki, as we say, the legislation that has already been agreed, some elements of uh, heating and cooling. Um, now we are extending this to having local heating and cooling plans uh, in even quite small local entities, 45,000 inhabitants. I can't remember right now. I think it means something like 1,200 such plants will have to be drawn up throughout Europe, so this is quite comprehensive. Uh, and then we have some rather complicated rules about how we define what we call efficient district heating, and that has basically to do with the kind of uh, fuels that you use to um, produce the energy that goes into these district heating. It has to gradually become more based on renewables and waste heat. And I think maybe there's a slide on that, but even if there is, I'm not sure we will be able to look into it in the time that, uh, that we have. Um, financing is, of course, very important, and I think it was also in the title here, how are we going to finance all this? Uh, financing is uh, very, it's very clear that, you know, this has to be a very strong combination of public and private uh, financing. We have struggled for some time to get the private finance sector interested in energy efficiency. Uh, here now we have clear obligations on member states to facilitate and to promote energy efficiency lending projects, for example, uh, energy efficiency mortgages and green loans. We have uh, the Energy Efficiency Coalition, I can't remember it's the precise name of it, but it's the old EFIG that has now been transformed <coughs> into a, a coalition that will hopefully be uh, officially endorsed on Wednesday in the Energy Council. The ministers will sign up to this and this involves in all the entities, including a lot of uh, private entities that are uh, involved in this and they're actually doing some really, really uh, important work. Uh, overall, uh, we know that there is a willingness to invest in energy efficiency, but uh, it's not always the easiest thing to do. Uh, and that's why we think that there's a need for a little bit of regulatory framework and some obligations on member states to promote uh, all of this. And so those are some of the key elements of the new directive. There's, there are many more, and I've actually, before coming here, I printed out the entire directive with the risk of uh, exceeding the uh, limitations for how much uh, hand luggage you were allowed to take on board. It's quite a, a big thing. So uh, maybe best to read it uh, on screen. Um, it runs onto several pages. And the same is true for the, uh, the red, the red three, as it is now called. Um, this is a directive which I have a particular uh, interest in because I was uh, as head of unit for renewable energy for seven years, uh, from 2000 six to 13, and we negotiated the first renewable energy directive. Um, following very closely what's happening with the Renewable Energy Directive because it's such a key uh, piece of legislation in order to uh, make sure that we uh, make the necessary progress on renewable energy uh, and also that the conditions for making this uh, progress are actually somehow enshrined in EU uh, legislation. So just like we had for the energy efficiency, these are the main elements. Of course, the targets, which we already looked at at the very beginning. Uh, and then here it's a little bit vaguer what we put, foster renewables across relevant sectors. I think there is really important to understand that we need to look uh, beyond electricity. I mean, obviously there's a lot of renewables coming into uh, electricity and we're seeing, we see a lot of progress. I mean, for example, uh, 2022 was really a record year for, for example, wind and solar, but renewables also have to make uh, really uh, progress in areas like heating and cooling, uh, also in industry and, and transport, and transport has been notoriously difficult, and that's why we have, and we'll see that in a second, um, also a number of things that are specifically targeting how can we get more renewables into 
uh, transport. Now, obviously, as transport is electrified and to the extent that this electricity is renewable electricity, there's a little bit coming there, but that's not uh, the whole story. Something which has been very clearly identified as a bottleneck is the permitting, and we have been struggling uh, with that from the Commission side. This is essentially a national competence, and we're, of course there's a limit to what we can do uh, from the EU side on that, except really very strong pleas, but we have now actually both in the new directive, uh, but also in some of the emergency regulation adopted last year, we have set now some very, um, shall we say, tough uh, deadlines for different types of projects, and I think actually they're on one of the next uh, slides, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, that has to, I mean, we're, we're talking about accelerating the energy transition, and that means getting these projects up and running uh, faster than what we have seen uh, so far. Um, well, I think those are really the, um, the, the key things here. In fact, there's a, when it says both for renewable energy projects, it should say both renewable energy projects and infrastructure projects linked to this renewables. That's important that that's, when we're talking permitting, it's the same thing. Uh, I think we can probably skip over this one as well. I think you make the slides available, so, so you can also have a look a little bit at this. But uh, this is essentially, as you see, the, the development. We had, for 2020, we had the famous 20% target that, uh, as I said, I was part of the first renewable energy directive. We're very happy that we actually exceeded that. And that, of course, hides um, different developments in different member states. Uh, quite some member states overshot the target by a considerable uh, amount of renewables. Others uh, just met their targets and a few didn't meet their target and had to then revert to the different mechanisms that are in the directive, statistical transfers and others. And then, uh, yeah, that's essentially, that's essentially it. Then you see here um, the, with the, the the first revision with the 32% that came out of the initial um, proposal from the, the Commission. Uh, we saw in the 2030 plans, those are those uh, that are there in the second grey or brown column, that that was actually met. But of course now that we have 42.5% coming out of the negotiations, those plans have to be revised uh, so that they, they meet uh, this, um, this, this target. Um, if we are looking then at the sectoral targets, uh, there are quite a few of them, and this is something for which we are sometimes criticised, uh, saying is it really necessary to set all these complicated targets which basically ties member states down into doing different things in different areas to meet these targets. Now we, we think they are important because it shows uh, where member states need to make efforts and without <coughs> efforts across the board in, as I said, transport, cooling, buildings and industry, it's going to be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to meet uh, the target. So we have these uh, separate uh, targets uh, in there um, for, for these different uh, sectors. So two of them are completely new, buildings and industry, and the uh, the two top ones are uh, quite uh, more ambitious. They are actually we're talking a doubling compared to what we had uh, compared to what we had before. In transport, we are calculating now in slightly different ways because now we have uh, all transport sectors. In the old directives, it was only road and rail. Now it's also including maritime and aviation. Uh, where now, of course, there is also scope for uh, renewables, especially if it is re renewable uh, hydrogen. Um, and in fact, I think this is more or less what you also see uh, on this one. Uh, for transport, there's also like, currently there is the opportunity for member states to make a choice between whether you want to set a target for renewables, uh, specifically in transport, or whether you want to have a reduction of emission intensity, so uh, a, a CO2-based approach or a, a renewable energy-based uh, approach. Um, 
Voila. Uh, of course, we see still some possibilities for uh, biofuels in transport. Uh, we know, of course, all the difficulties that come with uh, biofuels. We only talk about advanced biofuels, so second or third generation biofuels, and not biofuels produced on the basis of food crops. Uh, and there will probably be some use of that, that uh, certainly up to 2030s. And then uh, in aviation and maritime, you have now uh, obligation under other parts of the Fit for 55 package that I showed this morning, the uh, uh, refuel maritime refuel aviation initiatives, where there are obligations for member states to blend uh, alternative fuels into uh, the, the fuels for those sectors. Uh, district heating and uh, cooling, so first of all we have the indicative target to increase by 22 percentage point every uh, year. Then we have uh, a, a completely realignment of renewables and uh, waste heat. And then uh, also obligations on electricity TSOs and DSOs to take into account potential flexibility services by district heating. I think really, really important also in terms of sector coupling, energy system integration, district heating, and in a country like Estonia that has quite a lot of district heating, I think it's something like 30%, this really offers some opportunities for flexibility services, uh, storage and so on and so forth. Um, as I said, it's a really important sector uh, because of the uh, amount of fossil fuels uh, used uh, here that essentially for climate reasons, but also with a view to phasing out uh, gas, uh, certainly Russian gas in the short term is really, uh, really important. If we look at buildings, uh, of course here there is, in the, we have three directives that are attacking buildings. We have the EED that attacks public buildings, and we have the renewable aspects of buildings, and we have a, a, a share of renewables in buildings. Uh, of 49% uh, uh, in buildings uh, by 2030, which is quite a lot. Uh, and then we have the energy performance of buildings directive that I also mentioned this morning that has now been provisionally agreed and now needs to be formally confirmed. All of this shows how important it is to move forward with the uh, transformation of the EU building sector. Um, what you see on this slide is essentially what is in the renewables uh, directive. And you will see also here we are talking about the, the public sector having to play a, a key role for getting renewables into uh, buildings that are owned uh, by the public sector. Voila. I think that's probably it. I am already <coughs> over time, so I need to go pretty fast. Industry is the um, same story. We have a a target for the indicative annual increase of 1.6% for industry. Again, I think um, clearly demonstrating that we see potential for renewables in, in industry uh, here. And then uh, also we want to promote uh, what we call RFNBOs, Renewable Fuels of Non-Biological Origin, which is a wonderful acronym which everybody is struggling with. Uh, but essentially what this is, this is uh, things like hydrogen, uh, ammonia and other things. Uh, here we want to make sure that when industry is moving forward uh, and using hydrogen, that they use the right kind of hydrogen. So the 42% is not the 42% of uh, the energy use of industry that has to be these things. It's 42% the, it's of the um, uh, hydrogen that they use should be renewable hydrogen. I mean, that's uh, maybe not crystal clear from this slide, but that's uh, important to understand. Going up to 60% in 2035, we know there's a huge appetite for, uh, uh, from industry. Uh, I had the pleasure of attending the first so-called Energy Transition Roundtable on hydrogen, both with uh, Ursula von der Leyen and Deputy, what's his name, uh, Executive Vice President uh, Shevkovic where we had the whole hydrogen sector involved and everybody is really, really keen on hydrogen. The main concern is, of course, that there is not a lot of uh, renewable hydrogen available on the market. So we need to make sure that there is a demand for this and essentially this is what this uh, Renewable Energy Directive uh, does. It creates certainty that we are 
that there will be, for the people who produce this stuff, there is a market for it because this is what we think should be uh, uh, the share of these things uh, in the market. Um, permitting, super uh, important, and as I said, dealt with in, in different places, both in the emergency regulation of last year, but also now in the Renewable Energy Directive, at this different levels. First of all, member states now have to uh, identify what we call uh, NECP areas, National Energy and Climate Plans areas. Um, that comes already 18 months, and then they have to identify the RAAs, Renewable Acceleration Areas, which is like a, a subset of what was identified in the NECPs. Uh, that comes a little bit later, 27 months after entry into force. Uh, and essentially what this means, uh, and we can see that on the next slide, is that you have then certain rules related to uh, permitting for projects that are located in these areas, which is faster, more expedient than uh, they would otherwise uh, be, all really with the idea of uh, making sure that these projects are not sitting as part of a project pipeline for long, as we have seen in many cases so far, that we think that there are uh, really overriding public interest in accelerating these projects in these areas. Uh, so hopefully this is a, an approach that will work. It seems member states are quite uh, keen on it and uh, we hope of course that they will designate uh, areas that uh, are sufficient in terms of hosting projects that are necessary to meet uh, the targets. Um, just one or two words on sustainability criteria. This is um, one part of the renewable energy legislation that has always attracted a lot of interest. Uh, in fact, what many people sometimes forget is that uh, more than half of the renewable energy we have in the EU is actually bioenergy based. And therefore we need to make sure that this is produced uh, in a sustainable manner. And what we have here is uh, the rules that we have currently and these are in the revised and there is actually um, so we say a strengthening of these criteria in particular as concerns solid biomass and I think I mean for many countries in the Baltic area but generally in the Nordics as well this is really really important that we make sure and I think we we see in many places that there is growing skepticism about the sustainability of the biomass and the uh, environmental impacts of this, that it's really important that we can clearly demonstrate that the biomass that we use is produced uh, in a sustainable way and that there are not negative impacts of it. Uh, something about joint uh, projects and offshore renewables. So we would like to see more uh, joint uh, projects, uh, including offshore. Uh, and that's why we have created now these obligations for member states to set a mandatory cooperation framework. Uh, we'll see how that, how that goes. Um, two projects per member state uh, by 2030, uh, another one by 2033. Uh, it's an, a new element, and since you asked specifically for new elements, uh, that this is a new element of the Renewables Directive, so we'll see how that goes. But we do think that there is a lot of merit in these joint projects uh, so they can become, so we say, that there are a, a bigger base behind uh, such projects. And then finally, this is just uh, formally the, the date, so they were, both directives were adopted this autumn. They were published in September and October. They have slightly different um, uh, transposition periods, uh, the renewables a little bit shorter. And some of the elements are even shorter, and of course, some of them are even, so we say, covered by the emergency regulations, which are regulations, so they apply uh, immediately. Um, I think that's what I wanted to say, and I'm aware that I went slightly over time, and I'm really sorry about that. But uh, these are two rather complex uh, pieces of legislation, so thank you very much for listening. Thank, thank you. you, Hans. Thank you.
I guess there are no uh, questions to all this, this the new science of sub-targets under the uh, Renewable Directive. <laughs> it's really uh, impressive, all these sub-targets. Uh, I just want I, I just want question uh, uh, on the the multiplier on, on on the transport. Is there a multiplier still on in the? It's still there. It's still there. Okay. They have increased it. I think. I know? think they have been changed a little bit, but the the idea of having multipliers is still there as an extra incentives for bringing renewables into areas where we know it is very difficult. So basically, uh, the multipliers mean that member states can count the actual amount of renewables, not by their actual amount, but by a factor of something 1.5 or two. I, I have the number somewhere I can okay. give them to you, but yeah. they're still there. We can have a check into it. Okay, then I think uh, if there are no other uh, uh, questions, I think we can move forward to, I think it's the IEA uh, online. I don't know if you have a contact with uh, is Ilka Hanula in the IEA. Yes, I'm here and I can hear you very well. Oh, you are there. Okay, good. So, I, good. so you are in, uh, here in Tallinn now and uh, we uh, would like to hear the IEA's views on energy efficiency and renewable energy. Yes, that, that uh, worked for me as well. Okay, good. Uh, the floor is yours. Huh? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to share some perspectives on, on this topic um, at your event. Um, my plan was very quickly uh, to start with the global forecast we have for renewables and then uh, introduce you to what we call in-depth reviews of that we have done several of the of our IA member countries in the Nordic Baltic region this year and then maybe a few takeaways of, from the content of those uh, review reports. Um, but uh, I would really like to start with the kind of a more of a global view on renewables which are experiencing a remarkable growth at the moment. So if we look at into the past, the historical growth on in, during these time intervals of of renewable capacity additions globally, we can see an in increasing trend uh, over the, these uh, time intervals. And then we come to our current forecast for the next five years, which looks like this. We now forecast that renewables will expand by 2,400 gigawatts during this five-year period by 2027, which is equal to the entire installed power capacity of China. So it'll take the amount of renewables that the world will add between 2022 and 2027 is equal to the size of renewables that world added during the last 20 years. So five years in the future, uh, 20 years in the past, same amount of renewables. So it says something about the momentum behind renewables in power generation at the moment. Uh, this will have uh, also an impact on, on the um, other uh, forms of generating electricity. So we now uh, forecast that uh, solar PV is, will become the largest installed capacity globally for electricity, surpassing coal by 2027 and surpassing natural gas capacity by 2026. And also looking at the, um, on the generation, not only capacity, renewable electricity generation when considered together will surpass generation from coal by early 2025. So really a, a massive uh, momentum in renewables globally uh, at this moment. And this is the main reason why we see that uh, a peak fossil fuel use will happen during this, uh, this decade globally, also in our baseline scenario. Most single biggest reason is uh, this massive growth of renewables that are pushing coal and gas out of the energy system. Um, so that's the global kind of um, short term outlook for renewables. I just uh, perhaps many of the viewers are already uh, familiar with the IA, what we call in depth reviews, uh, but these are uh, a regular. Um, reviews that the IEA carries out on the energy policies of the IEA member countries. And for the <coughs> Nordic Baltic region, 
Um, this year, uh, we have updated our review of Finland, Estonia and Denmark. And uh, next year, we will be doing an update for Latvia. So very up-to-date information available on these countries, uh, on their policy reviews. The aim of this process is to support the energy policy development and also to encourage uh, to exchange international best practices and experiences in energy policy. These, these reports are all freely, freely available and downloadable on our website. So I'm going to just very briefly <coughs> make some highlights uh, highlight slides on each of these um, recent um, uh, uh, in-depth reviews. Starting with Finland, uh, Finland is an example of the high level of uh, climate ambition in the region. Finland has the world's most ambitious net zero target uh, by to be climate neutral by 2035. Uh, this is, uh, but the, to really uh, to achieve this goal, uh, stronger emissions reductions are needed and also increased carbon removals from the land use sector. So the, so the Finnish target for climate neutrality by 2035 does not mean that Finland uh, aims to have zero fossil fuel emissions by 2035, but when considered together uh, with the climate or carbon removals from the land use sector, then the combined amount of emissions would be would be neutral or net, like we say in, uh, at the IA, net zero. Um, Finland also <clears throat> needs to still increase its renewable energy deployment. Fairly high levels of renewables uh, have already been achieved. Uh, uh, 40% share in electricity and uh, above 50% share in heating and cooling. Uh, transport especially needs to grow more strongly to, to meet the 2030 targets from the current 20% to, to, about, to around 45% in 2030. Uh, Finland also, uh, as a, to, to achieve this, need to address barriers, especially around permitting and rapidly start the offshore wind uh, deployment. Uh, then uh, another kind of specific topic for the for the Nordic Baltic region is heat it quite, quite a lot of heat understandably is, is, is used in the region um, district heating is only also a technology that is common uh, to, to some of the countries in this region and actually district heating can kind of the, the key question is that what is the role of, of, of renewables in, in, in and the role of decarbonizing heat? in this clean energy transition because it can be a little bit complicated. However, we see that district heating is actually a good system and a good basis for, for decarbonizing heat for, for building purposes. Um, it can uh, operate this kind of an integrator. So heat pumps also, are, they are great for, for houses, but also they can be used to provide heat for district heating. Helsinki is an example of city that has been um, adding industrial scale heat pumps to the district heating network. And then renewables can then introduce and can be used to produce the heat at a very high efficiency through heat pumps. Of course, there's, there is this variability aspect to heat and their uh, heat thermal energy storage. So heat storage, hot water storage plays a really an important role. So this is a uh, as, a store, as far as storage goes, you know, uh, low temperature thermal energy storage is simple and, and a low cost technology and really can boost the efficiency of a, of a clean heating system. But it also helps to integrate renewables because it, it provides a cheap way to integrate, to, to provide storage of energy in the form of, of hot water. This is an important aspect, uh, an interesting aspect for the region as well. Um, looking at Denmark, we, we know Denmark from a country that has already has a, a large amount of wind being installed, as we can see the kind of development during the, on the left-hand side of this uh, slide. On the right-hand side, we see our uh, market forecast for renewables in Denmark. It will just continues to grow what we see being introduced to this Nordic Baltic region, which has where renewables generation has been driven. driven the renewables market 
by wind largely now that utility scale PV is starting to be introduced to the region. So the cost had come down so that even in, in kind of a Nordic Baltic conditions uh, where, where uh, there's certain characteristic uh, solar availabilities, PV is now starting to emerge so strongly uh, to the market. So this will all mean that Denmark is at the forefront of countries um, with very high levels of variable renewables in the energy system and the country needs to keep on preparing for these very high shares of variable renewables. So the, 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 by, this is possible by lifting onshore barriers in permitting and supporting grid investment so that, that will help them to integrate these large uh, shares of variable renewables. Um, Estonia is uh, uh, an example of a, of a Baltic uh, region country that has an extremely ambitious target. Uh, it has a target to reach 100% share of electricity demand from renewables by 2030. This will be challenging. Uh, historically, oil shale has uh, played a large majority role in electricity generation. It has decreased, but then also has rebounded. And the current pace of renewable deployment in Estonia is not aligned with the 100% target. So significant acceleration is, is needed there. <coughs> um, another example from Estonia is the uh, uh, energy use in, in the building sector. There's high potential in, in Estonia to reduce energy demand emissions from buildings. So building stock is relatively old and uh, inefficient in Estonia. Um, and there is also low level of information on, on what the building energy demands are. So less than 7% of buildings have an energy performance certificate. And among those buildings who have it, 80% have energy performance below class C. So this means that there is uh, uh, ample potential to, to improve and reduce energy demand uh, and improve efficiency in this sector. Um, then I lastly want to also highlight the, uh, this kind of uh, positive development of Baltic, Baltic states uh, synchronizing uh, with the continental Europe by early 2025. Uh, this will further integrate the Baltics in the EU electricity markets and provide opportunities to boost interconnectivity. So interconnectivity between the regions and stronger grids are one of the key pillars of, of, of renewables integration. And, and uh, the opportunities from here should be leveraged what this, this uh, integration offers. All right, um, I want to summarize and, and conclude with some takeaways uh, that we have identified this year when doing the in-depth reviews for, for these countries. Uh, there is in all countries need to still accelerate the deployment of renewable electricity generation. This can be done by reducing permitting time and especially in countries where there are already very high shares of renewables by increasing system flexibility. Uh, this can be done by strengthening the grids, but also deploying more energy storage projects. Here, I think the district heating systems that are widely in use in, the, in, in some countries of the regions are, are, uh, can offer good possibilities because electricity can be converted in a very high efficiency to heat through large scale heat pumps and then stored cheaply uh, in, in thermal energy storage. So this provides a great opportunity for integrating large amounts of renewables in a, in a cost efficient way. Uh, while at the same time, when, when these countries are pursuing more and more renewables and cheap renewables for the energy system, uh, there should be, at the same time, the other side of the coin is to increase the electrification of this energy demand. Especially in these countries, transportation and heavy industry uh, offers a lot of opportunities. So when energy demand is electrified, either in the form of EVs in transport electric vehicles or, or electrified heat uh, in, in industries, uh, this enables the end users to take advantage of this clean electricity, but also provides more flexible load on the demand side, which again contributes to, to easier um, integration of renewables. So they, they go uh, hand in hand. 
Interconnectivity is, is really important for the region. It should be sustained and expanded regionally, and especially seizing to the opportunities that this Baltic synchronization with Euro Europe will offer. Um, the Estonia example shows that uh, there is uh, there's opportunities to redu uh, improve e efficiency, especially in, in buildings, and scale up uh, and the, the renovation of the building stock, stock should be scaled up. Um, and in any case, uh, support investment in future energy system and sector integration is really uh, important to get uh, get the, all the benefits of the increasing amount of, increasing amount of renewables that the countries are going to be adding. All right, very quickly, this was my my summary of, of what we have done for the region during this year, and uh, I hope you enjoyed and I'm ready for some questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ilka, for a uh, very uh, fine presentation, and it's a nice uh, synth synthesis of the of the in-depth reviews uh, in in, uh, in this presentation. So many common characteristics. Uh, are there any questions to to Ilka Hanula in Paris? Yes, question here. Uh, thank you. I'm Ivar Reik from Estonia. Uh, you touched uh, thermal energy. What is the share of thermal energy in Finland today? Is this a renewable energy or not? And you said that Finland is a global leader in developing thermal energy storages. Uh, uh, this means that uh, uh, you, have, you are producing thermal energy. How cheap is this th thermal energy in Finland? And uh, what do you think uh, in Estonia we can find the thermal energy also because we are so close to you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so a very good question. And like I said um, in my presentation, the heat is really kind of the high heat demand is really characteristic for this region and also can be a, a quick, uh, a big question mark. Uh, if you think about um, the city of Helsinki, but also other capitals and large cities in the regions, um, they, <clears throat> the heat during the winter months is still relying on fossil fuels. And the real question mark is how, how can these fossil fuels will be replaced? What kind of system can replace uh, uh, the fossil fuels in heating so that you will, you will provide clean, uh, affordable and uh, keep also the energy security during the winter months? It's really a key issue. Uh, about the shares, um, uh, in Finland, the renewables are about 55% of the share of, uh, of heat. And the example on energy storage in Helsinki goes, it's, it's, the, the Helsinki approach has been kind of to, there is no one way to, to uh, replace uh, the coal and ga natural gas CHP plants in, in, in district heat production, but the transition is rather to a much more, um, 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 to a system that, that relies on many technologies instead of one. So what Helsinki has done is to, my understanding is to replace part of the uh, coal capacity with biomass based um, uh, heat boilers. And then uh, the rest is, is, should be done with non-biomass solutions like large scale heat pumps. And then <coughs> really the energy storage part that I referred to is that um, during the uh, you know, 50 years ago, I, I believe, Finland um, in Helsinki, they they created underground uh, energy storages for oil, so emergency emergency storages underground in the in, deep into the underground, which haven't been used for a while, and these are now converted to hot water storages. So so Helsinki is looking for opportunities to using existing infrastructure that used to serve some fossil fossil energy system and then thinking how they can be used in a, in a new clean energy system and part of this is the converting these emergency oil reserves or underground storages to hot water tanks that can be then connected to this heating system i, I don't now remember how much it but it's i think they have a several days of capacity 
uh, to store heat uh, for the city's purposes. So this was the, the example I mentioned. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, an additional last question, Hayanar, because we need to she move forward. About geothermal energy and how to how much do you produce geothermal energy? And uh, I thought that the Iceland is a, a producer of geothermal, and now Finland is also, or it, it's not so much. Yeah, so it goes to the definition of what is geothermal. So if it's really something uh, geothermal, traditionally is understood as you have a geological hotspot, there is a lava is close to the surface, and then you can utilize that as kind of a more traditional geothermal. However, we see emerging in Finland now this kind of a deep heat technology where you don't really uh, utilize the hot, like a hot spots in the ground, but you just take drill um, deep enough to utilize the kind of ubiquity everywhere available heat from the ground. And it doesn't need to be deep enough to get the boiling water out, but it can be just enough so that it provides this kind of low temperature source of heat for the heat pumps. So, uh, and this is a new technology because as I understand it, uh, in the US where they did the fracking and, and the drilling for those, the drilling methods have developed during the last decade quite a lot. And it has opened new, new technologies also for drilling deep holes uh, that can be used then for this kind of a deep heat, deep ground source heat, which is sometimes called geothermal as well. Thank you for clarification of deep heat. I think there are some countries in Nordic, in Nordic who actually try this, this technology now. Should we just t say thank you to, to Ilka Handula in Paris? Thank you very much for participating and we give you an applause. <laughs> thank you. Have a nice um, Afternoon. Thank you. And then I think we can jump to the uh, the country cases uh, where we have uh, uh, we have uh, Estonia, Denmark, and Finland. Estonia, Reinvax, is it? Welcome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Interesting times. Interesting times where we live at. So, renewables and energy efficiency. I think that uh, uh, people have been talking about those two subjects for far too long without emphasizing the need of renewables and energy efficiency when we're talking about the country's competitiveness. So, we cannot be competitive on the markets without having enough uh, renewables or doing enough for energy efficiency. So a few words from the Estonian perspective, how to boost our competitiveness with uh, uh, increasing the level of renewables and, uh, well, tackling the energy efficiency first principle. Um, this, is, this is a good slide that we have been presenting throughout the history uh, of, of the energy department and uh, we, we, we like to brag that uh, these days the policy that we have had in the ministry has led us to be the uh, fourth in, in EU in using renewables. So it's, it's our solemn goal to catch up with Latvia who is currently the fourth, uh, well sorry, the third and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we will catch up within next two years. Most probably, isn't that so? Hmm. Um, but uh, when we are looking into the details, then the majority of our renewables is coming from uh, tissue heating. So as, as many before already mentioned, biomass is the one uh, one topic that generates the, ma the majority of renewables in Estonia. So, and the majority in renewable heating uh, these days, precisely 65% to be true uh, on, the, on the final statistics from 2022. Biomass is the most important fuel uh, in, in our renewable business. Red 3 emphasizes 
the need to have sustainable biomass on our market. I'm glad to say that all of the biomass used here in Estonia is sustainable and it can be accounted for uh, renewables um, as a whole. In electricity, we, we rank rather behind. One third of the production is of uh, green origin, of renewable in, uh, origin. Uh, this is not good for us. This is not sufficient enough. This is also the point why we would like to have 100% of renewables in electricity by 2030. This is quite ambitious. I'll get back to that. Renewables in transport, um, well, except for Sweden and Finland, and perhaps a few more countries, I really don't know any, any other member states who would like to have more than 10 or 15 percent of uh, renewables in transport. So it's, it's one of the most difficult uh, sectors to decarbonize. So it might just take some time to get to 30 or 40 uh, percentages in transport. But we are doing our best and uh, the goal is to be climate neutral as soon as possible but not later than by 2050. You know, the, the aggression uh, of Russia against Ukraine has uh, speeded a few things up in Estonia as well. It's a bit tricky but during 2022, we have increased our ambition in, in renewable energy all over the field. The overall goal for 2030 would be around 65%. Currently, it was around 63%. The majority of the growth comes from renewables and electricity. So where we would like to have Instead of the current 30% target, 40% target, 100% of renewables by 2030. This is ambitious. This is tricky, but I think that we can come around it. And of course, in uh, in renewables, uh, in in heating and cooling, uh, the current target, according to the freshest statistics, is 65% already today. We are trying to head to 69, perhaps 70. I think that is, this is also quite sensible. Synchronization project. So for those who don't know it yet, we would like to be desynchronized from the Brel or from the Russian system by the beginning of 2025. Before the aggression, the deadline was the end of 2025. So this has changed we are paying a lot for that, but we will be ready uh, uh, a lot sooner than beforehand. So this is also one important topic for us. Uh, a bit provocative, uh, but still energy efficiency. The cheapest energy is the energy that I didn't consume. This is, this is the golden... Uh, sentence and we use it as, as often as possible. Um, ED. Well, it's quite ambitious. It's, it's even more ambit uh, ambitious than uh, achieving uh, climate neutrality by 2050, I, I, I might say. The, 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 the possible range of energy efficiency is, is quite huge for us. Even though we managed to achieve 130% of the 2020 goal, the goal for 2030 is quite huge for us. So we need to have uh, energy savings up to 2030 around 21 terawatt hours. So that's a lot. We need to, uh, well, decrease our energy consumption from the current baseline 33 terawatt hours to 30 terawatt hours, 10 percent in a growing economy. That's that's quite well. I don't know. It's it's quite uh, quite a task. On the other hand, you would like to see the the economy rise and and jobs created, etc. Uh, etc. Et which well, you might not 
do very well when you try to well consume ele electricity and, and energy as, as less as possible. So this is this is something that we are still working on. But uh, the overall goal is that energy efficiency must be declared. The the public sector has to show. Uh, something to to move ahead with energy efficiency, otherwise the measures will not work. This is this is clear as day. The renewables. How are things progressing in the renewable business? We are glad to say that after a great halt in the wind uh, developments, finally some new investments into the wind capacities have been made. So we see that uh, in 2022, 23, 24, the capacity in, in wind installations will be doubled. This is good news for us. And we hope to see around two gigawatts of wind by 2030. Uh, the joint project that was mentioned behind RED3, we have a project um, already in the oven so it was launched a few years ago. We have a joint project with the Latvians, a wind project where we pre-develop the area for wind turbines, offshore wind turbines, and, and sell it to the highest bidder sometime in the nearest future. However, wind is not the only resource that we are seeking. Uh, we are looking into PVs as well. These days we have around 700 um, 700 uh, megawatts of installed capacity so this is this is something that well on a first uh, on a first glance it seems to be quite good on the second glance when we look into the system as well the balancing costs etc etc this is quite quite a headache for the system side so you need to have some balancing reserves etc etc otherwise it might get tricky uh, but we are proud to say that we are the fourth, sorry, the sixth in the, in the European Union uh, deploying uh, PVs per capita. So this is good news for us. Onshore renewable energy. In the ministry, we have been working hard on, uh, on analyzing the potential of onshore energy in the 2030 target. The analysis shows that uh, the price crisis, the energy crisis, has, has worked well, to say it bluntly. There are a lot of investment in interests in uh, onshore uh, wind parks. Uh, these days we count counted the, the possible investments around 5 gigawatts, which is more than two times the amount we need to achieve the 2030 target. So we look um, optimistically into, into this picture and uh, are doing our best to fasten uh, the developments and grid developments uh, as fast as we can, as much as we can. Offshore is also on the table these days. We have a huge potential for offshore and um, while looking into the renewables target as a whole, we, we would like to electrify uh, everything that uses these days uh, well, combustion engines or, or, or uses fuel, whether it's fossil or, or biofuel. So we would like to go electric where we can. This means that we need to have a lot of electricity from renewables from offshore, from onshore, etc., etc. So these days, we have a capacity around um, 20 terawatt hours. The consumption of stone is around 10 by 2030. So more than double. Uh, uh, each and every investment willing to consu consume the electricity is really welcome to, to uh, situate itself here in stone. And last, not uh, not least, of course, um, the possible the possible projects contributing to the 2030 target offshore 
We have three of them. The majority, uh, the, the majority of the consumption of the production would be online already by well beginning of the 2030s, which is good news for us. However, there is still the issue of, uh, of financing and possible subsidy going on uh, in the in the government. We have been discussing this, uh, this for three months now in the government, and we are hoping for a decision in early 2024. So, as said, there are three projects uh, in, in good phases already, around 15 terawatt hours of production. However, we don't have the consumption for that. We are trying our best to find the consumption for that. All the wind parks offshore are indeed welcome to Estonia. So, we are doing our best to boost the, the, the competitiveness of Estonia as an uh, investment country uh, and, uh, and provide the best solution in, in energy as possible. Thanks. One or two questions for uh, Mr. Vox. Brilliant. Everything is clear. Good. It was crystal clear. No misunderstandings. I think uh, we can continue in the program. Yeah, thanks. And uh, next out was, uh, uh, I think it's uh, Denmark. And uh, this is uh, Mr. Rasmus Tengvad from the Danish Energy Agency. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, for those that are not, those of you that are not into numbers, I don't have many numbers with me uh, today, so um, don't worry. I'll give you a status on the implementation of the uh, Energy Efficiency Directive and the Renewables uh, Directive in, uh, in Denmark. <coughs> As uh, Hans mentioned, uh, we are in the finalization of the big package fifth for 55. Uh, all of the relevant for us uh, elements are being uh, adopted now and now we just had the uh, uh, EPBD, the Directive for Energy Performance uh, in Buildings, uh, agreed on, I hear, which is uh, very good news. Um, that said, we are on the track to uh, carbon emission reduction on 55% in 2030. Um, two of the main pillars, not the only pillars, but two of the main pillars is the uh, EED and the RED. And since they have been agreed on uh, the EED in uh, spring and uh, the RED here in, in the final stages of uh, summer, um, we have been working hard to analyze uh, what is in these new uh, uh, directives um, and what is the best way for us as a country to implement. Uh, as Hans said, this is about delivering on the Green Deal, um, and that is true. Uh, the package 555 delivers part of it. The rest has to be delivered by countries. And this is uh, where I come into place, among uh, many other people. In the, in the Danish Energy Agency. Um, <clears throat> but with new ambitions, and these are very ambitious uh, directives, come also uh, new uh, commitments, uh, complexity, and uh, for our uh, analysis, these two uh, directives represent quite a big step up in complexity um, and commitments to, uh, to member states. Um, and with that also comes a question of costs. Um, we have estimated that from the winter package to this uh, Fit for 55, we see a five-fold increase in administration costs from 2 million euros from the winter package to almost 10 million euros a year <laughs> in administration implementation costs for the agency. Uh, that's quite a big step up in, uh, in costs, and that doesn't include what it will be on the other side. So it's just to picture that with higher ambitions also cost, uh, comes more cost for, um, for member states and for uh, consumers and businesses.
part of this, for our view, is that with these uh, directives comes more governmental inter intervention in many markets. Um, we see an increased level of government requirements that needs to be follow up on, need to uh, increase uh, control. And that is part of why we estimate that uh, it will be challenging and costly for, uh, for our uh, government to, uh, to implement these two. And this is why we think of uh, and are scratching our heads to, uh, to find new uh, ways uh, and to find the most cost-effective way of, uh, of implementing, uh, implementing these uh, directives. We need new ideas. We need everyone to come forward. We need collaborations between member states. We are already um, having some very good dialogues within the concerted action uh, framework, and we are extremely happy uh, for these uh, for these uh, for these dialogues. I think it's uh, crucial for us to ensure uh, a just uh, a just implementation. A little bit about the timeline, uh, as we see it on an implementation side, uh, we had, the, uh, this is on the uh, EED uh, recast uh, here from uh, July. We have been analyzing each article in order to find out what is the implication on a national level and compared to what uh, regulations we already have in, in place. And what is happening now is that we are preparing for some political dialogues uh, or uh, that dialogue where we need political guidance. Uh, there are on a number of issues where we need uh, politicians to set the path and the ambition level for the implementation. Uh, I'll come a bit uh, back to where, uh, what I'm talking about. Um, this is happening uh, now here, October, December. Uh, January and to June, we need some clarification. And it's because, yes, we do have two years uh, of uh, implementation time, but really we don't have two years in reality because already next summer, we need to report to the commission on, uh, the, uh, on the important parts of our implementation plan for this, uh, for the uh, RET, but also for the EPPD. So we are very much in a hurry to find our ways around how do we as a country want to implement this because we have to report it to the Commission already summer next year. So this is really what presses us uh, in, 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 in our country that uh, we have to find ways uh, already in April and May uh, so we can report it to the, to the Commission. Now, uh, status on some of these uh, that new and uh, existing uh, themes in the EED. Uh, let's start with the, with the new ones. As Hans mentioned, the energy first principle is not really new, but it's new in the way that it's written and formulated in the energy efficient directive. In terms of how it, how it obligates uh, and commits member states to do certain things. Um, and what we have to do here is that we have to ensure that for all policy and planning and investment decisions over a certain amount, 100 million uh, euros or 175 million euros for uh, infrastructure, we have to ensure that actors, whether they're public or private, take into consideration any energy efficient alternative. And that sounds really nice. But how do you do that? How do we ensure that in practice? This is where we are right now in our uh, process. How do we, as a legislator, as a regulator, ensure that, that the right actors are taking these steps at the right time? So the question for us is, what is it that we have to ask who to do different at what time? Because you can, you can look at it and say, if you think of energy efficiency first, many and, and what it has been, it already embedded in much of the energy uh, regulation that is coming from the EU already. Take the Energy Performance and Buildings Directive. Much of this is embedded already in that directive. When we build data centers, we already have 
to take into consideration the possibility of using the waste heat and for, for, uh, for district heating. So there are many elements already scattered around the package and the previous package that is, of an, that is an idea of energy efficiency first. So we have to, so I have to single out what is new and what do we have different, what is that we have to do different with this specific provision in the energy efficiency first. Specifically, we haven't decided uh, yet how it will be uh, implemented. We have a close dialogue with the Commission on a, a bilateral basis, and we're also looking forward for those uh, guidelines that the Commission has promised us here coming up uh, quite soon. But uh, one idea that we are working on is how we can, we can link into these existing planning requirements, for example, uh, linking it to the environmental impact assessments because this is something and a framework that many of these decisions are already following. Could we somehow link the energy efficiency first principle guidelines to this regulation framework in order to not to create a new framework, a, a, a completely new set of rules that uh, decision makers has to follow. So it's really fun finding a balance between how we can work with this in practice but not creating a new set of rules on top of other sets of rules. Um, but it's a tricky one, and we haven't solved it, and we are very much interested in having dialogues with all of you on what, uh, what, uh, how, you, how you plan to go about it. Energy poverty, it's, for us, it's a new concept within the energy regulation framework. Energy poverty is not a new thing either in Denmark, but it's new in the energy uh, uh, regulation framework. We have until now kept these things very separate and we have also in the negotiations insisted that it should be possible to deal with these things in the social uh, legislation as we do in Denmark. So to keep the issues separate, not that energy poverty is not and just transition is not important, but where should you deal with it? Should you deal with it also in the, reg in the energy regulation or can you deal with it in the social regulation? With these new requirements, we don't see any way that you could keep things separate. Uh, there's, a new, there's a new definition on uh, energy poverty that we have to implement. We have to deliver a certain amount of the, uh, of the energy saving obligation among this group uh, that we have to define. So we see no way we can not within the energy sector deal with this. But it's a completely new thing for our ministry for our agency to deal with these social aspects. We have not done it before. So it's a, it's a new, very exciting thing, but it's, it's also new. And uh, we are uh, preparing political discussions on how to proceed uh, going forward on, uh, on this. Now, another new thing, or uh, an, it's not really new, but it's, uh, uh, in my view, some, an, a, some increased requirements for member states to ensure that on the educational and qualification area, member states has to ensure that there are a certain number of educated and qualified uh, actors without to perform what has to be performed, either builders or consultancies or whatever. Um, with this directive, it gets a notch up. Um, we have to in ensure that there's a number or an enough uh, people that is qualified to uh, deal with, uh, for example, kind of uh, heat pump installations uh, and so forth. That's also a new thing uh, in, in the matter of the amounts and the scale where we have to ensure it. And we are a bit unsure how to really to go about uh, ensuring that there's sufficient amounts. Um, because it's very much also a market for young people to uh, take the uh, right type of qualifications. Financing was also mentioned. It's a very, very big uh, provision in the Energy Efficient Directive and it's also similar big in the coming uh, Energy Performance and Building Directive. So we are anxious to see those two things together. Uh, but no doubt that this will also impose new obligations to, uh, to governments to ensure that certain products exist on the markets. 
Um, and we are uh, wondering what, what will be our specific role, because at least in our country, we have that belief that we have a quite fluent and good financing markets for also these products. Um, we have some uh, banks and financial institutions very active. In fact, on a voluntary commercial basis, providing these kinds of instruments that also the Commission and uh, uh, political uh, agreements uh, is asking a member states to ensure exist. So our question is, what do we do if the market provides it? Uh, should we then have to adopt specific uh, regulation on it? Or can we let the markets uh, do their thing uh, and rely on the market to, at all times, provide these uh, instruments uh, needed? Or do we have to have a kind of enforcement mechanism where we can enforce the certain product exists on the market. We'll have to find that out. The energy saving obligation, it's not a new thing, but it's, uh, as uh, Ryan uh, uh, said, it's, uh, it's new. The, the ambition level is also extremely ambitious for, uh, for a country like mine, Denmark. Also because it is, uh, we have chosen not to use the energy saving obligations on, uh, on energy, uh, in the energy sector, but we do it through the state budget. And this means that we have to come up with new ideas to uh, introduce new energy savings, additional energy savings compared to what is already delivered by prices and other uh, mechanisms. We have quite a substantial banco from the uh, existing uh, targets up to the new target for 2030. Um, and then the public sector, it's more of the same in a way that we already have targets for part of the public sector. The new thing here is that those targets are rolled out to <coughs> include also uh, local municipalities and uh, regions. So our task here is to, to find out, okay, who are the obligated parties actually? Uh, yeah, the municipalities, yes, that's fine. But what about uh, semi-public, private uh, entities? Uh, who are they? Who is obligated and who is not? Um, that is uh, a new thing. Also here, the combination between this energy efficiency directive and the new EVPD will be uh, very interesting to analyze uh, further. Okay. Um, a few words on the revised directive on renewable uh, energy. Um, this really cuts down into uh, some areas that is of huge political uh, debates uh, and uh, attention in, uh, in, uh, in Denmark. And this about uh, permits is something that is very much in focus in uh, in, uh, in Denmark. We have it, as we, some of you saw the slide from you, uh, Christine, the, the, the take up of new installation has fallen uh, rapidly uh, in Norway, but also in Denmark in 2022 and 2023. And we have seen uh, installments of, uh, of new projects uh, due to uh, complaints and issues with, uh, with, uh, with permits. And it's, for us, it's not as much about reaching the 2030 targets uh, for the European Union. For us, it's the national targets on carbon emission reductions for 2025 and 2030 that is pressing us as a, as a regulator and legislator. Sustainable use of biomass, yes, we tend to forget how much of our renewable energy is actually coming from biomass. In Denmark, it's 64%. Uh, it's a significant share. Oh, it was at least, I, 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 I might remember it said they're a few years old, it might have changed a bit less uh, today, but it's still a large bit that is coming from biomass. And then uh, the green transport, how do we uh, transform the transport sector as in other countries? It's of a huge debate. Should we use uh, renewable fuels uh, of uh, biological region or should we use a new type of, uh, of fuels? That's um, that's a big debate. Yeah, as I said, we are on track uh, for 2030, uh, but we have a, a carbon emission reduction target of 50% for 2025 and for 70% for 2030. That includes not only new installation of renewable energy, but also transformation of the end use sector specifically uh, 
industry to use more uh, renewable. And for that, we have introduced or will introduce from next year a new carbon emission tax uh, that will be put on uh, the emissions from, uh, from businesses and industry. And we expect that this will help uh, or give a quite a strong incentive to businesses to, uh, to convert. Yeah, this is uh, the same uh, timeline, but it's not really the same because what is uh, pressing us here is that, as you also saw on hand slide, that some of the provisions in the new uh, Renewable Energy Directive has an implementation date of summer next year. Uh, specific uh, some of these things related to the uh, repower uh, EU. Um, and it's significant chunks of legislation that has to be put in place, and it's a very, very short uh, deadline. Okay, um, just a few words on the uh, relation to the National Energy and Climate Plans that uh, is due to uh, be finalized here also in summer. As I mentioned, we are in a hurry to find our way through the implementation phase. At least the political ambition has to be in place so we can report on it uh, for the Commission uh, in the summer. Uh, we were one of the few countries that delivered a draft uh, in, uh, NECP this summer, but we did it because it was almost empty. So it was not really an achievement for us to deliver that. Uh, and that's because of the timing issues here that is a bit of an issue that you don't really have things in place, you don't have the regulation in place, you don't have the national implementation in place before you have to uh, report it uh, for the Commission. So on one hand you understand the Commission's need to have a progress report, on the other hand you also uh, need to take into account that new regulation has to be put in place before you can report on those things. So I think when the evaluation of the regulation when that is coming up this is something we have to have further dialogues about what is the ambition level of the regulation how to ensure that the commission will have the data on the progress and the, the each member state also have the possibility to report in a timely and proper fashion for uh, for those uh, reports and that is really the issue on both uh, energy efficiency and uh, the renewables uh, directive and I can see my time is up, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very good, uh, Rasmus. Yes, question from... Yes, you mentioned that you have a new problem, energy poverty. Can you describe how this looks like in Denmark? I imagine this is in Africa, but how it's in Denmark and how this uh, energy poverty is related to energy saving obligations? Yes, um, it follows from the energy efficiency directive that you have to have a certain percentage of your energy saving obligation targeted the group of energy poverty. So if you have, let's say, 5% energy poverty, 5% of your target will have to be delivered among that group. So the first task, you have to define the energy poverty within your country. And then you have to somehow calculate or estimate a number, a percentage point. And then you use that as a reference for measuring your uh, your uh, efforts uh, towards the energy savings obligation. So this is the mechanism. If you don't define a national energy poverty rate, then you use a mechanism already given within the uh, directive. In our case, it gives a share of energy poverty uh, a bit over 8% of the population. Uh, that is quite high. And I believe it's also higher than we would calculate it ourselves. Uh, and I think part of the reason is that it includes uh, students, uh, university students that is living in, own, in their own apartments. Um, that they are, of course, low income and that, that is included in the uh, uh, statistics of the, uh, of the Eurostat, which we would not, I think, include in our own definition. But this is what is going on right now that we are working on finding ways to define the concepts within the Danish context. So I don't have any answers for you now. I explained the mechanism within the directive. We have to find the 
the, the definition, we have to implement the definition in Denmark like you have to do in your country, and then you have to target much or some of your uh, energy saving obligation initiatives towards that, as well as a number of other things around in this directive and in other directives where you have to take into account uh, specific, uh, specific vulnerable groups. Thank you very much. Should we, yeah, Teresa Kilk. Do you have a very much free workforce in your agency? Because you said that you would like to uh, increase reporting uh, and increase the monitoring. How do you uh, decrease the administrative burden, but, uh, but still do the reporting? <laughs> Thanks. It's, it's a bit a uh, technical question, but, uh, but that is also a challenge. Uh, we, uh, as an agency, have to negotiate our budget with the Ministry of Finance uh, every year. Uh, we have a base that is around, a fixed base that is around a fifth of our total costs. They, they are fixed from year to year and the rest we have to argue for to get. And this is why we say we, we have analyzed, anal, anal, analyzed the whole package and reached this number and then you go to dialogue with the Ministry of Finance. Uh, and in this case, uh, we got a fourth, a quarter of the amount. Uh, so, so that's 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 the challenge uh, for the agency uh, because obviously we didn't, maybe we didn't expect to get the full amount, but uh, a quarter is um, will give us will give us challenge in the, in the implementation phase and the administration. Thank you. We all have to to negotiate with the ministers of finance. Yeah, I, I, I think that's one that's the one uh, commonality. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, should we uh, continue with uh, the country cases? Thank you very much, uh, Rasmus. <laughs> and here, uh, Ulla Suomi from uh, she's director in Motiva. She will uh, tell us about how how that functions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I was asked on uh, a case uh, a bit different angle and uh, perhaps it was good because I could have quite much repeated what was just said from by, by Denmark. Uh, yeah, uh, I was asked uh, to tell that what is the role of Motiva in implementing energy efficiency in Finland and uh, Motiva nowadays is a sustainable development company uh, um, acting uh, and providing in information, solutions and services for different kind of groups, public sector businesses and uh, municipalities. But in addition, we are a very big and uh, important role is also to support supporting ministries and uh, authorities in energy field uh, in planning uh, national implementation and also we are involved in the negotiation phase of these directives. Uh, sorry, I, I did not have this one <coughs> uh, on there. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, those figures which are on the right hand side, they are showing the whole Motiva group, if we could say it. Uh, the main in-house part is uh, uh, covering about 75% of this turnover, uh, but then we have also um, limited company Motiva Services and also Ecolabel Finland is part of Motiva Group. And uh, then a bit timeline re regarding this uh, story of Motiva. Uh, we, uh, Motiva has been uh, built up uh, already early 19th. And uh, it was uh, then when Finland has the first energy savings program and, and this uh, subsidy, uh, subsidized energy audit program and industrial energy saving action plan was uh, firstly then built up. Uh, and also during that period Motivas uh, operation was planned and uh, it was started in 93. And what I especially is really proud of is that already then in the ministry there were quite wise guides, guys who decided that if we have a subsidized, subsidized program, we need to monitor it and, and show the results what, what, to, to be able to continue it in longer perspective. 
And uh, during also this three-year um, project, uh, it was uh, decided that motiv motivus operation need to be permanent because also uh, the first voluntary agreement uh, scheme was then planned and it should be then built up and also um, the monitoring for that should be, should be um, planned and also implemented. And uh, that was the point 98 I went to Motiva, so I have been there quite a long time, over 25 years. And uh, after that there has been quite much which have been added to Motiva scope. Uh, in the first years it all only worked uh, like an energy agency, but after that it has been uh, input there in the scope, material efficiency and other issues also. Uh, but as said in the heading, we, we have started already well before EU, EU legislation came into force in, in this field. But when it came into force in uh, 2008, we had quite a nice uh, position because we had already uh, running up and running this voluntary energy efficiency scheme and we could also fine-tune it to this uh, new directives requirements. And we started a new new period of voluntary energy efficiency agreements, 2008, and uh, and we at the same time we make a big bigger revision in our monitoring system so that we combine our energy audit program and voluntary agreement scheme so that they are not overlapping. Uh, after that, however, uh, the first one should have been uh, ended only two. 2016, but uh, what happened? We 2012 already got a new directive, and I think Hans was already in the in the morning or earlier saying that it is sometimes a bit difficult how often you can revise EU legislation if you think that how member states can apply them on national level, and I. I can only say that it is difficult and we can't change our own programs and policies uh, so often that uh, we need to somehow have some stability, especially when there are those uh, programs are requiring something for, by companies and municipalities. So we need to have some kind of long-term <coughs> long uh, um, perspective so that they can also build their own systems and trust that what is coming. That doesn't mean that we in Finland do, do not apply EU directives, but we, but we need then to figure out how we will solve the problem that we now already have our national uh, program, which we can't change and still we need to do something <laughs> to apply with new EU requirements. After that, there has been quite a lot uh, new EU things and uh, now we are in the beginning of next year, we have all already decided with um, participants uh, that uh, we will start uh, negotiating voluntary energy efficiency agreements for the, uh, <coughs> for the period starting 26 <coughs> and uh, because uh, our plan is that the, these voluntary agreements still will be, be in an important role uh, in our ED implementation. And uh, I quickly then show you some, some, something about what is our motivus role in these biggest uh, programs, uh, poly, energy efficiency policies in Finland. Uh, this is only showing if you don't know what is the energy efficiency agreements, and perhaps you don't know too, too much after this slide either, but, but it, is a, it is quite <coughs> comprehensive scheme and it covers covers these uh, industries and municipalities and also property sector. And uh, those, uh, uh, pre those uh, framework agreements, they are signed by uh, government uh, organizations and uh, associations, branch associations, and then uh, those uh, companies, they are signing their own uh, company individual actions with the branch associations 
and we have own brands, uh, brands uh, action plans for those uh, areas where, which are now seen in the slide. Uh, it, the same way we have uh, own action plans for commercial properties and housing properties and also for municipalities. We also have now in this, uh, this period uh, a, an own a bit different uh, agreement for oil heated buildings but uh, let's see that if we will continue that. That is a, nowadays a bit more difficult area. But uh, what is our, uh, these are the agreement parties who, who are signing, the government and <coughs> associations are signing the framework agreement and then companies and communities, uh, they are joining it and they are setting their own targets uh, in, in their accession documents. But what we are doing in Motiva, we have been, uh, we are involved in the negotiations of the, of the agreements and uh, we are also marketing those uh, agreements. We, we are um, in the implementation phase. We are supporting those who have joined the agreements. We, we have several kind of activities where we try to make it easier to implement uh, the, uh, the targets in companies and municipalities. And of course, there are also other parties because one, <laughs> important part of, is of course for those who have joined the agreements is uh, how how they can imp what are those things they can do and uh, energy audits uh, are one of the good uh, mm, good tool for that uh, where i can come to this energy audits uh, um, program uh, although the level playing field has changed quite a lot because we nowadays have those mandatory audits. We still are running this same, same, but uh, energy audit, subsidized energy audit program uh, for others than uh, which are not under the mandatory, mandatory audit <coughs> requirement. And we have different kind of, of models which they can, participants can, can use. Uh, what is our role there? We are not doing anything, any energy audits ourselves in Motiva, but we are developing um, this uh, um, program and uh, developing models, uh, training those auditors, qualifying them. And uh, also we have this monitoring uh, for this uh, program and also quality control for the energy audits. Uh, of course, uh, administration is not in our, our in Motiva, but it is in the Energy Authority. And then the subsidi subsidies we are not either handling, but they, these are hand handled by Business Finland. And uh, and of course, the main support is come, comes from the Ministry of Economic Affairs and and Employment. And the. Last example uh, of this uh, long-term uh, uh, policies we are and um, measures we are uh, in practice implementing and helping the implementation is this energy advice. Uh, we, um, in the previous slides, you perhaps noticed that 2010, uh, the coordination of the consumer energy advice was appointed to Motiva. And uh, then, since then, we have been doing it. And nowadays, there are also regional energy advice, which is uh, which is administrated by energy authority. But still, we are support supporting also for those uh, those things a lot. And uh, one good example is uh, based on this tradition, long-term tradition, is that when uh, this Ukraine war started, and we all faced. Difficult uh, difficulties with this energy sector. We really, really quickly could build up uh, a <coughs> campaign uh, which was named "Down a Degree," and uh, it was really. Um, I could say that it could. Uh, perhaps it also shows that what is the um, uh, 
way to work in Finland and when, when we found that there is now something which is really a crisis, we need to be together and try to get uh, the best possible and to do it together. There were quite uh, many um, sh both short-term and long-term goals set there and uh, um, the results were also monitored and, uh, the, and also here also here, um, we almost got uh, the target. We had uh, the target that 95% of uh, all those uh, all consumers would make some some uh, measures and actions to save energy. Over 90% uh, we got as a result. We also uh, got uh, remarkable savings, and it has been said. I think Marit can also perhaps uh, confirm because uh, Finfrid was really a big part of this Down the Green uh, campaign, as was also many other uh, organizations in Finland. And were, we were really proud were, that we got really quickly also <coughs> companies and uh, other organizations and municipalities to involve and uh, spread the same message uh, with the same kind of information and uh, we we got uh, uh, that that is what we see is was also uh, due to the possibility to have this kind of uh, ongoing networks like we have in the voluntary agreements that we really quickly can get involved and information to those organizations And uh, I don't know if you understand SISU, but uh, perhaps in Estonia they understand what SISU means. means. And uh, we think that this is also one thing that shows that when we really find that there is now something we need to do, we really do it. And don't ask that, <laughs> that oh, it's not my, my business. Uh, but but uh, the background is that we have, as, as said, we had had this cooperation already so many years with many, uh, many actors so that it was easy to build up this, this kind of huge campaign. And uh, at the end I would only highlight that there are several things we have asked uh, by energy efficiency agreement uh, uh, those who have joined them and who have made this framework agreeing why they are why they think that uh, they are working well and I I would highlight the that the most important is this trust and cooperation because I honestly I can't think that this kind of voluntary system can work if you do not have uh, a structure uh, issues in your country where different different uh, players are really trusting them all and can easily discuss uh, and and make agreements uh, so that you can believe that uh, the one who you you make an agreement also think also uh, makes the agreement uh, although it is voluntary in the means that they are really committed to it and this is the last one. I, I would say that uh, although these are first, this slide has first made for energy uh, efficiency agreements and the why they are working, but I think that these are working quite in a general way. That for if you want that that uh, some program uh, or policy will work, you need to have a well-functioning monitoring system so that you know that if there is something happening, especially if you are putting the public money. It also have given the possibility that uh, since 19th they, we have got uh, um, money to, to run it, because otherwise if it doesn't deliver, uh, you, you can't get public money. I think that also if you think that third parties are doing something when they are committed to some kind of uh, national policies and programs, 
they need to get something uh, why they would do it. So I think that this uh, support and uh, activation is really important, although also subsidies are one, one way uh, to make it uh, those <coughs> carriage, but also other means that, uh, to make it easier for those uh, to implement uh, measures. And then, of course, this is the last one, that, that you need to have continuous resources. It, it means also money, but also person, persons, because nowadays there are so, many, so much going on that uh, it's terrible to find uh, such people who are, who are able to make everything what, you, what is required nowadays. But, uh, this is the last one, that long-term commitment from all parties, I, I think, is the really crucial issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ten seconds from the allotted time. Yeah. That was very good. Yeah. Uh, any, any questions to Ulla Suomi? Hans? Maybe uh, more... Uh a comment uh, than a question also on the other uh, presentations this afternoon. So I think I would like to say that from the Commission side we know very well the uh, efforts that are required by all the people in the national administrations and elsewhere that have to implement all this legislation. This is, uh, this, this is something that we, we think about and sometimes I wouldn't say here especially, but sometimes you, you get a little bit the impression that there's a tendency of over-regulating. And uh, I would say, I mean, we hear that from time to time in the Commission, that we are being, you know, we're, we're going over the top in terms of setting requirements of everybody, reporting, monitoring, and what have you. Uh, what we're doing, I would say, is really that we are very often answering to specific requests that are coming to the Commission from stakeholders who are facing a problem. And then we are trying to find a way of, of dealing with it. And of course, when we do it, we always try first to sort of have a, a big consultation of everybody concerned, including national governments, uh, so that we, we know uh, what is the situation before we actually go in and propose uh, something. Um, we try as best we can to help implementation through guidance. I think uh, there was also a mention of the concerted action which we, we run for all of these uh, complex directives which are really an opportunity to member states to learn from each other, you know, what is the best way of implementing these things and without making maybe sort of the errors that others have made and tried and hasn't worked and therefore done things in a different way. So we do all these things, but of course, you know, we are always interested in knowing if there is uh, something which doesn't work in practice because, I mean, we don't pretend that we know everything uh, in the Commission. We certainly don't. And there's a, there's a lot of hard work uh, to be done by those who have to implement. But that's, of course, how directives work. Directives are also so that it leaves a little bit of margin for how member states can implement to the, you know, you can take into account the specific circumstances that you are facing in your country or wherever you are seeing this from. Uh, and it doesn't have to be done in exactly the same way in every country. But of course, the transposition has to be there. It has to be done uh, in the right way uh, and timely. And that leads me actually to the other point, and it came up on uh, two of the slides that we saw about the NECPs. Because we have faced uh, really big problems in the Commission with late delivery of the plans. And we accept, as we also heard, that you know it was challenging to produce in time. But I mean, we from the Commission are under a similar time pressure because now uh, actually in December if I'm not mistaken we have to deliver the first assessment of the draft NECPs and we have to advise the member states how to draft their final NECPs due for next summer and as we speak we are still in a situation where a number of member states have not yet delivered their plan 
which makes the job for us almost impossible. And my colleagues are struggling on, on how to do that because we cannot add up the numbers. Then we have to make assumptions. We have to try and, and make up the numbers. We have to work on drafts with an unclear status and so on. It, it really makes it very, very difficult. So my plea is really for, and I know one of the, the Baltic states, I think, has, have still not yet delivered. I don't want to mention which one, but I'm sure the one I'm talking about, uh, no, who, who we're talking about. It's, uh, it is unfortunate and really try, try to respect those deadlines because the governance is important. This is part of the mechanism when we are not working with uh, binding targets and in fact the NECP mechanism is the mechanism which we have to ensure that everybody is making the right kind of uh, contribution to that. But um, I thought there were very many really interesting elements in, in these uh, presentations so I've I'm taking it all in and take it back to Brussels with me. Thank you. Can I shortly comment? I, I thank you for your, your comment because I, I, I think it was a good comment. Uh, however, uh, what we have been wondering many times is that why we are, when, when for example, in ED recast, it, it was not accepted as it was planned originally, but the dates, those all dates were not changed. You, from the beginning, know that uh, it is challenging for both member states and for the Commission because you keep those dates, uh, uh, s s although the other timeline is moving. So I, I think it is, uh, it's really difficult. And when you were referring to concerted action, I already, when you or someone Oh, I was waiting that you would have commented something. Are those, uh, are those uh, uh, targets realistic? But you did not say anything. But I can say something because I'm leading one of these groups in concerted action and in my sessions last October uh, where we were handling these targets. Uh, I had a Mentimeter question at the end that uh, uh, how, if the participants would, with one word, say how they felt about fulfilling the targets. And there were 62 responses. And uh, I have this picture, if you, someone wants to show, but uh, there are quite many. And uh, impossible, stressed, anxious, scared, challenging, tricky, curious, too challenging, motivated, difficult, complicated, <laughs> disappointed, optimistic. Uh, uh, pessimistic, encouraged, hopeful, thrilled, anxious, excited, overwhelming, etc. So I think that this shows a bit uh, the feeling which is now, I, I think, in member states that how we can in such a short time frame make all this happen. Because the, the targets are really much higher. Uh, I think you mentioned it's for Denmark and uh, someone mentioned it's for Estonia and, and we think it is for Finland. And so I think uh, uh, I'm now especially, uh, oh, I, I, I would say that there are differences, of course, in member states, uh, which article target is more demanding, article 4, article 8, but, but still I think that both of these are, are really, really demanding and, and that's why I, I think that uh, it, it is a challenge to member states. And uh, that's why I concert, think that in concerted action we need to really try to make it easier for member states to understand how they can perhaps apply these requirements so that, that they in reality do not put too much effort to these reportings and monitorings, etc., etc., but more to that, that they could deliver savings and, and to make something happen in the real world. Yeah, he wants to, yeah, you want to comment again? Yeah, because I think it's a, it's a very, very, I don't know if I need the microphone. I think it's a very, very valid point. For me, there are two, there are two uh, parts of it, really. There's, first of all, the, the deadline set up placed on the national uh, authorities to uh, transpose and implement the directive. And there, I, I fully accept that this is extremely challenging and it, had, it comes with a cost, there's no doubt about it. But it is also necessary because that's the way it works. 
that you know uh, there are some general rules set at EU level, and they then have to be transposed. The alternative is to work through regulations which apply directly, and we know very well that member states do not want that because that is really you know, one size fits all and doesn't give that little bit of room for maneuver. So we are in a situation where we are facing uh, a bit of an emergency uh, in the energy sector when it comes to climate change. We really need to move very fast. We try and move as fast as we can in the Commission to turn out the proposals. And as you saw with my timeline in my pres the first presentation, I mean, we've really done that. And of course, then we would also expect others to work equally fast. And it's not that I'm saying that uh, we don't want you to take the time and uh, that is needed, but it just needs to be done as quickly as possible. Then the second question, which is, in my view, different is, whether the targets that are set at EU level are realistic and not. And it's true, I, I didn't perhaps address that as much as I could, and if there had been more time, I think I, I, would have, I could have done that. I mean, we think it is realistic. I mean, our modeling shows that it is doable. If we look at what is happening, for example, on renewable energy, where we are really looking at a doubling of the share of renewables uh, between now and 2030, that we are on the right track. If you look at what is happening, for example, in 2022, the additional capacity that has come on when it uh, stream, when it looks, when we're looking at the renewable electricity, it points absolutely in the right direction, especially when it comes to PV. I think we saw that also in some of the graphs from the IEA, the explosive growth that we see in PV, and the fact that this is really now, uh, in a way, the cheapest way of generating electricity in very many parts also of the EU. So we think it is doable, and it's, I mean, we wouldn't put this forward if it wasn't doable. I remember still very well when we did the first renewable directive, which was also a doubling. And there were many, many people who said, yeah, this is impossible to do. And what happened, you know, in the end, we surpassed the target by more than two percentage points. Uh, I accept that now uh, it's a very short period for the second doubling, but we think it is doable. And in any event, it has to be done because if we don't do it, we will never get to where we need to be by 2050 if we're looking at uh, carbon neutrality. So it is challenging, but it is also, in our view, uh, doable. If anything, I would say the energy efficiency target is perhaps more challenging than the renewables target because the energy efficiency requires a lot of um, micro decisions at very many different levels. And that has to be organized. And that is why uh, all those rather tedious requirements of the directive are important in order to get everybody to contribute. And yeah, I'm, I, I know that it's not always a very popular thing to be the commission on these uh, points. We are not uh, people who are crazy to regulate every little detail, but we just know that if we don't do it, there will be some member states who will simply leave it and not do anything, and there is a big potential that is uh, left untouched. And that's, uh, I think, uh, not possible in the current situation. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, I think, uh, I think, I see one, one hand there, and this is the, the absolute last question. Yes. I have uh, one short question and then comment uh, this uh, uh, hand uh, presentation. You mentioned uh, that we, this means Finland, succeeded because of traditions and cooperation. Please name this. What, kind, what do you mean traditions of Finland? One, two, I three traditions and then cooperation between citizens or between government and citizens or between European Union and Finland. And then comment. Uh, the comment, uh, my hypothesis is that Finland succeed, succeeded because traditions and cooperations, not because EU regulations or uh, advice. And that's why uh, uh, my suggestion is that let's leave countries to decide how do they make energy system efficient. Of course, there might be common goals, but how to 
uh, achieve these goals, let them uh, really decide using traditions and cooperation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. <coughs> Thank you. And uh, I think there are some snacks outside, so I think we should not hesitate. To, to, to go out now and thank you very much for this day. Many good uh, speakers. Thank you. Many good questions as well. And then I think we can. And tomorrow at uh, 9.30, I think there is coffee and tea from 9 o'clock. <laughs>